through with it again. They know that I got spirit with a pen. Don't know why they try to compete when they know that in victory it's never gonna end. Them and a weak, that's why they could never speak. They ain't like me, I take it to the peak. Different type of steeds that I breed. Wheel up on the mic, they won't get one of these. Please, I don't wanna hear no talk from them. I don't wanna see nothing at all from them, they can't do it like me. So all I wanna see really is a round of applause from them. Vibes in the air, we cause it again. Life isn't fair, but we rode it again. All of my teams being ready for the war, there's no warning for them. Tell them again.
gentlemen, to Spike Down Episode 3. My name is Keith LaFortune. Joining me is Roy. And uh, we've done it. We've made it through the halfway point. We're just past it now, heading into Week 4. But we can't jump into Week 4 until we dive into what Week 3 had for us. And, of course, that means talent predictions. Roy, it was quite a week, I'd say. Quite a week for predictions. Uh, your boy got a hot one off the stop, uh, right off the top. Uh, but a pretty mild week for predictions again. Yeah, this actually was maybe the first week where there was actually some like split decisions going on. And um, I'm not seeing Uber and Wyatt still cheating off each other's homework. So that's good. That's a, that is a big positive. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a tough week of, of predictions for sure. Turned out okay. Obviously, Moisek Shopify, everyone clinches that one. I'm going to go through the obvious ones. I'm 80. OXG, everyone was on board there. Obviously, your boy picking core. Uh, they were able to give me some praises on that one. Uh, and you know what? I was a bit crazy to take it. I just had a feeling. And, uh, you know. Can I also defend myself? Sure. I would like to defend myself and also expose myself for being quite an idiot. Yeah. Um, I actually picked core in the last content. We can pull up the records. I did pick core in the content. But when I got sent the sheet, I'm doing the multiple choice. I just circled the wrong thing. But I, there's video proof, and you can vouch for this, that I did choose core for the prediction. So technically, you and I are the only ones that got that one correct. But it I'll hold true. the L because I'm an idiot. So it's, it's completely fine. It is it true. Is completely fine. Uh, let's roll the clip. We'll see it. And uh, when we come back, we'll uh, hopefully be able to write that wrong. And I'll well, Core's playing up a little bit. YFE's playing down a little bit. I feel like yeah. they're somewhere in the middle. I'm also going Core. See Winthrop, TSM, Vensley, and I went down in flames there. Uh, sad TTR. Majority sad. Uh, TTR pulled that one away. So a week for predictions that, you know, everyone still ended positive in the predictions. And that's all we can hope for. And, of course, that means... We're going to talk about last week's events. We're going to start at the top, work our way through. First up on the chopping block, Thinking Men versus Moist X Shopify. Roy, how do you feel about this game overall? Okay, Whew. there's actually a lot of good takeaways. I'm, I'm going to start with, let's do like a sandwich method. Let's go with a sandwich method. Okay, I like this. One, I think Split was actually an amazing showing by Thinking Men. They, it was not a fluke. They had a very strong game plan. They played extremely well. They showed up. Vix popped off. There was some multiple players that were just absolutely going crazy. That is, that is the one positive, kind of nice. Actually, no, I, you know, I'll add one more in there. I'll add one more in there as well. Okay, first week, Lear, when, second week, I mean, uh, Lear was moved in. He, he was substituted for Mr. Screwface. He did not perform very well in his debut matches with Thinking Men. This week, though, it was kind of a nice bounce back for him, though. So, like, mm -hmm. it it's always, like, feels good, man, to, like, have a bad week. You know, everyone's, like, doubting you. And the next week, you're kind of showing up, performing pretty well. Kind of, like, it it's good for, like, the team morale and, like, you know, just putting everyone at ease, like, you know, there's no questioning whether they made the right or wrong decision. And it's like, it's good. It's good that Lear's kind of showing up. Um, but there are some negatives here, okay? I'll start, I'll jump into some of them. One, Moist Shopify lost six pistols. Six. That's a hundred percent lose rate on their pistols. They also lost three anti bonuses. That's six pistols and three anti bonuses. Like, there's unlucky, but that's not a good sign from my perspective. Yeah, yeah. And I, I agree with your points on Split. It's interesting, like, Split and Breeze were kind of... Thinking Men's Split was exactly what Moisex Shopify's Breeze was, mm -hmm. just really controlling the play, not really giving a chance, and Bind ended in a very close fashion. I think primary takeaway for me is Mata really is finally setting into... I don't know, his demon arc, maybe, is a good way to put it. This guy, this guy is just Mr. Consistent. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think that's really important for a team like this. Yes, you have Brock for and sure. Vic to back you up. Um, but if Mata can stay at this level, I think the support system this team has is top tier. We're seeing Brock, Vic, and Fly over three maps playing three agents. Uh, oh, yeah. Really cool stuff from Moisek Shopify. Uh, sure. Thinking men, we'll dive into them a bit later because they're in a per particularly awkward situation uh but the second yeah, match of that day uh core yfp your boy pick core i know everyone's gonna be sick of me saying it but hey i can only say it for this week uh, until you hear my predictions later um initially my takeaway from this match is i'm happy to see bones performing to the level that you and i know he can so that's takeaway oh, yeah. one positive for yfp the for sure. second positive this isn't going to yfp it's going to core is zeldris and honestly the team as a whole 
a lot more together. There's more direction in the rounds. And I think Zelda mm -hmm. is a type of player where things get chaotic. You really have to mid round and make individual decisions. It gets a little hairy, but he didn't even really have to make too many decisions because the rounds are playing out core's favor not every time but definitely comfortably sunset you can't say that um but it felt like zelders had direction and he was yes. given the support and he absolutely just controlled the server in both ma both maps uh, oh man i hundred i hundred percent agree like you could tell that there was very clear round logic like the every week by week course is starting to show like a lot more confidence in the way they're playing the maps like Dude, he, I remember even on Sunset, there was a round where, like, they knew that YFP was about to go for the orb, but they had a trap set up on their attack side to counter, like, the, them grab, like, snagging yeah. the orb. Made them seem safe. They got their one way off. It was completely quiet on the map. Like, okay, we can grab our ult. They go to the YFP, goes to snag their ult orb. Boom, a huge trap play coming out by Core. Like, you can just tell that their, like, round logic is, like, very well structured, and there's, like, clear go tos. I also want to say, like, it, that series between YFP and Core could literally be its own frag montage, and it would be like a very high tier frag montage. Like there were so many situations and and moments where like players are just going berserk, dude. Yeah, like, insane clips, awesome frags, clean, like super, like satisfying, like comes to mind uh mr uh ziff's like clutch game ending clutch like he had many many like multiple of those situations there was just so many rounds where it's like like 3ks 4ks like left and right aces like dude what is going what is going on it it's literally a cinema man. oh my yeah. god yeah and it's i mean it, it's a double-edged sword because it's great to see core finding a win but yfp could have maintained right could have been two one and mm -hmm. it, it, they could have been in a such much such more comfortable position and and also oh, yeah. playing core when they did now core is up in round differential minus nine where if he's now nine is 12 but they're not the scary group for now so i think they should be okay uh but overall mm -hmm. if you missed it definitely go check out some highlights uh, the weekly highlights going to be coming up this week. If you want to go check oh, yeah. that out, it's I'm going to rewatch that. Going to be a lot of clips in there, uh, and that wraps up day one. Day two is the day of two O's, the only day where both series ended in two O, and it was TSM Winthrop kicking off, then M80 Glazers. Mm -hmm. We'll start at the top. Uh, Winthrop, my feeling from this one, Roy. I suppose to kick off your thoughts, they didn't feel like themselves this week. Yeah, I mean. I don't even know if it's like it's like the, they weren't themselves or just TSM's power creep curve is really starting to kick in. But I mean, TSM is looking good, man. Like we we honestly can't deny that. Like the haters are slowly kind of getting quiet. And I mean, even like you can just for me when a, when a duelist starts popping off to the level that Sim is popping off, it means that like the gears are in motion, right? Like you know you're getting set up. You have a nice clean first kill, first death. Like you can be a great duelist, but if you're not in a good system, like you'll never know if that person is good or not. You know, like Sim is obviously talented. But like the fact that they're starting to like get the roles comfy, their their structure nice. starting to show, like the kind of like we're getting more insight into their system and like how it operates. Like I think I think we're starting to see TSM kind of like creeping into the top five rankings for this week. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. I do want to say Lotus Winthrop played well. Clearly a little slow mm -hmm. to get going. Um, mm -hmm. Losing pistols was a big thing. I, I don't think they won they won one pistol, but it didn't matter because they lost the following round on Breeze. Uh, I would say Lotus was okay for Winthrop. I think it's continuing to show to be a consistent map for them that they perform. I Breeze was just the Sim 7 show, um, heavily backed by the triple support players, essentially. Uh, it was just really, it felt really easy for them. They were able to poke and prod all the trap plays mm -hmm. Winthrop were trying to do off barrier, you know, with the Yoru and interesting mollies and jet peaks with dashes and darts didn't really catch tsm off guard and that is a map where typically if you overstep into a main you overstep into mid next thing you know you're getting swung from three places but tsm never really let that slip or let that happen um, yeah just a controllable map from them and i'd be scared to play tsm on breeze i'm gonna be honest old yep. school comp good good time results really mm -hmm. i think uh, for me like one maybe kind of like final note on my end is that like we we actually are seeing a good continuation of the performance by Infiltrator from last week. Like first yes. week, Infiltrator was just a little quiet. He was a little timid, right? Second week, he was starting to have like really good performances. And then this week, I mean, yeah, this despite their kind of harsh loss against TSM, not only in a 2-0, mm. but like obviously the scoreline just wasn't close. But yeah. 
Infiltrator was still playing pretty well, all things considered. I mean, and, I mean he's playing against some of the best players in the region, right? Like, at it's this true. level. Like, these players are, are, no, are no joke, dude. So for him to be performing well, even on a team that is kind of struggling and in terms of, like, matching in, on different areas, like, he's mm -hmm. doing pretty well. So, look, I'm going to be looking out for that, personally. Yeah, and if you can keep it up, who knows? Uh, definitely still a lot to play left in the season. It's only stage one. Uh, and M80, the Glazers, to round out day two. And I think the main talking point for me right off the rip, I guess yeah. two. One, Xander is absolutely nuts and finally dialed back into where he was last year's Ascension. And two, mm -hmm. the Glazers are just unlucky. I still dude, feel like they're, so playing, unlucky, they're, dude. they're playing good. It's just... It it's never feeling feels like they're behind. And I know you could say, well, yeah. Icebox felt like it, but it's 13-7, 13-6. They're playing okay. They don't feel behind, mm -hmm. but they're 0-3. And that's that's the kicker, really. Yeah, dude. Like, no, I I completely agree. I don't think Glazers are playing poorly. Like, I have that down in my notes in like 10 different areas. Like, they are not playing poorly at all. It's just one, they're just there's like those little edges and team play and like kind of like pop off potential they're kind of lacking they are also getting kind of biffed in the openers too that that is one area they could definitely look to maybe they just were unlucky that that series i'm not entirely sure but that and their opening schedule was tough dude they had a they had a really tough opening schedule and that that makes me kind of starting to think a little bit like it the Glazers need to win their match against Turtle in the first, was it week one or week two? I can't remember. Week one, yeah. Week one. I think they needed to like really, that was like the match that they needed to win if they wanted like a comfy spot to like avoid even the conversation of relegation. But as of right now, they're 0-3, dude. That's a scary place to be right now. There's only like what, two, there's this week, the upcoming week four? Two matches, yeah, two weeks and left. Week five, and that's it. We're going into relegations right away. Yeah. That's scuffed, dude. That's very, very unlucky, dude. Yeah, and it, it if they beat Sad, uh, comes down to that Winthrop Glazers head to head, and and maybe seeing who gets bottom of the group really for mm -hmm. relegation. Um, mm -hmm. After next week, we're really gonna have a more clear picture of what it's gonna yep. look like. But uh, the Glazers really need to hopefully turn that ship around. Tough next two matches ahead of them, but I think if they play like they have against their first three opponents, they should be in a more comfortable position in their next two games and m80 not yeah. much to say xander just played unreal felt like he was in the right spots at the right time pretty much every round um and not a lot of negatives i mean just really solid team play but it's come it's kind of what we expect from nitro happy teaming up and having the same core it's consistency from them uh anything else to add on that roy or yeah, I, mean, I got one more point. I think the level of like the years of experience that Nitro and Happy have is probably mm -hmm. much older than the average age in challengers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> probably true. I don't know. Do probably what you true. will with that information. Do what you will with that information. <laughs> but I, I, that's it's just crazy to think about. Um, but yeah, we can true. move on. We can move on. Yeah. So we end we end the week with Turtle Troop for a sad auction together with Terrific. Obviously, going to start with Turtle Troop sad. Uh, a series again where another team, another series let's sad's ascent which pretty mm -hmm. much did get them through the qualifier Ascent was a heavy play map for them uh and it continues to be so with this comp that they're unwavering from and ttr weren't scared in fact they have an interesting niche of their own in the comp department it's adder uh on the deadlock, deadlock. how do you feel how do you feel about the series and more specifically the comp diversity because it felt like we had quite a bit in the series i'm i'm starting to like the I was having a conversation recently about the Ascent meta, actually, and it, it kind of makes sense why a lot of teams are starting to just, like, pull out super wacky. Like, I say wacky, and like, but it's not a negative thing. It's just, like, wacky and, like, out of the realm of kind of what everyone's comfortable looking at and watching. And it kind of makes sense why teams are sort of starting to do this, right? Because, like, everyone knows how the KO comp plays now, right? So, like, the teams that pull out something that the, can make the enemy team uncomfortable gives them an edge because they know how both comps operate but the enemy team can only know how their like the meta comp yep. operates and whatever wacky comp that they pull out as well if that makes sense so like it, it kind of makes sense why teams are starting to like just pull out these like wild card comps because like you play the meta comp it maps 50 50 dude like you can have an insane team but like the map is just so fleshed out and the meta is just so like on the paper now but like Anyone can play the map, literally. You watch T3 yeah. teams, they can probably take Ascent 50-50 off, like even some of the best teams, right? Like, it kind of makes sense. 
I just don't know how effectively they're playing that. But what I will say True. is how funny that map was to watch. Like, I know that yeah. sounds weird, but like, Ascent was really funny to watch because Sad was doing super well in the beginning. And it was just like bloopers after bloopers, dude. Like, just, yeah. like, just, like, just like after shocking ourselves, like flashing <laughs> teammates. Just like, just a circus yeah, there is, show at some point. There are some moments. And it's fun. It's weird because when I think of this core comp, I like it. Um, or, this, or at the sad comp, excuse sad me, comp. core comp. Yep. I'm just hyped on my core pick. Um, I just love the man. sad comp. It, it it's it almost feels like they have too many options with their utility. And I think oh, it yeah. got to a point where Turtles Group were like, "Why are we even going to respect this?" And B Dog just mm -hmm. started going wherever he wanted. Um, no Juru Sentinel, not needed, but that means you need to have info and you have to have ideas what to do. And it felt like having overwhelming options with the utility but none of that utility helps in late round in the sense of like flank watching info gathering um outside of obviously gecko uh a lot of faces had to be peaked from sad they needed to use their eyes um to gather yeah. this info and i think that's where b dog just and and cory uh it's absolutely dominated that map sunset close um definitely closer in ascent another deadlock map from adder still trying to figure out if i like that uh so, what, the deadlock on, on sunset specifically and ascent i i it's growing on me mm -hmm. um i think i just need a more sample size or more you like combos with her utility is maybe yeah i, th I think turtle was kind of using deadlock like a pseudo sage where they were like on, on yeah. at least on their defense side they were just using like the the net to just like block off parts of the map early like b main they're just like walling off b main immediately you know, they're, and then on the attack side, they're using the the grav net to like confirm targets, whether if, like if there are players on the site, so they can like dedicate more util, like the omen flash, and mm -hmm. like it, it kind of made sense, like the way they were playing it. I I just don't, I can't tell for sure. I'm not confident in whether like if they just played a sage, if they would get more value from the sage, or if it's just like just having the deadlock and unknown, like making people yeah. uncomfortable again on on ascent is that value is more important than just like running a sage that could be on paper have more value. I don't know, but it's, I mean, it's worked for them, so I, I can't Working. even hate on it. Yeah, Adder mm -hmm. just unfortunately minus five in the first kill for his death department. Um, never a great number when you're a Sentinel and want to live. Uh, but overall, <laughs> T TTR guide the ship back to normality. Sad put up a fight. Um, and then the final match, this one might oh, have this... the least amount of notes. It's Oxygen versus Together with Terrific. Oh. Uh, and what a series it was. 13-4 on Ascent for Oxygen and 13-2 on Sunset. I mean... Uh, Verno, you can pick anyone on this team and, and make a point of why they played well this week, it, which is mm -hmm. a wild thought to have. <laughs> yeah, I mean, instead of us uh, having like repetitive conversations about how awesome Oxygen is and how good their players are, I would like to point out one specific player that is, sure. in my opinion, is going to be like the small edge that Oxygen, like Oxygen, will need to like really challenge an ascension and like almost guarantee their place in you know partner league and vct and it's it's the mitch differential like mitch is starting to look confident and he, he's starting to be like really comfortable in his role as an igl on the team and like he popped off on that first map like it was a it was a straight up mitch daddy carry like straight up like that's just all it was and like they're gonna need like dude they're gonna need that like to challenge some of the best teams you know what i mean like they're gonna need every edge they can get and having like an igl that's starting to pay less and less of the igl tax on the team is gonna be that kind of edge that you need to have like all players firing on cylinders you know yeah and his ko one of my favorite agents to watch Mitch John, and you can kind of see the comparison. Maybe his guy mm -hmm. gets him in more awkward situations, but his KO numbers are it's clean, super impressive. It's, yeah, for it's sure. really nice to see. And then the cast uh, on on Oxygen continues to be a dominating number ever in nearly every series they play. Um, overall, good for Oxygen, bad for TWT. Uh, but TWT put themselves in a position where they should be okay uh, moving forward. Speaking of moving forward, it is time to talk about some future topics. Let's dive into at least how I see it, Roy, and you can stand, you can correct me if you'd like. The three sure, teams man. that are starting to, I mean, I, I put, find themselves, maybe that's not the most comfortable way to put it. Teams that are starting to assert themselves might have been a better way to go. Yeah, Oxygen, solidify their positions. Moistep, yeah, Shopify, Moistep, Shopify, Oxygen, M80. I said Moistep, Shopify twice because they're in my head. I guess. So <laughs> overall, 
safe to say the top three i know we talked about big dogs episode one safe to say they're emerging comfortably though yeah no definitely i, I think okay so moist oxygen m80 those are like obvious right those are the big three we refer to them as the big three if you ever hear us saying big three we're talking about those teams yeah. but now now we're starting to like okay tsm has crept up right they're they're kind of solidified themselves turtle troops kind of solidified themselves like they're, dude their turtle troops early wins are massive man and yeah. put them in a really good spot and same that can be said for twt like they're in a great spot now like even if they lose out the chances of them entering relegation are extremely slim obviously points are super important so we do have to like have this conversation at some point but like for now going into week four i think i think those teams are kind of sitting pretty so now that we've covered the big three the three big dogs it's time to talk about the important weeks ahead um for some of the other teams and and the ones that stood out to roy and i thinking men and glazers in the hot seat talk to me a little bit about thinking men roy why why are they in this position can they get out of it yeah so for context thinking men are zero and three right minus 21 rounds it's it's looking kind of dire they're up against core now if if they beat core that will kind of even up the, sort of like the bottom stage right it'll kind of evens up the the teammate side of things if if thinking men lose against core it's going to be extremely tough because they'll have to defeat TWT in the final game to even have a chance to not be relegated. But like this upcoming match for week four for thinking men in my eyes is like a do or die. Like you, you win this match, you put yourself in a decent spot to challenge yourself out of that kind of hole that you might find yourself in. If you lose this upcoming match, it's doom and gloom for thinking men. Yeah. So it's, it's tough, man. It's a tough position to be in. It's a lot of pressure. And it's pretty much a very similar situation. If not very identical to the Glazers, negative 26, they play sad, sad are mm -hmm. one and two. Then they end their season with Winthrop. If the Glazers can beat both of them in theory, they should be safe. Um, barring Winthrop beating M80, which that's going to be an important game in and of itself. If they can do that, then they've kind of put the Glazers in a really tough spot. Yeah. Uh, so definitely a couple teams to keep your eye on because this week, determines what we're going to look at for relegation and who knows we could be welcoming some new teams uh, in the near future but long road ahead you don't want to be in that situation at all so this week is pivotal for that and with that that means it's time for us to predict it's time for roy and Ooh. i to make our lovely predictions i told him i'd kick off day one and uh, um, hit me you know so day one it, it it's an okay day. Uh, some could say a very important day for the Glazers. Sad versus the Glazers. TTR versus TSM. And Wait, uh, before you predict. Yes. I would like to remind everyone that Sad versus the Glazers is extremely important. So I'm very. holding Keith to a higher standard on this prediction. Yes. I'm holding yes. myself to a higher standard on this prediction. We must keep All ourselves right. to a higher standard. Uh, right, with Keith, that in mind, me. I'm picking hit the Glazers. Me. They know oh, the situation snap. they're in. Now, let me justify this. They know the situation they're in. Not only that, SAD's level of play has dipped a little bit. Their creativity is on the rise, but their team play, now that they're playing teams that seem to be more consistent than perhaps other teams in past events they've played, SAD mm -hmm. are still trying to figure things out. The Glazers, to me, have been playing consistent. We're harsh on them because we have a high standard for these players, but they are playing a decent level of valor that isn't dipping, it isn't rising, they're consistently there. Now for TTR versus TCM, TSM, I'm going to go against all logic. TSM's on the rise, they're looking great, Sim's getting integrated in the system, they have consistency, yep. but, but I think TTR, <laughs> and again, this is crazy, I really think TTR have figured it out. I, I okay. felt like this last week was bumpy, it didn't really feel like TTR, even the sad win. Like it's B Dog is B God. You said it. You see him in chat. The oh, yeah. big main points for this is Stellar seems comfortable. Corey and B Dog are playing to their potential. And we didn't add her, just need to show up. And I mean that okay. in the sense of throwing their utility and being those good side anchors and rotators that they are. Adder ain't really rotating. We did a little all over the place, which is cool. But I think if B-Dog and Corey continue this and Stellar has the calls that he had, they were really good at poking, prodding the map. That's how I'm feeling for that week. I don't know if that's fair, okay. but I, I got Glazer's TTR. Are you on board or are you going with the complete opposite? All right. So the way I see it is, 
you've definitely cooked something. Yeah. Now, is it a yeah. Michelin guide? Is it a Michelin star? I'm not entirely sure if you've cooked that kind of meal yet. <laughs> I, I'm not ready to, to rate it that highly. Yeah. I do yeah. like what you're cooking. Um, I'm not going to give my opinion because it's my turn to do my predictions now. We've, we've heard your predictions. Okay. Let's go back. Let's really back. Sad versus the Glazers. Yeah. I got to go with the Zoomers, dude. I have to do it. Ooh. I have to go with Sad. E even though mentally... I know this is a 50-50, maybe slightly skewed in the Glazers' side. Yeah. I know that. But sad are just unpredictable. And That's they're, true. They're, they're good within the unpredictability. And their chaos is like kind of their comfort zone. And I can't, I got to respect that. I just have to respect it. So I'm going with the Zoomers, dude. I'm going with sad uh, for match number one. Two, TTR versus TSM. Listen, I tasted your meal. Yeah, you know yeah. It, it. It's good. It's good. I can't hate okay. on the meal, but yeah. I'm, I'm gonna have to go next door over to TSM because I think okay. I think I like what they're cooking up over there. And that's fair. I, I think I am a little crazy for not going down the TSM uh, door with you. Uh, and what about day two? You, you, All right, you kick it off here. You, you I want to see where you're at. All right, so TWT versus Moist X Shopify. Moist, of course. Um, uh, yeah, it's not really it, it's hard it, it's really hard to make a, a concrete argument against moist in the series like yeah maybe they've not been playing to the level they should be against teams that we rated kind of like lower than them mm -hmm. but there's i mean do they lost six pistols and three bonuses and still won a series like yeah as long as they don't lose six pistols in this <laughs> series i think they'll be chilling i think yeah. they'll be chilling all right number two oxygen versus yfp I'm liking what YFP is doing. Okay? I, I like their role swaps. I think it looks a lot more natural. Even like to my mm -hmm. eyes, it looks more appealing to see these players and their roles that they're on. I think it, it suits them a lot more. But I just don't think they've recovered from the post era. So I'm going to go with Oxygen on this one. They've lo they're looking right. good. Mitch is, Mitch, Daddy Mitch is kind of starting to pop off in the system. Yeah. I think I'm leaning for Oxygen here. Yeah, I'm on board with both of those picks. Uh, we're in agreement. Uh, M80 Winthrop, I'll go first on this one, then I'll give you the last one. Uh, you'll see if you agree with me here, say it with me with M80. Yeah, okay, M80. Yeah. yeah, go next. Yeah, I, I think Winthrop could if they prove me wrong, I would love it, and we'll leave it at that. Uh, core think Roy, I want you to lead this one because again, another oh. one of those pivotal games. It's crazy how the start of the week oh. Oh, must win series, last day of the week must win series for thinking. And obviously for the Glazers. So I'm going to put their fate in your hands. I can't believe you're making me go first on this one. That's, yeah. that's actually insane. I think my heart is saying core. I, okay. think, I think I'm leaning core on this one. I do like thinking men though. I, I don't want to make it seem like I'm not a fan of thinking men. Okay. Yeah. I like their curve. It's a nice curve. It's clean. They're starting to pop off. Players are getting comfy, right? There's a lot of like, like psyche shedding that they needed to do. And I think it, they're shedding quite nicely and they're, regrowing into this like kind of like new team i'm liking mm -hmm. how lear's fitting into the system as well but core man after watching them last last week they yeah. they've impressed me a little bit they, they've kind of they're growing on me a little bit so i'm going core for that yes. one yes i am on board with the core pick as well a team that i think zelda ziff deadly combo of t-dog pops off like we saw last week we have another mm -hmm. highlight reel week i don't know if I think we'll be up to the task uh, but it's up to fate it's up to whatever happens. Let us know what you think about our predictions in the chat. Good, bad, who was better? I don't know. Uh, we'll leave that up to you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in for episode three of Spike Down. We'll catch you next week. Enjoy the games.
Hello everyone and welcome back to Valorant Challengers North America. It is week four and it's almost the end. We're approaching the end of this first split. Things have been going crazy. A lot of upsets, a lot of teams that have come up on top and stayed on top, uh, but the competition just gets closer and closer today we have two very exciting matches going to be sad against the glazers and our second match is going to be tsm against turtle Troop. but before we start with those matches i'm your host dryad and i'm going to introduce my desk for today is going to be uber and i hold shift joining me for the cast and the analyst desk and, and uber another week another time to to see how the scores are going to start settling yeah, I mean, we're kind of getting into the danger zone for you know, our teams towards the bottom of the groups, right? Without giving too much away about a recap, right? Teams like YFP are starting to sink towards that sixth spot. We are feeling a little better, honestly, about thinking about the Glazers. Like, these are the two teams at the bottom of Group A and B, respectively. There's still a lot that can happen before we get to relegations, before we get to that mid-season. So, for these teams struggling to find their wins, it's now or never. And when you take a look at the standings shift, when you take a look at those groups, they, we have, again, we have those favorite teams, the ones that are 3-0, like Moist, like M80, and the ones at the bottom, like Uber was saying, really, really struggling, as you see Thinking Men and the Glaciers, they're in a, 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 in a very, very difficult situation to see if they can get the last two wins. Yeah, I, that, that is the big part, right? There's only a couple of games left for all of these squads, and um, I, I think you're seeing kind of a side of opposites come together here because for like together we were terrific they were great in the opening two matches they obviously got exposed last week by oxygen esports but those two wins puts them in a pretty comfortable spot to at worst force a tiebreaker situation to avoid that relegation position but the teams that have started off really slow like thinking men the lasers it, it really is do or die time and the, you know when we look at group b in particular today the teams that are one and two are also not excused from that conversation of potential relegation just due to the fact that i especially in group b i think the teams that are kind of three four five six are all super tight together in terms of overall skill and kind of what we've seen so far in terms of team performance so yeah very critical week here especially for those that find themselves near the bottom leaderboard just one win here could make the difference expecting sometimes maybe those teams that are one and two to to start losing again and then thinking man or the glaciers would not be at the bottom so that it's really going to be a very very difficult week for everybody to try to get those wins but if you're watching spike down you already got the chance to take a look at how those matches for week four are going to look like but let's take a look once again as i already said i spoiled you guys the first match for today is going to be sad against the glaciers the second one is going to be TSM and Turtle Troop, but every single team Uber is going to be playing again in it in a now or never situation for so many of them. Yeah, but importantly, right, these first two games today are really important deadlock breaking matches in that group B, right? This is where we sort of decide how that fourth through sixth in the group is going to pan out. You know, the Glazers have only played the top three teams in their group, right? M80, TSM, and Turtle Troop. We haven't seen them against Winthrop or SAD. Mm. So a lot is on the table for those games. And I think yeah. that Turtle Troop versus TSM is a really compelling matchup. These two teams are both two and one. They're, they only differ in round differential by one. And we've got a veteran squad on Turtle Troop and a TSM team that is starting to take shape really quickly. Sim really coming into his own as a duelist and generating quite a bit of hype, I think, here at this tier of play. So that's a very exciting game. And I, I expect it to be really competitive and hopefully very close. On top of that, I've been saying for the last couple of weeks, it's like, who wants to be the second best team in Group B? Now we're officially going to know after this matchup today. So that should be fun. It, we kind of have it for Group A and Group B, right? Where it is the like, clear favorite at the top. And then you're not actually sure how everything is going to end up closing out. But now let's dive into the first match that we have for today between Sad and the Glazers. A Sad that started playing very well. They got their first win, the first match that they played. And then they started taking those losses. Now, when you think of Sad, you think of this team that is very, very creative. And it's something that we've seen over more and more in Challengers. Teams that are trying new things, especially on it does feel like the, the craziest thing ever the kind of composition that we're seeing for sad and we do see the, the ideas behind these compositions but the question is can they win this match against the glazers who have also had very very close series against some of the strongest teams that we have right now uber I sorry your, your boy <laughs> shift your boy shift you put a dot in the chat there but i think it was uh too late. that was Look, before i, yeah, I think before. that sad are cooking on their ascent comp uh it's it's very intense, right? 
but it did not play out well against Turtle Troop last week. They really had a good feel for it. It is like, it feels like you're overloading a site with a lot of that utility. Just like the Gecko Breach in general, very, very hard to, to sort of anchor on that site adequately. And you can be pushed off of the site really easily and forced into, uh, you know, a bit of a difficult retake. So the team is really good. I think that, you know, we're definitely looking at people like Skarn and Moobs also, uh, sorry, that's uh, Winthrop. Skarn obviously to, to step up and, and take a more key role here. This is the matchup I think that is going to expose your duelists to a lot of the action, depending of course on the, the map selection here but you know we we did not see a whole lot outside of you know like a pretty strong comp i think from sad i i think it is definitely pretty scary this is the kind of team that gets good results on icebox as well which bodes well you know the glazers let this one through against m80 and it really hurt them uh they were they had a decent attacking side i liked the lurks that they had but in general their protocols for hitting sites were weak. There was gaps in the mollies, gaps in the smokes. Xander was allowed to sneak through a lot of the time and just come from unexpected angles and really catch them out. So we need to see the Glazers really tighten up a lot of that, uh, a lot of those hard hits uh, coming on in here. And for Sad, like we've sort of seen them on this map, I think back to the Winthrop game, which was a non-game, uh, you know, on Icebox, for example. So very, very strong team. I do think that, yeah, it's like Skarn had an off week last week. I think there's no other way around it. Need to see him really step up. And shift now on the other side. When you get to take, when you get the chance to take a look at these two teams, when you take a chance to look at these two rosters, and you you look at how the Glazers have been playing, they're always so so close. But one key difference maker for Sad that I think could make sure that is once again a close match ending up on the other side winning that the side of Sad is going to be Bob. Bob has been the most consistent player on the squad even when they're losing she's always there she's always performing giving those assists giving that support so I think it's going to be a key piece for today to make sure that Sad get that win. Yeah, and I think most importantly is the consistency is also going to come with a lot of high praise here, especially considering the schedule that came through. Like we said, there was, you know, a good start to the group stage, the map three win over Winthrop, but, you know, the Turtle Troop series not quite going their way. Uh, you know, it's one of those situations that you look at them and say, OK, like there's opportunities here to where, you know, there are going to be some star players that have really not been talked about before. And Bob has definitely been one of those players at this point. Uh, I mean, week two was a great one, even in the loss, like we mentioned, to M80, which was, I think, the most impressive part. And maybe where I think a lot of us looked at Bob and said, yep, this is a story worth telling because everyone else has been getting absolutely ran through. But the individual performance really did kind of stick out, I think, in a lot of people's minds, even though the result did not go the way Sad would have wanted. So, yeah, I think it's very appropriate to kind of paint the picture. And I think this breaking it down week by week by week again shows that there is persistence towards where you're going to get bob's performance from and it's going to be mostly in that support role helping out try to make sure that the damage is done and you're able to at least help tally a couple of assists here or there at least you know a couple of times per round so yeah really good performance to this point and definitely a player to watch out for and since we already taking a look at this team of sad i do want to talk about the the two duelists that you're going to see today the potential head-to-head -head for some of them scarn and zachary have a big shoes to fill today in terms of making sure that they're keeping that consistent performance on the duelist role when we do get the chance to see it uber because it's been not the best for them and we obviously just love hyping, hyping up these players we love seeing them succeed but they might be the difference maker for either the Glazers or Sad on this match. Yeah, I mean, we talk about Zachary as the duelist, but he only played Sentinel in their last week's game, right? Because on Icebox, they go with sort of double controller and they, they actually yep. you know, do away with the Sentinel, or with the duelist yep. entirely. But Zachary is like, he's on the Killjoy. He's picking up the operator. He's got some really nice lurks, some really big clutches as well, like up against you know, veterans like Nismo and Nitro, and he's actually winning them out. So this guy's got a really good head on his shoulders. He is extremely sharp, and he's the kind of player that this team needs to lead them. He's the guy that, you know, took TSM to overtime on Breeze in their match by going and having that insane ace. Like, that's the star power on this place. This team that you can rely on. I think on the other side, Skarn, we've seen, I think, fluctuations in confidence, honestly. You know, this this sad team is not one that actually has historically had to lean on Skarn to find success. Good they point. have like some really interesting comps and like fitting Skarn in there it was like a solo Yoru on Ascent and stuff like that. This is like not sort of normal, right? Like a lot of teams don't necessarily uh, have the ability to just to turn their duelist and go Yoru and try and, you know, open up these opportunities. So I think Skarn has a tough job 
on this team to sort of fit into these systems and these comps that they're probably still getting under their belt as well. So, you know, I kind of want to give the guy the benefit of the doubt there. And I think Scarn's pretty aware of, like, some of the criticism that's come the way of Sad and his way. And he even said in an interview, like, hey, love me or hate me, I'm here to stay and I'm here to show what mm -hmm. I can do. So keep that attitude going. Uh, and, and again, really, you're going to be having to stand up against this Glazers team who I think have a bit more depth than especially after the M80 game we maybe give, gave them credit for. Yeah, I think you put in a really good picture, especially based off the Ascent random agent swap that came through because across every other map that we've seen Sad play, we kind of know what you're going to get. Yes, yeah, some of the compositions aren't what we would call set meta, but that was the first set of games that we had seen in Ascent where they tried something completely brand new and different, and the performance did not improve, you know, candidly speaking. And I just, I want to see them go to work, work to the past, whether it was through the qualifiers or the opening week. That's what I want to see from the SAD team today, because it feels like it's just a little bit too late in the process here in this group stage to be fiddling around with new compositions that you don't know are fully battle tested yet. Yeah, I would just say to cap that off, I don't want to see this team rely on Bob. I don't, I, I don't think big. that yeah. is a ticket forward right. for Sad. We've talked about how consistent she is, which is great, but often her role is really as a facilitator. She often is creating entries and, and sort of winning gunfights, 1v2s, which is awesome. But, you know, if you're leaning on that too much, I think that like a lot of your main game plan has already kind of fallen apart. I'd love to see her as another option, an ace in the sleeve perhaps. But, you know, you really need to see these side hits. Again, with these kind of com complicated compositions pay off. There's, this is a competitive team. That Turtle Troop game was great. I think Turtle Troop cooked a little bit with the deadlock comp on two matches. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's, a little bit. That's fine. I, I I really am enjoying it seeing teams that run that don't try and just play the standard KO comp on Ascent, for example. And I yeah. actually don't hate uh, you know seeing the deadlock on Lotus, especially if you can cut off like A-Link on the attacking side. So there's a lot sure. of play to be had there, but uh, it requires your whole team to adjust a little bit around that. In, in between Skarn and Zachary, something that we've seen for both of them has been playing the Yoru, but they played it in different maps. So I would love to see that head-to-head -head between the two Yorus. I don't know what the chances of that are going to be, <laughs> right? Looking at the maps, but they are two teams that are very creative. They have brought a couple different things, trying to bring their own twist to either the compositions Mine, that we're used to seeing. Maybe mine, right? I'm yeah. thinking that too, but, but we have to see also, depending on how we're in, where those maps take us. Now, let's take a look a little bit of on the Glazers and what they've been doing because we've talked about it they had very close matches and precision actually made a tweet about it talking about how close so many of these years against again the strongest teams have been almost taking it to overtime at 13 11 uh, uh the only map that they've won is a 13 11 against turtle troop and then you see 11 13 on lotus 13 15 on breeze against tsm it's always so close uber yeah, look, and I mean, this is, I don't know, I kind of feel like, especially if you're a, a team that's sort of coming together, maybe sort of, you know, and you're a little bit newer, like closing out those games is an entirely different skill set to getting yourself in a position to win in the first place. Yeah. I think overtime is a completely different game of Valorant, and it's really easy to to overthink what you're trying to do uh, in those overtimes. We've actually seen it happen with a few teams. I want to think back to the sad Winthrop game that went to like, you know, multiple overtimes there with a lot of just like really abnormal circumstances in game states as opposed to like regulation. This, I guess, doesn't even really tell the story about how close the Glazers are because unfortunately, the map differential against them is pretty wide. They're, Very they're wide. around differential. They're minus 26, but that has a lot to do with getting spanked by M80 uh, and only winning 13 rounds over the course of that series. Against TSM, like they had that really close 15, 13. And against Turtle Troop, Lotus and Bind were both 11, 13. It's actually won the Bind map. So I agree, like this is a team that can put themselves in a position to close out, but they have to land the plane and they've lost some really crucial maps. It's the only reason they're at zero three 3 right now, I feel. But that was against all the best teams in the group. Now you have Sad and Winthrop who look a little bit more exploitable here. So if you can really tighten those protocols, I talked about them a lot, especially on the Icebox map against M80. Those need to be get, get tightened up to really compete with those top teams. If we've seen them develop it all from that point last week, then I really feel, I predicted these guys. I predicted Glazers to win this week. I think only me and Seaside mm. didn't. I, can, I know it's a bit of an outside one, but I've watched this team develop. I've watched these games get closer. If you only look at last week's match against M80, you take nothing away from it, really. Uh, I think this team is going to win today. 
And we're gonna see because it might depend on when we're headed or where we're headed. Let's take a look at the map select. And we were talking maybe Yorum Bind. Maybe that's gonna be a chance. But guess what? Over not a chance at all. It's Split, Sunset, and Lotus. Team or maps that we've seen for both of the teams. I think there's one per team that they haven't played just yet. So very recently, we did get the chance to see the split for the Glazers. Maybe taking a look at that might give us an indication of where the series might start. I mean, I'm very interested to see how Sunset plays out. First of all, uh, you know, this is the split map is uh, is a Glazers pick big time. This team loves to overload a ramp on both sides, attack and defense. Actually, it's something that M80 took quite a few rounds to figure out. So that's something worth bearing in mind. I think Zachary's very good at the solo A lurk on the attacking side here as Cipher. Uh, so he's just a very good player at like pl playing as an individual. I think and sort of creating opportunities where there are, are none otherwise. So feel pretty good about that map. Uh, the sunset map here, uh, of course, we actually saw, you know, um, sad beat against, win against Turtle Troop. Uh, I feel pretty confident for them on this map, especially because we've seen so little. Lotus to me is an absolute wild card, though. It's really, it could be, a, it could go either way. And I'm a little surprised that the Glazers didn't want to play Icebox here. I know sad have been very good, but I wasn't that upset seeing them against a team like M80. They pushed M80 further on that map than a lot of teams have been able to. I would like to see this going to to that third map of Lotus, right? Because we this is one of the only compositions that you do see being played pretty standard for Sad. And the Glazers, they've played this map of Lotus just one time against a kind of crazy composition of the Neon on for the Sad Turtle Troop. Mm, the Corey so Neon. we're gonna yeah, exactly. So they haven't played that standard composition, and right, that could be, once again, the one thing that makes the difference. But let's jump into the agent select. Let's see if these same compositions for split are going to remain the same. We we have seen some changes, right? For uh, the Glacers, they did change a split composition yeah. from the second week to the third week. So I'm curious if they're going to keep the one that we just saw recently shift, or is going to be uh, maybe just going back to the, the first one that we ever saw. Yeah, they've had a little bit of identity crisis in terms of what they really want to do in terms of control. Or I think in particular, obviously, the breach was used. That's what you're kind of alluding towards. And they kind of yeah, strayed away from it. that. Yeah, not really finding much success with it. So now you go back into not not playing an Ashley, play an Omen instead. But, you know, same outfit, just different color, essentially. Um, so I, I don't know. It's one of those things that I think just based on the regularity that we've seen players just play this, I think they're starting to really kind of feel out what ideas they want to put together. I, I think it's just down to execution. I think for both these two teams... We could sit here and break down how the maps have gone historically, but like we saw from Precision's text, and tweet rather, this is just all about executing. They have to find themselves into a position just to be executable, uh, you know, when it matters the most without question, because both teams have really struggled in like full purchases. Both teams have really struggled closing out series. So if this one does stay tight as I think we expect it to, this is all got to be about just making sure you execute on the rounds that matter the most. Well, my cat is very excited to see how this agent select is going to look like. So let's actually jump into the agent select for this map of split. And, and yeah, we talked about the changes. We talked about the little things that have been the same that have remained a little different. The double initiator, the Uber and ship. We see the composition. We see that the two uh, players that are going to be playing this duel this time around is going to be Drone and Skarn on the race. And I'll leave the match to you guys. Yeah, thank you very much, Triad. Um, look, and Drone was, has always been the kind of player that has has often, even back on the TSM days, right, flexed between duelist and initiator, right? He was like oh, big a time. Lot of yep. Phoenix back then, right? If you if you recall, so not a huge surprise to see this setup. We saw Drone, of course, on the raise in the past here, um, and this is the Zachary on the Cipher comp, which historically, you know, Zachary has been a, you know, a an excellent Sentinel player. So this is playing out basically the way I expect it to here on the side of Sad, right? You know, Bob on the sky was something we are going to be keeping an eye on but like i mentioned uh shift i don't want to see them rely on bob to bail them out of some of yep. those compromising situations yeah absolutely and I, I think the other side of it with sad starting on the offense is how much can they really stretch out this defense of the glazers because you know what we've often seen with players moving away from using the astra and instead going to the omen is that you just got that toggle of smoke at mid you know can sad put a little bit of extra pressure on the glazers defensively to happen maybe have to spend maybe a trap cage somewhere over towards the middle of the map or towards one of the top towers just not allowing zachary to stay rooted and planted on one of the two sites whichever he prefers i, I think more often than not you expect him to be playing over towards b but 
but you know we've seen different variations from a lot of our best split teams that are out there and that's also kind of the beauty in a certain way of hey we are now four weeks in you've gotten a lot of film not just of yourself to watch but of other teams that have actually mastered some of these maps so to speak so it'll be curious to see what kind of inspiration has been pulled over these last handfuls and what be both these two teams bring to the table because you know even though the glazers have played this map in the competitive regular season this is not an unfamiliar map nor an unfamiliar composition for sad esports they played this a lot back in february so i expect that they're probably just going to go to the tried and true playbook of what worked for their qualifier run yeah I, you look a great point i think that like it's easy to look at just the challenges stats and forget that we aren't even that far into challenges there's only been a few weeks and there's only one game one match a week that these teams sort of get to play and you, you mentioned about the variations and you will see that a fair bit, of course, whether it's like Riku or Zachary here on defense, sort of operating on that B side. And quite often we see the sky sort of get sort of, you know, moved into that position to try and assist them. Coburg here trying to get a warm up. Sorry, mate. Caught you red handed. Sad here, of course, know that there's a lot on the line. This is one of the most important games in this group. They want to get to parity. They want to get to two and two and make sure the Glazers are locked into that bottom spot here in group B. A loss here for Sad. Just to be clear, would throw this group into utter chaos yep. all the way from third or fourth rather through sixth. Well, and I think the thing that's most compelling about that is there's a realistic world here where if the Glazers find a way to win, they would go into a winner moves on matchup versus Winthrop next week because let's be candid, Winthrop has to play against M80 and I think everyone and their mom is predicting M80 for that one. So, you know, there is a very realistic possibility here to if the Glazers find themselves a W, they can control their own destiny and try to avoid relegation after what was a really tumultuous start where, like I said, on the other side, sad loses this matchup they still have to play up against tsm and that's kind of one of those things of who knows like that could be a tiebreaker galore situation depending on the results of that one uh and there is still the possibility of you know, there being a three-way tiebreaker of teams to make themselves either into the playoff or out and relegated so lots of things kind of on the line and you know even though this is maybe not the most marquee matchup in terms of players on the list or teams on the board it is a pivotal one here for group b just to try to again assert a little bit of extra dominance towards that push from its season playoffs big love to zachary for the trafalgar law hat there he's always got some particular headwear on really getting the character here as cypher here. and a guest appearance of course from riku's cat thank you very much for that that's that's really set the tone for this game i think now coming on in and that standard viper lurk wall over towards the b side here might be accompanied with a hard hit from yeah. sad and you don't really have much here besides the trap wire it's gonna be a late rotation from a heavy stack at mid you know, depending on what they see or maybe don't see here at middle, they may just gut check call this. And wow, this is perfect timing from the defense of the Glazers. Trapwire will expose some of this play. A little bit of paint shells plus some extra spam fire coming through. But the take is on and we have a pistol battle. Scar now trying to wrap around, but from heaven, there's just too many angles to Five cover down. here. Darkest now, 2v3. Nice little right click there. Zachary's a long way across the map. It's just precision. And they still opt to take the face. Zoe not in a position to trade that at all. And time has been bored at the very least. For Zachary to get in position. 21 HP. Basically dead to a body shot here as Zoe. And Zachary is convinced. Shadows so the action is still going to be here over at the B site. There might be a timing here. Zachary spotted, but great correction. And the Glazers get themselves the pistol. That's a simple timing right there. I mean, if Sad hits that even a fraction of a second, maybe a little bit earlier, they don't get caught by that quick rotation from mid defensively from the Glazers. And more importantly, because of the trap wire exposing and the Vipers while still going up, a couple of the members just commit to getting onto site. They don't even bother fighting high to low ground. They're on to contest for any spike plants to go down. So really efficient defensive rotation from the Glazers through mid map. And now a chance for them to try to really assert their presence over the course of the outside of the map with SMGs and an outlaw play. Zachary playing now with that outlaw in hand over day. It will be Coburg to try and again in sort of classic style, dig something up over here. That cam already got broken on the A yeah. side for Sad though. Yeah, and, and that's not really kind of a moot point in certain ways. Like this is just to try to keep the defense a bit more interested. And this walk up is finding a lot of advancement, but the problem is there is a trap wire down here and a couple of defenders nearby, most importantly drone, who can just turn around, throw a boom bot into paint shells and just shut this down completely. Will they be ready for it though? They heard the ropes and they sound a ropes. You're kidding. Okay, they're gonna try and overwhelm a drone. So they're gonna be able to spray them down. Wall comes up, a drone holds his ground on the other side of it here. Bob able to come out there and get away with murder. There's much more to be done here. Zachary still playing safely back towards screens, and this spike is headed towards the middle of the map, but Riku will move on to set. Yeah. I was about to say, that's actually not a bad trade at all for Sad, considering what it looked like it was going to be a blunder for a moment, but weapons collected really do not provide much more opportunity. 
lasers into a good position. Most of it anchored by Zachary with that outlaw. And I don't know if he was the one to destroy the cam early with the outlaw or not, but it, I don't think it would have made much of a difference whether he had an outlaw, an SMG, even just a long range pistol. That was just a good lockdown play from the Glazers. And a lot of that just coming off the gut check reaction of reading not just a couple of the players, but nearly the whole team moving through mid map and finding a way to outtrade them. It's the same spot he uses, so he probably just spams that location uh, early, but you can see it from rafters uh, over a day. So, either way, Zachary, very much ready for it. Very standard Cypher cam here. It's mm. about to get hot and heavy pretty early, potentially. Yeah, Smaller, the, though, for the guys. Coming lots in fully, of pings. Bombay. Yeah, I was going to say, there's lots of pings, but it doesn't make a difference. There's so many counter flashes here, and ooh, nice little backup from Sad. Finding the first couple eliminations and what looked to be a really good kind of presence play for the side of the Glazers trying to get aggressive and catch him off guard. The patience works out and now Sad of the numbers. And flash there. Information for Sad now that there is a fourth player over at B. Darkus will hold the angle here. Zachary needs to try and find a way to get value out of this outlaw. Good. Oh my goodness. Zachary gets the one. That'll be it though. Sad. Get themselves on the board. Another timing moment, because honestly, the read is really, really well read by TG. They find themselves, okay, there's presence up in towards B main. They throw the paranoia, they throw the guiding light, and then they try to hit it with SMGs. But it really just comes down to the fact that Coburg avoids the flashes and holds an angle to contest the play through that B main tunnel. So really well done from Coburg just to kind of keep a little bit of an extra eye on it and staying safe from all the incoming utilities. But that was kind of the expected result after the pistol, the anti-ecos won, the bonus doesn't come through. Now we've got our first full gun round and we've got the potential of some early seekers here, Uber. One buddy though, at least get some information. Sad more than happy to play past this. Smoke is, well, we already see Scarn get past it. There is still a trap wire to contest with. Page also deployed over here on this piece. So, gonna force Riku off the angle ship. Yeah, and this is curious because, wow, I was about to say, this doesn't have to be a commitment from Sad. They could try to pull some of the defense over, but they do collect that elimination in the process. Just a bit of an over peak from Riku back through the backside of screens. And now with plenty of time on the clock, with the opportunity to scout out extra information and have Seekers, there's a chance that Sad could kind of throw these Seekers out through mid, try to get a read to see where the Glazer's defense is, and then just hit wherever the Seekers don't go. The Glazer's got no information from that. They don't even know how many people are at B. They just re-cleared mid. But again, they've not played aggressively on any other part of the map here. So Sad... Have a window to make some plays here. Nicely I've done. Double sweep trail. here in B, mate. The Seekers will come out of mid, just as you said. Found one. Yeah, and this is, this is such a good call. You're just going to keep the sky behind at mail just to make sure that you can deal with this tower play. It forces the glitch that to rotate deep through screens and already controlling a tower means that this defense really cannot contest this spike plant. So, yeah, really well done. It's just down to how successful is this lurk from Bob because at the moment, timing is looking pretty ideal and the first shots will land. Glazer's in trouble. No heaven control either for the Glazers. They had two players stacked up in screens behind an attacking omen smoke. Zoe here can really just hold this angle and wait for any action. He's about to find out there's no one really playing heaven except right behind him there. Timing though. Oh, it hurts. Zoe's still able to find the one. But here's Scar now going to hold his ground there just outside of screens and precision. Three for three. All alone here. Seekers might have been thrown out, but you already know where they're playing from. And Sad with that late rotation plus a tasty lurk. Take their second. Yeah, and that is all just a byproduct of the fact that you get the elimination over through B. I, I don't think the play changes much if they don't collect the kill. We're in a 5v5 just because they do force a lot of defensive utility to come out early to B main to try to stop what looks to be an early hit. But that was never really the full intention. Sad just throw a couple of things in there to keep the Glazers interested. They collect the kill and the Seekers mid map. It's the perfect isolation. You get a read that two players are at B, follow it into tower. You've got big screen control by playing through a tower. It's just perfect lockdown from Sad just controlling the map. And wow, this battle towards B main is pretty laborious. Both teams really committing a lot off the opening break off to see if they can find success controlling it, but this round gonna be hard pressed to do much with as the Glazers are just stuck on pistols with one Bucky. Zachary at least has been able to play forward for some info on A. We'll see absolutely nothing. So we're here probably just to time this swing alongside Coburg. No real mid presence for Sad this round. They've actually varied their mid presence drastically round around. They leave it open in the fur in the pistol rather than they play three up there in the second. Hmm. Yeah, this is yeah, this is one of those it's only a matter of time type situations and 
Maybe Precision can find something with the Frenzy, but yeah, no nonsense here for Sad. Using all the utility just to make sure they get this one cleanly. Precision's got absolutely nowhere to go. I mean, he was mollied, he was flashed, he was boom botted at, and just everything was going his direction. And this looks like a very well, maybe a flawless round here for Sad. You're going to see why the Glazers do want to play more aggressively into B main. Because once yeah, that sure. utility starts coming in, no individual anchor can really comfortably stand on the site. And that's Zachary. Praising the sun, as it were. <laughs> a little dark in the vents, though, bitch. Not, not gonna lie, not much sun praising going on in here. Oh, well, now they know exactly where he is, and Scarn will <laughs> get the job done. That's a big momentum builder for Sad now. Not a single gun lost here, and there's any flawless. And that's exactly the kind of thing you want to build up for a strong attacking half. Yeah, I mean, the Eco's not bad at all, obviously, but I think more importantly, you know, if the Glazers commit to kind of keeping this play for the Cypher over towards the A side of the map, they may that. need to reconsider <laughs> just flat out. Just, I, I don't know, this battle towards B main has been, like we mentioned, very laborious. And I would say that with this setup, what we're currently seeing, this is probably the last time the Glazers try this. If they don't find success with this heavy-handed B main play, I expect to see a swap up where Zach moves over to play B defensively. <laughs> And then eventually you kind of get the sky over to try to make some presence happen over towards a ramps with things like guiding lights and trailblazers. Because at the moment, sad esports are just getting so much map control so quickly. Zoe trying to get some info about elbow presence there by the looks. And you see in the Zippo replay and at the start of this round, that camera from Coburg instantly gets blown up by Zachary. So he's actually pre-aiming the spot as the while the gates are up because you can see the camera there. Just a small detail now as all of sad drift across towards the B side of the map. The mid's been cleared here by the Glazers. How do they make yep. use of this info? Yeah, it, that's the big P because, you know, as longer this takes, the more that that information kind of just goes a bit awry. You, you don't know if there's going to be any more players here. So now Drone, the showstopper, is going to have to rotate over a little bit later towards topside at B. If Sad does commit through this, which they're not fully committed to yet, but I imagine this will be a blast pack showstopper entry here for Scar, maybe behind a guiding light if they can get Bob back over. You see this from Bob a lot. She got to lurk that middle part of any map. Midway through the round. He comes to show stop of paranoia. What part of me? Oh, goodness. That is a wayward rocket. If I've ever seen one, Skarn gets punished there. Rookie getting picked off. Off the rip. Great little swing there from Precision. The Simfine might not help Coburg. It's not alive to see it. Bob, though, finally activates on that flank up mid. And is able to find two. Zachary again. The arduous task of dragging himself over from A. He's got a little bit of high ground. He's going to have plenty of time to try to sniff this out. And I mean, this is already a lot of clearance. You don't know 100% where Zoe's gone to, but Zach has got a pretty good read on it. The flash reveals, but he gets the first, but not going to read the second. So Bob's late flank comes through perfectly. And I'm not going to lie. Initially, I thought Scarden just got absolutely cheated. I mean, that rocket looked like it landed between the feet of Riku back in the site. Not quite apparently, but the trades still come out in favor of Sad thanks to Bob's play. Interesting round, though, because the Glazers cleared me with that Trailblazer. And yeah. Drone was starting to take some control. And I think the side hit comes at just yep. the right time to pull Drone yep. away. Now, if he doesn't have a showstopper shift, I don't know if he actually responds that quickly. Maybe he tries to, you know, push a quick flank. But had he remained in mid, he would have seen Bob coming. And I really think the Bob element is what unraveled the Glazers there, completely losing heaven control on B. Yeah, and the timing is absolutely correct, by the way, Mitch. I mean, it is the, one of those things that, yes, you do get clearance from the Trailblazer for Precision, but that was so long ago, and you don't have a Poison Cloud set up by Ange. You don't have an extra dark cover from Riku that be played because he's playing on top of the site. So, like, the exchange of utility for the Glazers at mid-map is simply throw something out from Precision and then use that as a chance to read and react. They don't have anything that's really anchoring down mid at all. So it is a bit kind of puzzling, I think, because we've seen some of the most successful defensive setups with this composition in Val Challengers NA. Of you put your poison cloud down there, you substitute it when the poison's all the way expired with the dark cover, and you just never give the offense a chance to get anything red, uh, you know, through mid. But that really hasn't been a focus here for the Glazers, who now find themselves back on a limited buy and. Like I said, after this timeout, I wouldn't be surprised if the Glazers move Zach over to hard anchor B and try to get Riku involved over towards mid a little bit more once they get weapons at hand again. Riku has a Sheriff here. Cage triggered. And early on, he's playing a bit further forward towards B main. Maybe he just hear some fast play. He gets nothing. The camera from Zach just up ahead of Coburg. And there it is going to be the trade position trailer. now to push forward here now. Take that all control. This frees Zachary up to head over towards the B site. Seekers though from Sad all over mm -hmm. a B, so... Maybe just getting an idea of how many people are anchoring this site. Here comes the hit. 
Yeah, but these two SMGs are pretty formidable. Yeah, there's a handful of flashes, but you've got a Sheriff and a Stinger out, and they're going to find success with this. The Glazers pulling together a pretty heroic round. Now you've got the AR picked up in play, 3v2. Although she's going to have to sneak around that left hand side. The flash timing is superb. Beautiful stuff there from Precision. Now Bob in the one versus two, but the swings don't come at the right time. And bold. Okay. Going to throw the pip down. That makes sense. Bob might opt to swap in for a Phantom at one HP. This is a big ask for him, especially if it's up against. What? The Stinger Unreal Bob has an extra sensory perception somehow. The Zippo Clutch comes up for Sav when that round could easily have gone the other way. That is such a sick read for Bob. Because honestly, Ange plays that perfectly. You get the decay down. You don't have a great weapon, just a Stinger. But it doesn't matter what you're holding on to when the opponent only has one HP. And then that little push back in towards B main, they kind of just barely pass by one another. But the prediction from Bob that, hey, if Ange had already popped this backside tower and he's not immediately on this double stack box, he has to be playing at B main. And just a little bit of pre-fire connects. That is a massive swing, saving the round from what looked to be a very formidable setup, considering it was just a couple of a limited buy from the Glazers. So now SAD continue to build on that economy. They're 5-2 up, and this round very well may dictate the entire rest of the half if SAD can find a way to win it. The Glazers have made the variation, though. Shift, you called it. Zachary now anchoring that B site. This does mean, though, that Coburg's camera at A is untouched because there's no yep. one from the Glazers actually... Side itself. I can't even see Scout it. Destroyed. And that camera looks all the way into screens. Can also see uh, what's happening at rafters. So tons of info for the sad cipher. Out bin now. Some util getting exchanged. Trailways came down from precision. Oh, that's. Zoe. Oh, that's not good. Wow. I mean, that was the wild card this round, Mitch. <laughs> the offensive operator out, and it oh. nearly gets exactly what it was dictated towards. Just an extra peak from the Glazers. We talked about it. Their focus through mid-map has only been small utility from precision. This time, it's nearly a double swing right into the waiting arms of Zoe, but the shot doesn't land, and now the Glazers have numbers and a formidable setup oh. as they just swing out of A ramps and, again, just catch Coburg off just by left. simple timing. Does that A ramp oh, pressure here, the mild overload? The Glazers, though, see more. Precision's having a final opener. Beautiful. Darkest tries to step to the site, but the spike goes loose. And it's just Scarn now. The upside for Sad, of course, being that outside of Zoe, they have the credits. Keep the guns flowing on in, but that is an absolutely crucial round for the Glazers to begin some stabilization. Yep, and a lot of it, I think, you know, maybe not necessarily works out as intended because the whole idea of the post-timeout call is to get Zach established over towards B, but instead it's just kind of a double swing at mid that catches on a really bizarre operator that I don't think the Glazers would have expected, but that opening elimination changes the entire dynamic of the round because at that point, now all of a sudden you can't hit through mid if you're sad. You don't really have much in ways of stretching the defense out in other ways, so it kind of just crumbles from there. But now we're really going to have a chance to see how this all works out. Same B main presence, largely from Sad. This is the first time that they'll have any sort of a long read on what Zach's setup is going to look like. And the Trailblazer will take care of the trap wire and they burst through the cyber cage. No worries. Scarn makes it through. Trap wire was too high for the Trailblazer, but I think they got it with the paint shells prior. Here comes Darkest gets caught off. Kilter. Zach, we able to find a key first killer. <laughs> That's why you put this man at the B site, baby. He's locking it down for the Glazers. Dark cover now, Bob. Can't really do much about that trap wire there either. That is there to stay. Last player standing. Nice half swing. The Glazers really putting those together quite well uh, over the last couple of rounds. Here. And I don't know if this is like just Zach getting some lucky timing or maybe it's just kind of a coincidence or if he's dictatively using it, but Riku throws out that paranoia and Zach swings with it to kind of use it as a moving smoke to clear out the backside of the site. You kind of saw the visual deterrent there as soon as it started like to come across. Shield, right? Yeah, it's exactly it. He kind of walks with it and all of a sudden Zach's in the middle of the site and the player sitting backside screen is like, well, where did he come from? <laughs> that was kind of sick. And I don't know if that was 100% a dictated play or not, but if it was, that's some sick micro from Zach to find himself three in the lockdown, which now Sad have to have a conversation about. Because as much as, you like you mentioned, they're getting some value out of this spy cam over towards the A site if Zach's not deleting it. 
how are they going to execute through it? And are they getting enough information or non-information to know that they can isolate whoever happens to be over at A if they don't see this kind of cipher v cipher battle that we had persisting in the first seven rounds? So I mean, there's, there's a lot yeah. to talk about here if you're sad. There's nothing to see in A is the problem because no one right, is showing yeah. out of screens. Although I will say... The very round after the operator gets dropped by Sad and obviously can't be recovered because they get smashed, the Glacius just contact with two players in the mid straight away. So they don't need to clear that. They see it all. They actually have, you know, uh, Ange, who is playing from uh, sort of top mid, just looking straight down. Yeah, so that yeah. gives them a lot of peace of mind about this impending B here. Well, the, the other thing about this is you have a limited buy foot of Viper's Pit to kind of neutralize the lack of long range presence. Paint shells being exchanged, but Zoe will make their way through it, no worries. And this is going to be a hard commit. Probably through some sort of a paranoia combo, and there it is. Just a variation to sneak some on top of the box. Great timing for Riku, that's two. Already presence from mid, and the Seekers are going to garner a lot of information. And it will confirm that Sad are all grouped up here. I mean, they're not out of this round, though. That's the thing. You know, you're in a 3v4 situation. The opening trade doesn't go your way, but you had a limited buy. And now, all of a sudden, you consider, how do we play this out with a Vandal, a Guardian, and a Stinger? And there's a lot of options. I think most in particular, the middle of the map has to be where the focus has to go here, if you're looking at this from Sad. You know that you haven't really been deterred outside of anything besides just kind of shoulder checks, but it looks like instead they're going to kind of take the long route around and see if they can maybe isolate over towards a ramps but this is not the setup that you want trying to challenge ramps a stinger and a vandal yeah it, this would have to rely a lot on darkest kind of getting bait and switched for the seekers to zachary might have confirmed here a hard b hit so he plays back in spawn and they've got to re-clear all of this laboriously the camera though gonna help 30 hugely. seconds left yeah he knows that that trip that trap player in a main is still active so he knows He'll be up ramp, so he's going to get a confirm here, and he does. Yeah, and that Cypher cage will also slow things down just a touch because it does form a bit of a one-way as they cross, but good isolation, dark cover, clearings out screens while also simultaneously making sure that it comes over to the top, and now you get the Viper's Pit to try to establish this plant. And I, I it's, wow, try to clear this is going to be difficult. You have no boom bot, no paint shells, no one up. molly. You've got no precision utility. They're going to have to just do this by running right through it. Yeah, and that's where it gets scary. Against all these weapons, Bob playing the outside of the pit. This is a dangerous swing. Slow. But the Seekers come out now. This is going to tell you all you need to know about that screen's presence of Zachary. Zoe steps up. He's going to be able to challenge this, and Bob is going to be there as well. Beautiful. Just a beautiful turnaround in this round, and the Viper Pit expertly employed. Precision now caught on the outside looking in. Yeah, I think more importantly, just to kind of execute on this, it's the, also the fact that the dark cover plays when it comes through perfectly. No one gets caught after the spy cam initially gets a lot of information and timing is going to be an issue especially with molly's on the post plant so yeah great execution from sad i mean that was a very winnable round and i'm surprised they went that direction they didn't try to cut over through mid simply due to the stinger but hey you get the read you force the hand of the glazers to move their defense over towards b and you punish them for it that is a very heroic round from sad and now there's a chance that they can really blow open this first half just as the glazers start to all the head of steam. Riku, they've been able to pick up an operator here. So you really can hold against some sort of aggressive play towards A, but again, there's no ramps presence and there's no cipher util at ramps to sort of give you an idea of what's going on, but you see that cross well and truly. Riku knows they've got a sit here. There is a small gap in that cyber cage and they might be able to exploit it. Trailblazers to clear heaven here. Precision probably moves in right after it. Oh, but does get pushed off. Just too many numbers to deal with. Don't want to give anything away, especially with Riku still holding down an operator, but whiffs on it so now all of a sudden this site's gone the only real hope you've got is the fact that drones hitting a flank but the neural theft will call this out and the post plant likely moves into screens for this i mean you can just overload this now yeah these players operated there on the ground zachary sees the angle but paranoia is good what? Not good enough apparently precision able to mow him down this now puts the glazes at a player advantage and he can work with this a third for precision but how much further can they go not enough really it's evened up at the very least the glazes I mean, no real reason not to go for this. Two versus two, but Bob has the timing. That's good. Drone can't do a darn thing about it, and now it's all up to Ange. With no real util outside of the snake bite, and in. So the poison orb goes, Bob, come on. Look like Ange was frozen stiff there. Dude, Bob is so annoying. <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, it's just these little peek and poke timings. You find the contact, and then Bob just like runs away just to confirm that no one's able to isolate and chase her down. 
So then all of a sudden, you've got the Glazers looking at five different things at once, kind of stuck up top at tower, and just when they try to get their execute because the time is ticking in their ears, Bob comes back, runs up, finds a kill, runs away. And that's, the, that's the most annoying post-plant through screens. I think I've ever seen. And that comes off of it being initially bobbled when Precision gets a lineup for two. So it really relies on the fact that Bob has to kind of save the day again. So 7-4 tally and the Glazers map pick has gone anything but successful to this point. Once again, Rick has been tasked with holding B down alongside Drone. But there is Cypher Util that's been left behind. Just at the opening. And if they don't have a Trailblazer to break that open, Sad will, of course, be revealed there. Now that mid-round, mid-contact, we don't always see from Sad, but the Glazers always have like a one minute or so time. Some kind of util down there, but the Trailblazer is going to ramps instead and does spot Zoe. Yeah, and that little spot is not enough to commit through, but it does give them the luxury of kind of exploring other parts of the map, knowing that there's going to be a couple of openings and this timing could be huge. It just comes down to can these offensive players at the bottom side of ramp keep the focus of the players up top down towards the site itself, not let them isolate, especially with Zola still, still using this operator up top. Maybe there's a chance to isolate and Skarn has opened the door. Zachary playing oh so passively life. here in this corner. Couldn't see the cross. I love this though. Oh! Get caught. Koberg having to whip around on Zachary. 30 seconds. Not left. a great round here for the Glazers. Still able to keep it close player wise, but Bob is already on that plant. Spike Screens is about to be taken by Koberg. Just standing. as he tries to back up into the smoke, they spot Riku. Thrown in a 1v3. And that shot gives everything away. Now you're just hoping and praying for this boom bot to find some sort of success. This should likely result in a wide peak. And yep, there it is. The timing perfect. And an 8-4 half. The Glazers, I'm not going to lie to you, Mitch, Switching really sides. didn't have anything going for them defensively like at all. They had that one thrifty that nearly started to turn the momentum over. There's also the Zachary move over towards B, which started to find more success. But Sad just said, you know what? We don't want to deal with the Cypher. You're going to go to A? Fine, we'll go to B. You're going to go to B? Fine, we'll go to A. It's just almost that simple. Once they read the information of is Zach going to be playing that spy came up top or not, well, hey, if it's there, then he's not there. And if it's not there, then we can go somewhere else. They're just kind of just moving around Zachary way too easily. I mean, they got rampant ropes for free. Yeah. Sad did. Uh, Every round almost. Round. So yeah. like, the pinch on a precision was very straightforward. Help. Anyway, we'll uh, put that out of our minds now as we head to the pistol for the second raft here, half. Excuse me, but eight rounds on attack for Sad. That is that's a massive boon, and that's going to account for a lot going forward. Again, four players stacked up in mid, and Sad are actually walking it down. Yeah, the timing of this is going to be great, especially if they see the spike. Oh, mercy. This is not what you want. Ange will get a read on this. Molly comes through, but it's really not all that well placed. Sorry. The paranoia comes through, but Drone collects a two, plus now the paint shells to re-clear. That was unbelievably aggressive there from Darkest. Whoa! Okay, we're going in, apparently. <laughs> Ange able to find two here and leave Bob on her own. With the spike headed in a completely different direction. Yeah, that was wild, flat out. I mean, the read comes through just at the perfect time from Ange. Because if Ange is starting to commit to moving in towards B-Main with the rest of the squad, they get ran through trying to plant this. So really good timing. Bob has been a hero or a heroine, I suppose you would say. Not here, though. Pistol goes the way of the lasers. Dad thought they were onto something there with that play down mid. Again, just overcooked ever so slightly see look, looking at the scoreboard though bob because she has had a great game something i mentioned beforehand i didn't really want to see sad have to rely on her too much but darkest has also shown us a, a great first half here on yeah. splits and i i don't really think that you know you look at the 18 and 6 it's it's hard to say you know or make the argument that oh the sad esports is not relying on bob but it's really just been by a byproduct of timing and is bob fulfilling their role perfectly you know, hitting these rogue pinches, the timings to kind of secure post plants. You know, it's it's a lot of follow up off of her own utility, which has been great. But I think the same thing can be said. The efficiency is there for the whole team. I mean, think how many times they were able to execute to get onto site pretty cleanly. So Bob has been a complete package as we've kind of labeled out for the last handful of weeks. Kobeck knows. Glazers want to clear that camera. What? The drone's able to spray it down through the smoke. Good study of the Glazers. Andrew calls with that outlaw in hand. Still heaven presence right now for Sad, and many of them are stacked into the smoke here. Precision and Drone trying to get a crossfire going with the split up by the dark cover. He's still going to go on the attacker's favor, though. 
And that'll be that. Just one player lost here for the Glazers. Yeah, a little bit of that defensive utility, just a little bit too wide. The Mollies don't really flush anybody out. Plus, I mean, it's the fact that it's SMGs in dark covers against Classics. <laughs> I think that result was pretty much predetermined. So an important two rounds there for the Glazers. Uh, but this is where we're going to start to see what their offensive intentions are going to look like. Different Vipers wall placement here for the Glazers. Moving across a tower also blocks the first entry point towards ramp. So... You would have to think if you're sad esports, you need to throw something like a dark cover, or pardon me, a, a guiding light or a trailblazer just to make sure there's no aggressive hit. Uh, but actually, the offensive utility is probably enough for Bob to say, yep, they're here, or at least they're somewhere nearby. So him and Coburg will get to work just trying to lock things up and stay stationary. He's timing here. That'll be one. And trying to spam there with the outlaw, but Scarn had not advanced far enough. Zachary was trying to set up in mid to catch a cross, I think, from, from Mail. Doesn't quite have the timing there either, though. Skarn seems pretty satisfied with their work so far and forced back by the guiding light. Coburg will yeah. not be revealing himself here. Yeah, really good defensive rotation coming through and just knowing that they didn't need to commit after that opening offensive utility comes through. Just back off. That's a lot spent. Counter when we need to. Get someone to rotate through mid and it locks everything down perfectly. And now for the Glazers, you feel like there's no options anywhere because the smoke persistence in mid makes life difficult to where Zach really just has to kind of hope and pray he can walk through it. Same thing can be said for Andrews doing the exact same thing up towards screens. Sure, you get the spy cam out, but the defense does not really care much about that. It just kind of moves eyes just a little left. bit more just to make sure that top A ramp stays safe. Ropes at the start of the round, the Glazers, I think they ultimately wanted to pinch here through mid and eventually their patience pays off. So there's 20 seconds left in the round. Up that rafters control. Coburg, the anchor on the side, though, could be an issue for them. Staying hidden for the time being. Nothing to reveal them. And he springs forth to find two. The spray down is good. And doesn't even know what hit him. And now it's up to Riku to try and pick up all the pieces. But hey, that is a tough job indeed. Sad, get one back. And now start to get achingly close towards the matching number. Yep, that's clean. Again, just off the superior weapons, but also just getting a good read on the Glazers and their initial push, staying alive, not putting yourself on vulnerable spots to get taken advantage by odd number hits. Yeah, yeah really well done. This. Yeah, they I mean, that, that, get info one, about Coburg anchored on the site there. That's and fair. that's a byproduct of them spending so much just to get ramp control, Mitch. I think that's the bigger part of it, right? Is, you know, they're spending so much utility from precision just to get some forward footing that once you actually get to the formidable spots that the defense gets set up in, you have nothing to flush them out with, maybe except for a dark cover of paranoia. So, you know, the utility exchange has definitely favored Sad through this map, and that will continue to be the case at least early on here in this defensive side for them. I like the one we hear from Zoe and B-Main that has allowed them to take all of that space and deny that at least for the next 20 or so seconds is an entry point for the glazers it's re-smoked as well as he's mid though yeah glazers leaning into some util in the middle part of the map here i mean look at the it's just so clean as soon as the poison's low for darkest the offensive one gets put up and he says all right i'll just snake bite that this is my middle by the way you can't have it and then eventually once the smokes toggle hands again you spam through and the focus is just perfect this is exactly the recipe that we've seen in some regard across all of our most successful split defensive teams keeping that poison cloud up and for uh, sorry fortified at the middle of the map and the glazers have just not been able to respect that on their own defensive half and now offensively they don't really seem to have much of an, off uh, an offer towards trying to counter it I mean, this is a process of elimination to some degree as well. A looks like a dog's breakfast with all the cypher util there. <laughs> B had a double one-way smoke in B main that allowed you know, Zoe to take a ton of space. And then just contact into mid uh, off some of that util timing. Maybe you can just spray down through your own poison orb. Sad. I mean, they knew exactly where they had to apply pressure there. And this is something we've observed in the past about the glazes yep. and some of their attacking protocols. Like, can fall apart. There are gaps in util at times. And here... 10 seconds left. You really can't get anything going. No, it, 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 it's one of those things and you know, we, you and I had the cast last week where we saw the same kind of thing happen with Split where it's just like, guys, we have to layer our utility to actually gain some forward ground. We can't just use it to feel out spaces. Like if you're on the offensive side of this map, whatever you're going to do, 
with your opening utility better lead towards either forcing a reaction out of the defense or you getting some good offensive footholds. And at the moment, we really haven't seen that. I mean, the pistol and the follow-up, sure, great, fine, perfect, dandy. But it's another one of those early moments that you kind of see the Glazers don't really have an answer for some of the early utility expenditures because they have to spend things like guiding lights and trailblazers at mid-map. And the shots from Skarn help out, sure, but I think a lot of that is just down to they have to do that because Darkest has been really good about replacing utility at mid to make sure that it just stays constantly under pressure. I mean, that is raw contact from Ange after Precision gets picked off. So I'll allow, like, it's unfortunate timing while Precision's throwing out the flash, but Ange has no choice but to just just to jiggle the corner towards mail. Like, you're on your own, you're a controller, you don't have your sky with you anymore, you have no way of preempting anything or getting that info, you just... Kind of got to swing it. Some good old-fashioned yep. Valorant there. And again, that's that's not really going to pay out for you when you, the defenders are so well entrenched here. So, Santa very, very good at taking away or drawing out these resources from the Glaciers, forcing them maybe to make use of them in inefficient scenarios here. And this emphasis on mid has served them really well, not just yep. on defense, but also on the attacking half, if you remember some of those nasty bob lurks. Yeah, absolutely. In the middle of the map has been a major issue for the Glazers, flat out. And I think the longer this offensive half goes, the more we're going to see them kind of maybe even stray away from it. Try to get some forced hits over towards B main or A main. This time it's a spy cam for the offense to look over towards A. But, you know, with low, with a limited buy and kind of a, a round that you need to deal some damage on, you have to hit this with a heavy hand. And the problem here is they're going right into Coburg's rotation over towards B. There is a trap wire that they do see, but it's a forward spy cam that will be enough, you would think for Coburg to read it and say, let me just get out of here, wait for help. Paint shells there to clear some of that. People might be playing for the orb here for the Glazers. Drone obviously one away from that showstopper. Now we're splitting a little bit. Okay, one minute. Press towards mid. Like this though from Skarn, playing a different angle this time around. And sees a heck of a lot off that. Trailblazer will spot Skarn at the very least, but there's gonna be a at least a crossfire setup, or at least a Viper here is in here, but Darkest is on the watch. And that's the thing is he's got a trap wire to keep him safe. All you gotta do is toggle, throw shoulders. I mean, the retreat back from Skarn means that really nobody can go over towards vents because you even have a Viper wall there. There is the replacement of the smoke a little bit deeper in towards mail just to make things a little bit extra sloppy. And the Glazer's only real option here is to hope they find success from the front and then a late lurk from Riku with this hero Vandal left. can make some work happen. Look at this. The variation from Bob Aye. playing Viper the smoke, but... Not even needed in the end, Dark is ever find two from heaven because that heaven lurk from Riku was way too late. They're forced to play from behind the trap wire. You can see it there. Yep. And that's another one of those things of that late dark cover just kind of keeps the lurk at bay. That's a little while longer. And to be fair, it's also a little bit blessed that Cobra just starts spamming with Darkest and they come away with three kills before the hit even actually happens. So, I mean, the timing of the clock helping out the defender's awareness right there without question. Uh, but flat out, this has been as close to a masterclass as we've seen on split from Sad. I mean, outside of the pistol and a little bit of a folly there, kind of in the middle of their offensive half, it, it's been very comfortable uh, on all fronts through and through. And if you're the Glazers, this is it right here. I mean, you lose this round, you're down bad. So have to have it, whatever it's going to be. And, and I think a lot of this has to be, hey, get a forward smoke in towards vents. Try to put some pressure on the mail. Throw that trail blizzard a little bit later than we've seen, which is mostly coming here from ramen. Like, just get a further, deeper sense of utility and force Sad to have to throw a little bit more out. This Viper Bull here obviously helps out with the A split, the pinch through mid. But the Glazers haven't been out of making this good execute. Look at that. Look at having that Unreal. Viper. That fell to pieces. Skarn's going to get topped up here. And now Zachary wondering again just what to do. Three players from Sad positioned towards that ramp. They overloaded this time around. The Glazers lose a key weapon. Here comes Darkest should know someone's nearby. Oh, well done. But the trade from Coburg is good. And from the back of the site, he's going to get a supply of the dark cover, but it doesn't quite get there for him to use in time. And this could still lead to a plant. Sad look, they want to try to go quickly here, though, Mitch. Bob is very long. Got that in mind, Riku. Able to find him. TP over towards B main. This is nice to be able to link up with Zachary here. You have a player embedded backside. This is a post plant that you've got to feel good. For the Glazers in. Right yeah, yeah, yeah. This is one of those moments where you just kind of hope and pray someone gives you an isolated peek, but they check the spike. No one's on it. And now Riku just has to sit here and play bodyguard on top of it. Good oh, read, like but <laughs> it's still one of those situations that as soon as it expires, it's just an easy double peek to come through. Punishing yet. 
but I, that's what I'm looking for here, Mitch. I, it's just find a little bit more of an overheaded hit, pull the focus towards the outsides, and then use just the guiding light. It was all they used there from Precision to get information that no one was playing in the immediate part of events, get quick mail control, and force Sad to have to make a decision defensively because to this point, they really haven't had to. The layers that they've put together have been really, really well flushed out. Yeah, it's a beast split. It works. I mean, it's it's obviously pretty robust if you can get control of that mid. But like we've been discussing, like the rotation of utility in that part of the map makes it really hard to safely scale in to that key area of split. Now, again, we might just overload ramps again briefly. Viper split down in mid for sad. Yeah, this makes a whole new problem start to come through here for the Blazers. Yeah, even more so the prediction off this. Good trigger discipline from Scarn. Not to be completely fooled to try to hit the midair. Waits for drone to land and then it's all action. 5v4. I like the response though. You're actually activating the rest of the Glazers in towards A main here. And the timing is pretty good. Sad actually give up heaven just in case there's a re-hit off the back of drone falling. All of the action is down here on the ground. And Sad have no idea. The thing is, they can just play a 5v4 retake here. And I think that's going to be the big commitment. You know, you find one elimination from someone like Bob. Seekers are back up again. Spike planted. And that seems to be what they're trying to try to isolate for. Although, the Glazers, timing-wise, are going to sneak through the backside of screens into tower. This still needs to be cleared regardless, though. And Bob will see a little bit of that with the Trailblazer. And they also confirm that no one's over towards the screens themselves. But Zach catches timing over towards ropes. Darkest has to try to make something happen. And they're on the chase. Trailblazer will connect. Now the Glazers have numbers. Player advantage for Glazers, as you said, good flash there. Precision's having to follow up on it beautifully. And the Glazers get it done. I guess it's interesting, right, that Sad felt a little exposed in, in heaven. And I heaven on that round and, and pulled back. I think it was actually Bob. She just played back over towards screens and then into spawn whilst the entirety of the Glazers walked up through A main. And you, you're right. Yeah, they can get a 5v4 retake scenario, but they're still heavily disadvantaged by position. And there is some opportunity here, I think, with what's about to come online. I mean, you're going to be really far away from Drones Alt, but if you can find a way to get Precision up to another set of Seekers, that could be huge. Because what we're looking for right now for the Glazers is, simply put, try to get a Spike Plant down and then reinforce it with a Viper's Pit. That could be enough for them to possibly win round nine. We'll just call it for now, hypothetically speaking. But if you can get to Seekers again... There is an opportunity to make this offense a little bit more, you know, lenient and just find, or find extra opportunities depending on how you want to try to stretch things across the map. This time, the little toggle towards B main doesn't really focus much for Sad. And I think that this is the right call. See if you can pull an extra bit of attention towards mid, pull out the early darkest utility, and then force a decision to come through by hitting this. I think Riku might be moving to try and keep attention there. on the extremities here of B. Nate. Just as we have three players pushing up mid. Drone punches there straight through that poison orb. Okay, we have ropes control. This is a great start. Do we yeah. get activation of Zachary though on the A side? Uh, I don't think they need to yet because they want to wait for these seekers to get pulled and deleted. This really this doesn't result in too much. They know that they're at mid map. Cool. We already knew that if you're sad esports. So go. this is all about, yep, you deal with the Seekers, and now Zach can make his move to try to pull extra attention over towards A while the tower towards B is already being hit. You see the weapon in the back. Drone finds the easy left. kill, and now the action's on. Drone doesn't take hell, though. Scarn is waiting. Okay. No That's way. It's going to go somewhere pretty quickly. It's going to be towards A, but Zachary doesn't make great inroads there either, and Coburg once again is playing from this nasty spot. This time he gets checked, though. He's going to be forced off the angle, but Lance is not ready. And once again, you're anchoring defenders from Sad. Find great timings and swing into attackers caught on the wrong foot. Yeah, it, that's one of those moments that I think that if you're the Glazers, you played that just about perfectly. Wait for the Seekers to come through, delete it, pause for a moment, show force towards A tower, show force towards B tower. And then again, you force the Sad defense to have to make a decision, but instead of that, they kind of just play right into the defense not really being set yet. They were still trying to figure out a bit of a rotation. And then once you get that pick from Coburg, backside billboard, by the way, he's able to help reestablish the defense towards A. And of course, like you mentioned, the trade towards Hell is one of those that just makes the defensive rotation that much easier. I just think the Glazers just overcooked a little bit Let me keep talking about. They just played that a little bit too fast. Once they get back towards me, the Glazers have to make it happen here, and there's only a stinger on Ange. Get a post plan with the Viper's Pit, you're laughing. 
But the issue has been getting the spike down at all for the Glacis here. Trying to clear out these anchoring Scout players. Destroyed. Yes, they get mid-control, but sad retreat to the extremities and are very hard to dig out of these sites. And oh god. Yeah, we've got uh, Skarn in that nasty little box yeah. spot here. And they have to throw something at this. They have to flash it. They have to smoke it. They have to do something. You cannot just run forward and check this. But you can see what Zoe's doing, just throwing shoulders. No one looks. And, well, <laughs> that's the worst case scenario right there, Mitch, I'd say. <laughs> Three for two. And the defense never really gives up much over towards B as Riku's still essentially stuck on sight. You're right. About as bad as it gets here. One enemy Riku remaining. Now. now back for that spike. And a bob will be Defenders immovable win. there. Asad, take the map away. Split goes in their favor. And again, this is where you really expected the Glazers to try and get off to a hot start. And you know what? They look fine. They look decent. But coming out of the defending round with only four rounds, that's not nearly enough. They got no. really red. The soul read from Sad was real on their attacking half. I think we could just label it into one particular part of the map, Mitch. Both sides, mid-map issue constantly. Defensively, did not have the same kind of replace and return utility that we've kind of seen a lot of the staple teams do so far in challengers poison cloud replaced by a dark cover or you replace it by using a snake bite if you're going to commit to that like we saw from sad esports other side of it offensively they didn't really have enough penetrating utility to clear out vents or get up through mail a lot of the utility that we saw coming out from the sky was just to get through the smoke and see the early entryways you need to get that deeper if it's a guiding light it's a trailblazer whatever it happens to be you need to get a little bit of extra information. Force the defense to have to respond to you already at mid. And that just really wasn't a byproduct of what the Glazers to put it together. It just didn't really feel like the playbook, whatever they brought in today, was well fleshed out to deal with what has been a pretty stock defensive setup. And on the flip side, they also didn't have much of a defensive playbook that has resembled a lot of the success we've already seen so far in Challengers. So for their map pick, not impressed from the Glazers, at least not for me. This is a team at zero win three right now as well. This is a series they absolutely must win. It looks like it's going the wrong way and fast for them. They're going to have to bounce back pretty quickly from map number two, which is, of course, just on the other side of this break. We'll be back for more Glazers versus Sad Esports. I'm very conflicted in this uh, question. For the rest of my life, Duel for ranked. So far, me and we did, or yeah, me and we did, have been playing a lot of ranked, and we've been winning. So, for, I'd probably say we did out of everybody. Uh, Mata doesn't lose ranked. Whoever I play with, if they stream, you know the deal. You know the deal with that. Um, no, I think I would play with Sabrosa. I have a lot of fun with Sabrosa. I can't stop laughing every time I play with him. He's a little dumb sometimes. I wake up early uh, to play him because he has a, a bit of a morning schedule. So. Uh, I'm always tired, and he makes me laugh every every two seconds. So I would probably say Sabrosa. Not sure we're gonna win, but we'll we'll have a good time. My boy Pancakes, you know, like that guy's got he's got it all when it comes to rank. Like he comes in, you know, he's ready to he's ready to roll. You know, he's got the raise on deck just in case we gotta see some serious satchel movement. If we need a controller player, he's a controller main. You know, who's gonna Who's going to step up to the plate and rank and say, yo, I'm going to play smokes. I'm going to throw some good smokes for the team. I'm going to win us the game. That's my boy, Jake. The G2 leave. That's, that's like one, one, of my, one of my best friends. I mean, I don't, usually, yeah. I mean, he just carries me. <laughs> it's, it's like, I just sit in his little backpack and then I just run around. Uh, but I mean, I also just like playing with him, so. It's easy. I'm chasing Mada. I have like a 90% win rate, no matter how many times we play, but... See, I deal with Asuna a lot, but I, I don't know if I could take him yapping 24-7 all the time. That's tough. Um, Asuna or Zekin? One of the two. Uh, honestly, Zekin's just like... I could probably lay back and take a nap while I'm in the ranked game. He'll carry me. He's like the best ranked player I've ever seen. And then Asuna's just like pretty enjoyable to play with. He's my friend, so like, why not? Dude, this has got to be like someone like I f*** with. It's got to be like my boy or something. Because if I just say like someone like I'm like okay friends with and then they they don't say me, it's kind of, I kind of just look like a dickhead, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess uh, probably, you know, Scuba. Scuba's my boy. That's my toy.
Welcome back, everyone. We just saw the 13 to 8 domination take place as Sad takes the lead on the series. And I say domination, you think 13 8. Maybe it doesn't make sense, but it was the Glacier winning both of the pistols, but struggling so, so much to do anything else on those buy rounds. It was a struggle every single round, first half, second half. And it was sad just having a field trip in every single part of the map that you saw them. They were looking confident. Uh, we saw Bob looking very good. Dark is uh, then stepping up and, and, and performing to the same level. It was a sad that looked so comfortable. Yeah, and I think a lot of it was just, again, just to hit it one more time in case you missed the first 15 times you talked about it. It was all in the ways that we've kind of been learning about the challenger scene in terms of where the important parts of the map are when it comes to split. We've seen so many teams lock down the middle of the map defensively. That really wasn't a part of the setup from the Glazers. And not that there were a lot of mo moves from Sad Esports to like hard focus through mid, but how many times did Bob just walk through mid, find a flank for free because there was nothing in place at middle of the map whatsoever. It just felt like the Glazers wanted to set up their defense from the towers or on top of sites themselves. And that miss through the middle of the map just led to way too many wide open flanks. And then you flip the sides around and Sad Esports do their diligence at middle and just really never give the Glazers much of a chance to do much of anything uh, at all. I mean, outside of a couple of heavy handed hits, there really wasn't much success for the Glazers uh, throughout either side of this map. I mean, 13 8 losing, uh, winning both pistols, I think, is, is kind of wild. I would have said, like, that's a good example. Like, Riku, they really struggled to anchor the, the B site. I, I think they were varying a lot of, like, early B main presence, but eventually when the hits came in, it was very hard to, to get help there. Bob, her game sense is just, <laughs> just on a bit of a different level here. Like, it's been very, very hard, I think, for the Glazers to sort of try and preempt anything that she's doing, especially in those clutch situations. Koberg has two 3Ks anchoring the, the A site yeah, yep. uh, on, on defense, which is which is huge, right? Because the Glazers get through the middle part of the map by spending everything, which is great. But as soon as they get boots on the ground and actually go for a site hit, they can't get any info about where the anchor players are. They check screens, checking elbow, checking you know behind the barrier on A, but usually one of those angles gets left open and that player completely derails the Glazers in general. So it's a tough map, but this is what happens when you are light on util. Uh, it's a, one of the obviously the issues with Sky having less one less guiding light, but also when you're when your opponents as defenders don't give you anything for free. Is that a very disciplined here on on split? The other side of it, just quickly, important to note that outside of the round following the pistol, there is never a moment in that map where the Glazers held an eco advantage. At worst, or at best rather, I should say, they were in full buys versus full buys, but they were playing from the backside of the eight ball the almost the entire way through that series, save the rounds after the pistols where you naturally come in with an eco advantage. So that's another part of it in terms of controlling the tempo of the game. 
you know, lots of momentum built up quickly from Sad Esports, and that limits the amount of chances that the Glazers even get to break down these things that are causing them issues because you have to do it from, at best, a level playing field. And more often than not, when they did have full weapons in these full versus full rounds, they were dealing with Sad Esports having a handful of critical ultimates that changed the tides of those rounds in particular. So, yeah, full control from start to finish right there for Sad Esports in my mind. There's only one player on Sad that actually has a negative first kill, first death ratio. So, you know, almost that, yeah. <laughs> every single round, Sad are playing a player up after that first engagement. I think Drone is like five and eight, first kill, first death. Obviously, as the, the raise, if you're not really able to get anything going there, it's very, very hard Hi. to convert off of that. Yeah, I mean, you're trying to, you end up hitting a site with little info and a player disadvantage quite often, mm -hmm. uh, which, is, which is a huge deficit to come back from. On a map like Split, especially. And there's some teams that are able to convert that deficit, but it, it, it's so rare to happen, right? It's really impressive, actually, when we actually get to see it. And for these te two teams, the one thing that you're relying on the most is the numbers advantage to convert it to that round win. And it was something that Sad was doing constantly. There was a point in the first half, I think the seventh, eighth round, where Bob was 17 and four. It was just insane. Then you see the rest of the team kind of stepping up. And, and Uber, I wanted to ask you because you said towards the beginning, before we went into the map one, that you didn't want to see just Bob by herself. Stuff. you wanted to see the support for the rest of the team uh do you think we did get to see that towards the second half of this map yeah no, absolutely i think like what what bob is able to bring to a team is a really fresh look on a lot of the mid-rounding and it's not necessarily even the calling she's just you know a loose player she's not carrying the spike they have good presence at, at a site she'll be like i mean i just cleared mid with my trailblazer i'm gonna go there <laughs> whereas you know what we saw from precision gen was like a, a tentative like one minute mid clear with the trailblazer and then just not really take the space don't feel like you can that was that one round where bob actually like flanks and gets three uh and the glazers were not able to right. really split onto a site very effectively a couple times through ropes they went there but the viper wall they throw at the start of the round that sort of cuts through heaven it telegraphs uh, an a split through mid so either we saw sad give up heaven and not risk getting pinched there or play more aggressively for mid and stop that arm of the pincer from even hitting the a side at all leaving zachary you know, on the tools, he's got his cams, he's looking at his stuff, that's great, but he doesn't really have anyone to play off of. And he doesn't have the utility to clear ramp on his own. And now you're gonna need a lot more for the side of the Glazers. I think we talked about towards the beginning of the show that every single time it's been at least one map that has been closed, but this one honestly felt like domination for Sad. And as we jump into the second map of Sunset, I'm curious to see how things are gonna shape up. Just knowing the history of the two teams, one has played it, one hasn't and shift honestly for me i'm feeling a 2-0 for sad yeah i mean i think you're gonna be feeling pretty comfortable about it not only because like you mentioned we're going to sad's map pick but they did look pretty good against with uh, against turtle trip when they played this map um and it was a very standard kind of stock setup in terms of agent composition that they just executed really nicely on whereas the expectation on the other side even though we haven't seen it in a while last time that the glazers played this map was during their qualifiers they did beat a good blin esports team who does play this map a lot in Seaval, but they used a breach and a gecko combination i don't know if we're gonna get that i feel like we're a little yeah. bit past that point of trying to pull something like that off uh but i would not be surprised then try to default towards playing more initiator base rather than controller or sentinel base like we kind of see on the other side for sad esports so uh, i don't know I'll, I'll be interested i think to see what they want to do here compositionally because after not finding a lot of not a lot of great initiation from split they need to have that in more focused concentrated choke points which is what sunset provides so i i would need to see them pull out the sky and i wouldn't be surprised if they pull out a breach still with that maybe give Oe give zoe an operator and, and and let him play towards like on defense play towards that a extremity um you know especially if we're seeing like the glazers who love just contacting uh, a lot of these sort of wide angles we saw Zoe pick up the operator. Oh, look, it didn't exactly play out that well on split, but that is like an option that could be quite powerful here, especially if your sky is already dogging in towards B lobby, right? And sure. Getting all that info on the other side of the map. There's a couple of options here. There's a couple of options that can be done for the other side, especially because there's that element of surprise, right? But we're going to see how it chips up as we jump into the agent select of the second map of Sunset. There is that chance of the 2-0 or the potential for us to see that third map as I look at the compositions. Mm. There's a couple of differences, but you're going to continue to see that duelist uh, fight between Drone and Scar. And let's find out where this takes us. Uber and Shift is up to you. Thank you, Dryad. I mean, this does mean that the Glazers are a bit flashlight on this particular map, right? bringing in the 
the rays, which is something we see, uh, sorry, the fade rather, something we see alongside the rays on like Lotus, for example, as the kind of map where you can set up those seize trap plays. And, uh, sure. and obviously having a scan agent here can be uh, a bit of a difference maker, but uh, you know, sad with the very tried and true, straightforward setup here. Uh, that sky, of course, of Bob, we've already seen her look extremely dynamic on split this series. Yeah, I, I just, I, I, I worry about this composition for the Glazers because it's one of those situations that like you don't really have a true flash outside of just the paranoia. So there's gonna be a lot of pressure here when they get to the offensive side in particular to not just find and confirm good information with the fade, but they also have to play around Andrew's setups a lot just to try to isolate sites. And I, I'm kind of just selfishly hoping that Ange kind of holds on to that Viper Spawn maybe a little bit longer than you'd anticipate since you have so many information seeking tools from Precision that you can drop a late wall and try to burst through a site a little bit quicker with some good isolation. Cause I don't know, I worry about a solo paranoia kind of as their only true flash option here. Um, as much as the Nightfall, I think, is a very powerful ultimate on this map from both sides of the spike, I still worry generally about their lack of ability to control tight angles by not really having true flashes. Yeah, I'm just, I, you know, the breach here is very powerful in this map, especially because of the fault line you can throw out from the A site to yeah, follow yeah, up yeah. with the paranoia. I think we kind of saw that in that core YFP matchup earlier. But here you go, Coburg can see a heck of a lot. Straight up towards A link here and very quickly, the Glazers backing off of the A site entirely behind that trap wire. Khan's going to try and spot it out here. There's the C. So good. There's no follow up. Yeah, I, I, I love this commitment from Sad. You get over towards elbow, no problems, but you also just force the glitches to have to sit on this backside of the A site. Now, there is a bit of an elimination coming through in the front while also simultaneously a play from the back. Should be known as the trap wire gets destroyed, but Sad are looking to push through and find these kills. Darkest again, strafing around the corner with a right click. This time it works, though. Great paint shell timing there, uh, I've got to say, from Scarn, and actually stopped people following up on the trap wire from Zachary that revealed one of the sad players. Oh. Mitch, this okay. is such a good post plant play from Sad getting all the way deep in the back, but Ange isolates. They don't know that Darkus is still here, though. Coburg just needs to hang around a little bit longer. Yep. Buy some time for an off angle for Darkest. We are going to see the Glazers try and overload this. Coburg hears it. They know approximately what is it going on with Riku, who's going to get brought down. And look at that! That's stunning! Darkest with three. Sad with a post plant that almost goes awry, but tell you what, Darkest and Coburg had it all sorted out. Small moments in there. I think first and foremost, the isolation to play through elbow was absolutely perfect. You get control of it, you force precision back. No real chance to stop it afterwards, so you just keep pushing through. But it's the spy cam that's left behind. The trap wire doesn't actually see much, but there's a moment in there where Coburg goes back into the spy cam and reads both players, which gives the information to Sad that, yes, we have to commit to continuing to play through this defensive spawn and wait out this flank a little while longer. And then, of course, you already saw the delay from Coburg sitting in the poison cloud that was placed by Darkest. Perfect post-plant play. Great awareness, great conversion. And this is very straightforward, right? Paranoid A-Link, follow it up with a smoke and then throw one for the one-way in spawn. Immediately, your post-plant has been secured now. And you've got some awkward weapons here for the Glazers to make a push here from A-Link. They're all coming from the same way. Yeah, the C's out, but yeah, you're running right into a Guardian, Vandal, Stingers. <laughs> I mean, wow. that's just, yeah, you know, just see what you can pull with just classics out. It's the very regular uh, post, uh, post pistol loss setup that we often see. But the problem here is two Vandals were purchased in that last round with the Guardian. So now you've got a couple of the full armors out. And for a bonus, this is formidable for sad esports. That's right. Got to be feeling all right about. Another A hit here. Really easy to cut off A link, but the Glazers this time gambled that extra player on towards A. Sad, of course, no indication as to whether they want to make use of mid here. They probably should spot Riku with this Cypher cam off the rip now. And that's not enough to dissuade them. Here they come once more. Yeah, they're just catching guiding lights in the face. And you have to throw paint shells to delay. There's the haunt behind it. Try to delay a little longer. That's already a lot of utility gone. Trailblazer follows up with a peak. Two for one. Two make a two for two. Not bad for the defensive trades, but that's weapon upgrades now still holding two vandals. Yeah, you're turning those stingers into vandals here and going one for one. You've got to feel good about that as the attacker. Zachary still laboriously making his way across the map here. Might find a timing towards a link, but Ange's in a position here to play high low oh with him. But God. just enough time at least to get the trade there. The spike though. Bob, she's always a step ahead somehow. She's well and truly out of that A site. And really, Zoe just needs to throw a dark cover, keep the defense interested towards the say hit. 
and then back up to support. And I that is help. what pretty much happened over towards that A outside elbow. Bob kind of gives away the play that the trap wire gets triggered, and that means that the defense has to rotate. But they're going to have absolutely no information on where this post plan is, except for the fact that it's not in market thanks to the spy cam still being up. So Riku moves in behind that already cleared space. It is going to be a play here from B lobbying without that uh, Viper alive anymore for the defenders. They can't make use of that wall. First one way comes down. This is already set in place by Zachary at the start down. of the round. A lot of smoke here. The dark cover's thrown down. Riku is going to tap the spike. Zoe, though, tears him to shreds. It's just on the Zachary now to try and play close here. Gave it a tap once more. This is going to draw Zoe out of hiding. But even after Zoe, the final boss, Bob, would have been waiting. That's three in a <laughs> row for Sad. Yeah, really good post plan set up there from Sad as well. I, I, the, there's a deep, dark cover that gets thrown just as soon as Zoe makes her way over. That keeps the Glazers interested because, yes, you get market control for free, but you don't know if anyone's playing deep towards B. And then as soon as they isolate, dark covers have never been enough to stop a post plant from being locked down from that A main position, or that B main, B main position, pardon me, where you can just spam through. Just ping it, spam it, get the kill. No worries from there. So bonus is successful for Sad. And, well, the Glazers are in trouble early already. Hate to say that only three rounds in, but unless they can find a way to get these sheriffs going, which they do, as if this could get out of hand quickly. Good opening double, though, from Drone. Beautiful from Drone, especially because Angel's forced off the, the crossfire angle by the paranoia off the rip by Sad. He really had to hold his own there. Alongside Precision, of course, but that's a great way to stop this momentum from Sad, who are building up quite a bank as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, the long lurk here from Zach is essentially going to force the hand of Sad to have to stay here. Uh, the defense could also commit extra numbers because of the positions at mid while also holding over towards the offensive spawn. Uh, then all you have to do right now, if your position is just kind of wait, delay, get a little bit of space, then throw the prowler when you feel like the hits on the way, just to slow it down a little while longer for those extra defenders to rotate over. I mean, this is definitely holdable for Sad. Largely thanks to that opening double. Can, if they hit one more, I mean, Sad is going to be really reeling here. Prowler there barely bothers Bob. There's so much util up for the attackers, though. Throne experiencing that right now. Dark cover towards Spawn. Tried to make the swing, but only at 5 HP. Precision here will be taking direct contact on Cyber. They've been spotted out with only two bullets in the chamber, and neither of them hit their mark. Sad. Slow the tempo up here, shit. They're able to break this one open. It was so disciplined. Flat out. I mean, you called it perfectly. The offensive utility gets placed to kind of block off a couple of the long range sight lines. You wait to see if maybe you can pull someone out in through those smokes. And then as soon as they start to make their hit on the way, the Glazers just get caught. And that long flank from Zach essentially amounts to nothing just due to the fact that the kills from Sad from the front were so clean, so quick, that there really was never a chance for Zach to kind of sneak in from behind and make a mess of this post plant setup. So really good start here uh, for Sad. And I, what I'm going to talk about here is I don't even know what you talk about in this timeout if you're the Glazers. Because you've been getting worked over towards A, and you don't really have anything in your ballpark to defend at all because you either move Zach over and then the same thing's going to happen at B or you have to start committing like a double satchel play from drone with a prowler maybe a paranoia just to try to get some more a main control that might be the only real options they have is either moving Zach or just trying to get more aggressive because with no flashes trying to contest the plant or try to foil a post plant setup is just so hard pressed to do one issue that you are having as the defenders here, is that Angel's getting forced off that angle at A main by the paranoia start of every round. Can you put Riku there and counter paranoia to at least let you post back up on the angle and have a crossfire as the attackers make their way towards A? That's one possibility. <sighs> It's just that's such an expensive call, though, because that's your only flash. So it's yeah. like if you're going to yeah. use it, you better find something with it. That's why I think kind of the conversation would have to be. And this is one of the reasons why I really don't enjoy seeing skyless or breachless comps on this map. Is just you just don't have any ways of reclearing space. Yeah, I mean, posting back up. But look at this. I mean, it's going to be forced away. I don't mind this, but that snake bite only stops Ange from getting sort of, you know, rushed on here. It doesn't yeah. actually do anything about reposting the angle. The poison orb, though, different story, right? That yeah, does give you that staging ground. That, and then you also replace with a Prowler Ford. I don't think you needed to throw paint shells just to maybe get a little bit of damage. I don't really understand that call. But it does at least, again, force that A main pushback. Now all the pressure's on Zach, though. He's got the perfect setup, little high-low setup with his trap wires, with him on the box nearby, spy camera reveal. And now it's just down to him just keeping his life, waiting for the defense to rotate over. 
There we go, Zachary knows there's some action here, but it was a trailblazer that caught a trap wire. It'll be a one for one and best one and done for your cipher embedded here on the B side. Riku takes a wide swing, finds Darkest inside lobby here, and things are slowing down for Sad. Spike is loose outside of B lobby. Drone going to be forced back briefly. And Scarn is embedded here, but there's no one to play crossfire from this position. So yep. eventually Scarn will be dragged down alone. Yeah, really good follow from Riku. It was one of those moments that maybe for a moment, because Drone's rocket doesn't actually get the elimination onto Scarn, you start to think maybe left. the Glazers just overlook that position. But no, not to be. Good discipline from the Glazers here defensively. All of that started by Zachary just getting the first elimination while also delaying the follow-up hit from Sad with the cyber cages. Really well placed. And well, Zoe's gonna fool absolutely nobody with this dark cover and fake teleport situation. So good defensive rotation, and that's a great moment because you stop the A main push and you also get a nice solid fortification out of Zach on an island by himself. I think if you're the Glazers, you just keep running this until it gets responded to. He's actually able to play from that position there. I mean, it kind of gives away the game that the Cypher is hiding inside that particular cage. But that little step forward from Riku there confirms that there was no TP forward at all from Zoe into that corner. So I knew it was a fake there. Good job. I mean, I mean, the Glazers managed to stop this this A hit, right? This real sort of overloading of players from Sad here. And they're going to have to run it back once more. This time, though, they've switched drone across. Yeah. Same setup. Prowler comes through. This time, though, Sad just don't care about it. Okay, so look how different this is immediately. They just don't care if there's a poison place. They don't care if the Prowler comes through in tags. They want to get this elbow control, and they get it. So now we all of a sudden have to see what are the Glazers going to do? Are they going to try to still contest this? Maybe even try to reclaim elbow? Or do they just plant up and here comes the double swing? And that's well done. One for ones are fine. Skarn turns the tides with a showstopper, but it's an expensive tally, and the site is still not technically taken. I like this though, because I like the pistol. The Glazers don't just back off into spawn and A-Link when this take of elbow happens. Yes. They they group up as three and they fight for that sort of A elbow behind a uh, Prowler, I think it was. So again, with that limited flashes, a Prowler still, you know, serves a purpose there and directing a lot of attention pre-swing. And again, Sad follow the same playbook. They go, okay, well, we did well here, but we've got a player advantage, but look where Coburg is far up in mid here that's such a pivotal position now for sad to, yeah. to play this round out similar to the previous one except with insurance yeah the only question mark though for sad before they plant is yep yeah, do they oh. actually get a read where the defense is so the neural theft taken. will get spent over will have to kind of back up and get out of this position but the viper's pit provides cover for them i mean they're going to stay through this i mean the cyber the neural theft will be expired by this point so this 2v2 should favor the post planters Riku with a couple flashes the one, or rather, the one flash that the Glazers have access to. And a couple of those dark covers here as Zachary starts to meander his way in around the outside of this Viper's pit. Blinding. Flash here for Rico. <gasps> gone, oh, Here's the him. footstep. Darkest waiting with the shorty. Zachary standing. has the range of buns at the very least, but Scarlet's going to be waiting and gobbles up the cypher as he comes calling. Sad with a very small adjustment there, getting a player embedded in mid and, of course, trading positively on that A elbow, convert the round. Yeah, and I, I will give a little bit of a tip of the hat here to the Glazers. I think the way that they're continually saying we're not going to allow them to get free A control is perfectly fine. It comes with a bit of a risk and reward situation, though, right? Because like we called out, you have to peek with the Prowler. But where things go awry in that round is simply off the fact that Riku teleports on the box and then their footstep off of it alert Skarn that, yep, the teleport is over to my right, and that's enough to also follow up with the post planter that's playing deep in towards main that you've got trouble coming your way, my friend. And now Coburg walking in towards a tiles will find himself a one for one. And this is a different look already in terms of how sad can quickly get onto this A site. I like that. It'll play us down tiles here. Probably make, make sad feel like they're on a timer. Spike yep. They have to go back and check this now. Darker sees no one coming, so assumes that the Glazers just pull back to their side of the map, which is the case. And here we go. This, uh, yeah. this is reminiscent of Bob. Oh, oh my so god, good. they lined up, and Bob cuts into pieces. That is disgusting. Well, think of the awareness there, Mitch. You paranoia through it because you know the Glazers are going to use a Nightfall here to try to retake. So the proactivity from Sad is perfect. Throw the paranoia, peek through it, try to catch them maybe while they're also trying to pull out that Nightfall. Uh, it's just absolute chef's freaking kiss. Paranoid doesn't fully land on this elbow, but 
it's enough for just the quick angle to come through the paranoia clearing out close it's just absolute perfection from sad esports man that triple stack from the glazers to try and retake parts of the map right we've seen it a couple times on a <laughs> it just turns into bullet cushioning there for bob as she does not miss but this okay, aggressive take of B main here, but it's been spotted out by Sad. Now they can section this up with that dark cover. No. Zachary springs forward, but gets traded out. It's not bad B. for the defenders here, but Sky and Zoe have to get to the spike. Beautiful pistol work here exactly from Precision. Trading are. evenly with the attackers with just pistols, that's a good start. And interesting here, if they play this post plant backside of B, this neural threat will reveal that both Precision and are making their way around. I was going to say, maybe there would be a chance for Precision to kind of cut back in towards B-Main to get another weapon, but instead they try to push through the back side. Skarn is here! Skarn finds both the timings, man! It's just like, as soon as the Glazers are about to hit the triggers, someone steps in the way and foils the plan for Sad Esports. They could do no wrong today. I didn't mind the Jiggle Peak there from Precision. That was pretty well advised, and I saw how low I think Skarn was there at 30 HP, but again, the Eco disadvantage plus losing, you know, a couple of those key players early. It hurts them. I like it, though. We're seeing variations on the defensive side. First, it's a triple play down into tiles. Then, of course, it's, you know, getting those players over towards B lobby, trying to get set up, but the timing just isn't good enough. They're a little yeah. too slow, and they don't have the flashes to play off. And this is the thing. Like, when we saw Sad play against the more formidable opponents in this group, in particular, you look back to that match versus M80, they were not just, you know, bending the knee and saying, we'll play your game. No, Sad was giving them some workout, man. And they were playing good, proactive Valorant. They were putting a lot of great decisions on the board, especially in the mid round. And them finding enough, a little bit of success here and there versus M80, followed up versus Turtle Troop, not quite able to finish the series off. But here it's kind of the same story, just different day. Just getting aggressive, knowing where their advantages are and trusting that the calls that are being made are the right ones. And so far, those timings on the calls have, like we continue to be mentioning, they're in the perfect window. Timing-wise, it's been absolutely ideal from Sad. The only time they've been foiled is the simple, the one time Zach had his setup towards B tested. Yeah. That's the only time that their offense has been foiled. They're gonna smoke this A main early, the Glazers. They have but to. They will be pushed off the angle briefly yeah. by this paranoia if it comes out like it basically has every round from Zoe. Could also get a double blast pack here or something of the nature as well from drone. Now, deep no smoke. Yeah. And the Viper Spit. Okay. So now the question is, you know, the Glazers are thinking, okay, we have to force them over to where Zach's setup is, but you can't lose focus at mid-map is what I was about to say, because Sad Esports has not tried anything through mid yet, and they have a perfect wall to keep winning mid and stretch out this Glazers defense in a different way. So this wall has allowed Coburg to push up close to market a couple rounds. Yes, now. it has. Yep. So they have conditioned uh, the Glazers to not lean too heavily in this part of the map. In fact, I don't think the Glazers ever... They don't really know that Coburg moves up there. They don't really know the timing of it. But you've got to expect them there after yes. a Vipers bit gets thrown down an A main. And Precision, unfortunately, just goes for free there. Yeah, and that's the thing is, use a Prowler. Use something. You can't just raw peek that. You're the only initiator on your squad. So now all of a sudden, Drone has got to be called Ooh. to make a hero play. This isn't going to connect. Surely not. Or, okay, maybe not, but the trades are still good. I mean, Sad have isolated this perfectly because there's no other way to clear out this deep mid position. Well, and just spotted. 30 seconds left. Last player up for the Glazers here, and that spike can quite easily just drift over to the B direction. Done well to win that battle, though. Koberg falling. Oh, almost able to catch the timing here, but sound cues being given away, and the spike is headed elsewhere. Bob will stand her ground and receive... Credit to the Glazers because they've figured out how to stop this early A push. But they need to know what to do after that. They need to be ready for, you know, sad to get funneled into a different part of the map and handle them there. Yeah, and even that comes with a small asterisk, right? Because they stopped the A hit by putting a Viper Spit down, which they're not going to have again. So it's like, it's, it's almost one of those moments where you start to kind of beat your head against the wall here a little bit. Because like you continue to mention, you know, there's always been kind of the tried and true. If it ain't broke, don't fix it for sad esports. Just paranoia down this A main lane. Hit it with multiple numbers. The only thing that stood in their way has been a prowler and a snake bite to this point. And here we go again. Snake bite gets placed early, and Sad just do not give a rat's rear end. They just push right through it. Now the paranoid comes Ooh. out late, and Elbow's gone for free. And there's just no way that TG can contest this. And they try and clear it with the horn. 
It works out pretty well. To be fair, a lot of damage already taken there by Bob. Both teams actually experimenting with later timings on that fight for A. The late power in order. I'm really glad you pointed that out. That's kind of why it's always been holding onto it. It worked. But the re-clear behind the haunt from the Glazers was ultimately successful. Yeah, and that's just, that's a TDM right there in front of A. And that's just who shoots better. And that was as bad as 3v3 as you're going to see. And not to make it sound as simple as it was, but Sad Esports just didn't hit their shots. I mean, they had all the 1v1s they could have possibly wanted. And it's really just a full-on team fight, but nothing was really in their way. It's just a haunt that comes down that maybe you delete it, maybe you don't. Doesn't really affect the team fight too much. That was just the Glazers flat out winning their gunfights. Wow, this is a nice Hasn't been happening enough for them over the course of this series, but they find a spot to start to build a little bit of a momentum here. Now, look at the complete variation here defensively. Zachary is not going to fight for the side at all. He'll play off of it. We actually have more of Sad leaning into mid via tiles here. And yeah. it's a heavy rotate already well, all day. And the difference here for the Glazers is because they were kind of heavy stacked the box towards mid is that they have both prowlers available to try to re-clear space towards A when they try to play for this retake pending that Zach does have to give it up. They also still have this Nightfall that they've held on to for 11 rounds. So that is also a retake tool that is available for the Glazers. And on top of that, if you're really worried about the post plant, you can scout it out with Riku's from the shadows. So lots of options here in terms of how the Glazers can retake this site. I think a lot of info was just garnered there by Zoe. Oh Zachary, yeah, has to play from outside of the dark cover, but he's looking for a timing. Spike comes down. Okay, here's that nightfall. So we're going to play it back off of that one. Smoke it up now, and they're ready for the cross to come through. Straight through the smoke appears precision. It's too easy for Zoe. The, the attackers are so entrenched in this post-plant scenario that they don't need to hear. All they need is two eyes and a heartbeat. <laughs> and Ange might have those, but no teammates to back him up. Yeah, give a lot of credit to Zoe. That is the perfect placement of denying the nightfall with the dark covers. You put them on close angles, force them to have to push through. Like, I mean, you say it with the perfect amount of comedic timing. It doesn't matter if they can't hear everything. That's you got to run into them. The paranoia comes out with the nightfall. And it's like, again, it's one of those things of so what? I mean, you've got dark cover placements to where, how do you get back into the site if you're the Glazers with only prowlers? It's just not enough, man. I, I just, you have, if you're going to play retake like this, if you're a TG, you have to have flashes, just flat out. You have to have something that can flash because the Prowler and the Haunt is just not enough to clear out space. And now you're going into round 12 where Showstopper's at the ready, Neuroptat's at the ready. This is probably your last buy for the Glazers. I like their positioning from Drone. Skarn is not ready for the high placement of the enemy rays. A Cypher can lose spots and all the players over at A-Link. And yep, Darkest is basically ready to line up that pretty standard Omen spot. Ruku can't get an edge there. And again, now you just come ah. to the site, force the defenders out. Difference there is Coburg trying to get alert through mid, and Zach was doing the exact same thing through B, so that isolated pick makes things a little bit more manageable for the Glazers. They've held off the spike plant to this point, and Sad are also making a bit of a call here saying, wait a second, if we can get this down in a corner, pop a quick Viper's Pit, this may give us a little bit of an advantage. It has to be now, real quick. Well, and nothing much standing. done there. Pit comes up, pit goes down. Now it's going to be Bob in a one versus three. We know she's good for these. That's one, that's two. Zachary trying to get the full stick to fuse. Does Bob have a feeling about it? She might not be quick enough swinging this quarter and Zachary sticks it down. Filthy stuff. And the Glazers find yet another foothold, but it comes right at the end of the half with only three defensive rounds. It does not feel like enough. No, no, it doesn't. But again, that's a round win off of Zach. I mean, sure, four kills, that's easy to call, but it's the one through mid map because sad esports have everything available for them to get the spike down have the viper spit come up then have a lurk through mid but the timing from zach pushing through b catching coburg is really the difference maker there but like you mentioned three rounds in the defensive half with the amount of issues that started to occur just based on the lack of initiation you don't anticipate that changing much just because we've swapped the sides around like the glazes are going to have just as equal of a difficult time here trying to open up sites as they were contesting them from the defensive side. And you can already see, look at Sander doing. Just playing really far forward, forcing the Glazers to have to spend utility to either search out this information or control a little bit of space. Interesting that the Glazers smoke top mid with the Omen, as well as have a Viper Wall set up there. They're really adamant about staking their claim to this part of the map. The transitioning off it is the key. And Skarn can spot this early A action here. Even though there is a poison orb out there in this choke. 
Here they come now. On the walk. Poison orb deployed. Skarn's got to be careful here. This could be awkward to cover multiple angles by it comes down. I think they swooped it, actually. Skarn backs away. There is some attention here from the ailing side as well. Well, here's the thing is Skarn backs up, but doesn't fully give away elbow control. So there's still, again, pressure here for the Glazer. They have to clear the space out. Haunt comes through. That's enough for the Wait. first follow-up. Not there. And the damage is done here for the Glazers making their way onto A. I just don't think Sad are ready for the timing or just how fast yeah. the attackers are going to be there. Zoe obviously wants to swing that off angle there, but it came way too late. Two versus four here, a lot to do for Sad. Zachary now inside that poison orb. More than happy to hold his ground for the time being as Kobeg's able to find the one at the very least. Cypher cam removed. Poison orb comes down now in a 2v3 retake for the defenders. It's a great cage. It's going to isolate this 1v1 a little bit Last deeper. Player. Now they know where the last two players are. Kobeg got the first two blindly through smoke and nearly isolated to give him a chance in the regain, but not to be. And the Glazers, another pistol win. They've been good on the pistol, but... I hate to say it, that's where they've really only been good to this point. And they need to find a way to steamroll this economy. They have yet to be up at any given moment in this game outside of the follow-up from the pistol in the eco department. Have to win this one. Probably also would like to, if not have to win the bonus, just to give yourself a chance that's to reduce the deficit as quick as humanly possible. That is the round, right? Yeah, really sad, yeah. take like two or three stingers into their bonus and convert it really nicely. Upgrade all those weapons and get out to those four rounds. Only really giving the Glazers like one in the first nine of that first half. Well, patience here. Okay, you don't want to give anything away for free if you're the Glazers because every round is a critical round from this point on. So a little bit of a look over towards B main. Defensive wall not up at the moment, but the spy cam is also deep in towards mid. And Sad Esports are just going to make a gut check call to either yeah. stack the box or push through it. And yeah, they're going to give this a go. Flash out just to see. Cyber Cage, just a small delay, but Zach is a bit isolated here. This is a 1v multiple. Hoberg, oh my goodness, this is disastrous. Doing? That's two weapons handed over now. Spike. spike was also dropped and able to pick it back up. Thanks to the dark cover drop down there by Riku. And look at the weapon. I mean, again, Koberg able to upgrade. Darkest here with a Spectre. No presence on A for the defenders here, but keep an eye on that util. Despite coming into this round shorthanded, they have quite a lot of it. Yeah, the same can be said, though, for the Glazers. They've got both 30 seconds left. the dark cover and the paranoia from Riku, who, oh, if he drops here, that would be very massive. In open stats, it's a nice double, plus damage onto another. And this 2v2, a little bit more hard-pressed with an outlaw specter for Sad. Bob has an outlaw. Yeah, that's uh, pretty scary. Obviously not all that well suited for this particular scenario. And just wants to hold here while Drone goes looking. No one has pushed up towards spawn by A. Lincoln. Bob, in fact, he opts up a little. Nice. Oh, beautiful Satchel. Knocks Darkus out of the cover. Bob needs to go for just a raw shot here. Sees Ange come across. Second bullet connects, but Ange is well armored. Oh, now we'll try and make something happen with the Spectre. Tap of the spike, and the Glazers are able to convert. And, well, I think if you're the Glazers, you don't have to force a heavy handed buy here, but I wouldn't be upset to see it. Because you win That's this cool. bonus, you put yourself yeah. right back into this game. You're looking at not just six, but probably seven. But instead, it's just going to be an outlaw perch with a couple of sheriffs. So from the offensive side, uh, not the weaponry, obviously, you want. That's easy to say. But I think this has got to be just good flood of utility. Just overwhelm something and press your luck. Just see if you can avoid maybe a couple of awkward long-range gunfights against these vandals. See if you can maybe overwhelm it flat out. Just flood through. See if you can catch that off guard. Riku there spamming through the Viper wall up mid. Doesn't find anything there. The Glazers opt not to take control of that part of the map, but still want to smoke it. And again, we saw Sad, of course, yeah. their sort of lower buy rounds get easily pulled around the map here, but this time they're much more reluctant to play off the A site. Stack three on towards B here. It's going to be up to the Glazers to pull a thread and undo the sweater. Yeah. And another good moment there from Darkest, by the way, just toggling between the Toxic screen and the Snake, snake Bite. It forces the Glazers to have to re-clear B main again. That takes a lot of time. And now they're forced to have to play through mid into market where there's a double stack here. I mean, if they commit to this, I uh, wish they're probably going to have to. 
I, I mean, they are, they have no information at A. This is completely blind, and the trade through mid, again, kind of creates more issues here for the Glazers. Zoe, though, right position. The off angle catches Zachary the TP across, but do they think that Skarn is going to be left there? Swing off this. The flash didn't connect, but it doesn't matter. Skarn's bullets absolutely did. Now again, over towards A, as Ange has gotten deep here. Koberg opted to give it up, but still has that Cypher util in the site itself. Yeah. And this will likely lead to a plant, but pers I mean, you have to get a couple if you're Ange on this rotation over. Left. Flat out. I mean, he's going to have to get two just to make it even somewhat manageable for Precision, who's just hanging out with a Sheriff in low HP. So this is all about Ange catching the rotation with a Bulldog. And the Neural oh. Theft will scout it. Yeah, you don't see a world where Sad dropped this round, unfortunately, I don't think. My bit of time, says Ange, and then try and play off of Precision here. Not committing to halls, though, and Sad oh. unaware of this. Ange buying a bit of time with those consecutive snake bites here. They have slowed up Sad. They have to go pretty quickly. Such a small thing, this Viper Util, but it might end up being the difference maker now. Time pressure starting to mount on Sad. Yes, big player in weapon advantage. The clock's against them, though. Skarn can't, can't quite get the standing. defuse. Precision's going to be there. It's going to be Bob fighting one, though. And Ange, the span through the smoke is good. Where's the defuse at? Not no halfway. chance for Sad to make it happen. <laughs> and those scant seconds bought by the Viper really pay off. Yeah, I'll eat my shoe on that one. <laughs> that was really well played by Ange. I mean, I think a lot of people would have saved that second snake bite just for when you hear the spike get diffused, but it's the right call to use that to delay the retake attempt even further because the prowler that gets re-earned up can check over through the front side at A. Yeah, so I'll eat my shoe on that one. That was very well played for the 2v4 and actually just using the defensive smokes brilliantly as well on top of the little micro repositions that came through. And so now we've got ourselves a game, Mitch. 6-9 the call, but just Sheriffs and Stingers here for the defense. The Glazers have a chance to really build up a bank. Like that from Coburg. Doesn't find the camera, unfortunately, but takes the opportunity to scale in to be main briefly behind that cyber cage. Got to be present out. here right now for the defenders. The Glazers have brought it back three consecutive rounds, there. putting sad. A half by flash to me. That's beautiful. They're able to capitalize oh. stunningly. Finding two. Precision has to try and right this ship before it capsizes, but a player Ring deficit here. The Glazers egg on their face after that one. Yeah, big time. And look at the space being pushed forward through. Sad's going to get these weapons. Oh, and yes, they may catch please. another off guard. Oh, no. It's a disaster. And again, that's the word we use proactivity. Sad Esports, this entire series have been the team taking the first step, finding these timings just by staying aggressive. And now Zach has to re clear all of this and he gives it a go. But wow, that's so frustrating if you're a fan of the Glazers. 30 seconds left. Another weapon dropped here. The Glazers by no means in the clear economically. Double face here should come from Skarn and Coburg. Now yeah, they'll have this one in the bag. Beautiful flash to mid and just good old fashioned pistol work to whittle the Glazers down to three. Oh, just when you, you start- that happen. I mean, you, just, you can't. You, you can't get Sheriff down mid. You just can't. <laughs> You're absolutely right. It's just another one of those moments where it's just like, you start to see the sunrise coming through and then all of a sudden, nope, just kidding. Like, ah. That's so frustrating for the Glazers. Saying, bro, flashes are good. They're really flashes good. Really, <laughs> really good on this map too, just for what it's worth. God, oh, that was ugly. All right, the Glazers at least can sort of afford some kind of buy here. But sad, of course, uh, once more armed to the teeth. Ready to throw that down now. Showstopper just around the corner for Skarn. Obviously, Zachary, crucially, there. has a neural theft to lean on there. here. Maybe play off this nightfall on a side hit. Sure. I mean, there's plenty of options here. It just comes down to what is the game plan going to call for here for the Glazers? Because like we continued to mention, that last round was the only round that we've really seen them have any sort of an eco advantage throughout this entire series, except for post pistol rounds that they win. So now you're in a must win situation. And that is a lot of value for a very little charge. Just one snake bite from Darkest completely holds off this elbow push and forces the nightfall early. And look how slow it is. I mean, they're not going to be able to confirm too much. Showstopper behind this may get what they want, though. And yeah, it does. Well committed from Drone. That was lovely. Great stuff. I love the Glazers. They think at one point across the Molly. I don't know if they've been getting coached by Tappy. Because that's something M80 do very frequently. Try and throw timings off for their opposition. 
Post plant now. You've got four rifles in the game. Well, that nightfall come out a little bit early now. Paranoia went in towards spawn. This will slow sat, sat up a little bit more. Cypher can remove, so some confirmation of the player on the corner. The timing on the swing from Zoe is immaculate. Down to five bullets though, and that smoke's about to dissipate. Beautiful involvement here from all of the glazers. Navigate that post plant yep. expertly. Yeah, I love the fact that they just try to hold this from inside the site. Again, because they lack the ability to reinitiate. So if you play that too deep off the site for your post plant, it's going to be hard to get back on. So good commitment there from the Glazers. Enough delay for sure. But I think a lot of that is, again, the decision making from Drone to push through further from the Nightfall, which really doesn't do too much besides just push the defenders off. But the follow up the, with the showstopper, the that's the space they needed. It gives them more dominant control to the backside of the A site. They keep their post plant attention largely towards the front. Good isolation, good follow up. And now good tempo, but Skarn gets two. What looked to be a good exchange for the Glazers ends up an even exchange. Bob was able at least to recover a rifle there from what went down to Newton. I don't know if the Glazers have tracked an extra player from the defenders in that part of the map. Zachary has to back up here. He saw a player deep here in bid lobby, and this again will slow, but Zachary can skirt the edges of that snake bite. Anything to buy time for Queen Bob to bring the cavalry. Oh, and he may catch perfect timing here, too. I mean, she's, I mean she knows there's a trip Yeah, anyway. but the thing is, you delete that, and it does either force the glitch to have to move quickly or back off. The flash to follow. The glitches have made the right read, but they're worried about the flank. And so now they're rotating into mid-map, where oh, guess right. who's here? Bob is already at the ready. Cross the Oh, pull into pieces, the glazes. Just as they get their head above water, another wave comes crashing down. And they overthink it. That's unreal, dude. I, I mean, it's just, it's one of those things, like, I can understand the thought process, right? Like, the Glazers are like, uh-oh, we got someone on our flank. We have to commit. And instead of trying to plant where you don't really have a post plant set up, they try to get into market to give themselves some ground to work with for the eventual post plant. But Bob just gigabrains them. Oh, another heartbreak for the Glazers, which looked to be a pretty decent round, but they changed through the front side of the map, but not to be. And now you're down to Sheriffs and a Vandal have to hit shots. That's about as simple as the analysis gets here. Yeah. Is that just buy up that Vandal? Chad. Okay. <laughs> Three up in the mid here for the Glazers. They are very deep and very based here. And really just to try and throw some catnip in the direction of Sad. It works for a time, but for how long? Market gets smoked off. That's going to give Darkest the buffer to drop the door and get away. And now all the attention is towards top mid. Bob's going to get the drop on this and drone instantly crumples. Unreal. Make it three. Scarn getting involved there and the Glazers are in trouble. Zachary yeah. with that rifle by now is going to be feeling a little silly. I mean, you got you to gotta save this, right? Surely. In theory. You, you have to. Well, I mean... One of those, it's like, I don't know. I don't know what you say. This has been polished from Sad, though, flat out. A couple of moments here and there, the Glazers have showed the individual strength of this roster, I think, in particular. Zach's 4K from a couple rounds previously, that was impressive. A couple of individual moments from Drone as well, but outside of the individuals kind of bailing out a couple of the rounds and the pistols, this series has been dominated by Sad. And now you're on force buys the rest of the way through the Glazers. You're close to a Viper's Pit. Like, that may be your biggest window here, but there's already one at the ready for Sad plus a Showstopper. Uh, they have a lot of tools, and Zoe's pulling out a Judge on an off angle inside elbow. Hit. This has not been hit once yet. Oh, this could get nasty. They're going to deny the post plant Viper's Pit by playing close here. I like the Haunt, though. It's going to give you a lot of info. Oh, okay. Drone, man. So clean with it. Showstopper. Finds no purchase either. Follow it up with a prowler just to confirm that Skarn is indeed still waiting by the entrance to Elbow. Well, there's opportunities here for the Glazers. I think mostly off of what does Zach feel like he could get away with? Because there's options towards deep mid or towards market. They try to put a little bit more pressure over towards the Vipers. But the contact from the front kind of forces the hand that this has to be an A hit. Up there receives the Prowler. She's going to get overwhelmed here. No two. Ah, oh, it's about it's okay. Well, going two for one. Not too shabby. But Zachary was waiting in mid with that Spectre. Playing in its optimal range. 
and playing from behind the Viper's wall just in case it came back up. That's dirty. All down to Coburg, trying to end the game here. Yeah, really good play from Zach. This through mid, again, just isolates that the rotation from Darkest can't come through. At least not safely. Forces a nice little 1v1. Works out beautifully for the Glazers. 1v2, Coburg still at full HP and full armor. Planted. But not a lot else remaining. And the Viper's head also has to be cleared. Unless he gets blessed with some more spam, I don't see it coming through. And yeah, that's all Zach again. So well played through mid-map. Glazers stay alive. Yeah, again, you know, Zachary there really... Giga brains a situation, but that's something that Sad had tried a couple oh, of times, right? Nice Put Coburg right up at the top of mid, behind the Viper wall, and leave him there. You don't even really need to activate him until the, the defenders rather try and make use of that part of the map for rotation purposes from B across. I like that a lot here yep. from the Glazers. They're in it still. And I, 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 I kind of want to see them gonna continue to put a little bit of that extra pressure towards mid, force Sad Esports to have to worry about that on rotation, but... Again, it's one of those things when you don't have the flash available, it, it's just, you feel like you have to commit extra numbers. Gonna hit this, oh, what a cool flash. Oh right over the top of the wall. Different look this time for Sad, works out nicely, but the battle back from Ange nearly trades it back to even numbers. We're still at a 3v2 favoring Sad Esports. Exactly this is gonna get revealed, but Darkus will slow things up. This buys time for Coburg, who will get lit crossing the map. So instead uses their position as an opportunity to shut the door. But again, this mid-map lurk isolates the defense in a way that they will not have a chance to play this in a true on 3v2. I mean, they have to deal with the trap wire, do sad esports over towards A. And as soon as that happens, that should be enough for the Glazers to make a call saying, okay, they're deep over towards A. We can just oh, rotate around the back. The and they're going to get a 2v2 here. That is brilliant. And Zoe knows that he can hedge his bets because he does have ultimate up. Yeah, yeah. So could go and join over on the B side here either way. Smoke on elbow. That is where Sad is set up. There's a gap. It's not being checked here. Riku doesn't have the angle to see through it. Coburg is slowly going to run into Zachary here. Yeah, an advantage Zach with the spy cam up as well. Doesn't quite get the tag though, but the hookup point still comes through. Plus the information from Riku. Winnable 2v2. Just comes down to hitting your shots. First one comes through. Now to the 1v1, Mitch. I don't think he knows just how close Darkness is. Okay, there's a tap. Zachary just a little too good again. Round after round, tooth and claw, keeping the Glazers in it. And we've seen this, not only in this series, but in multiple of them in the past. Huge moment for the Sentinel player. And I just, I love the mid-map lurk. It's worked out so nicely. Every single time from Zach in particular, both sides of the spike, he's dominated mid. And initially when Skarn gets the opening double, front side at A, you start to worry a little bit. But again, it's one of the quick calls from Zach of, hey, if they're gonna stack the box at A main, I'm going to get aggressive through mid. And now look at the defensive pings. Oh, this is an adjustment from Sad Esports saying, we're not going to let anyone lurk through mid this time. We're going to overcommit and trust that our lurkers kind of playing the exteriors of the map can hold off any full floods to where we can use mid map control to rotate quickly to whatever site this Glazer team tries to hit on. No one in tiles here from the Glazers. They are expecting something like this, though. This lean into the middle part of the map. How much time can Coburg buy with just a stinger? Double one-way set up here. Double trips removed by the paint shells. Oh, man. And go figure the first time that we see Sad Esports play aggressive through made it works out perfectly. But from the shadows with the spike in hand, means that drone just has to try to do what he can by himself. Yeah. Everything else goes towards A. They're gonna get a post plant here, Mitch. It's still winnable for a 3v5, but and just not expect Zoe to be that close. And now things become more difficult. Coburg got a weapon upgrade there over to a Vandal. And Zoe, of course. Okay, Zachary out of sight there, but Zoe not going to stick it. Another great little pick and a fallback from Zachary. We've seen this multiple, multiple times. But now he's going to make it happen in a two versus four. Here comes the paranoia. That hits him squarely. Riku now has to make the swing on their own. Zachary couldn't help them. And Sad Esports able to split the defenders up and finally put an end to the Glazers. The latter who now goes zero and four in this group B. Defenders Sad win. showing us it's far from a glitch when they take these big results. Great win. And what a call on that final round. You play individual defenders forward on both A and B and you three man stack mid. And wouldn't you know it, it's not just the stack at mid. 
I don't know if they get any information on the hit towards B main or not from the setup from the cipher, but regardless, the flank around the back goes completely unguarded, completely unexpected. And go figure, that's the way they ran it, went out of the map that it looked like for a moment, the Glazers were starting to feel out. Like, hey, we're starting to find a lot of success here with these lurks through mid. So let's just try to pull the defense to focus out towards the outsides of these sites. Let Zach get into mid map. And then we could deal the damage from there on these kind of more limited rounds where we've got, you know, 3v2s, you know, 3v3s, small number situations. But now Sad Esports, too clean with it and the decision making that comes through from, again, a group of people that on paper, you know, if you've been following Valorant for a long time, you would never have expected that these names, these rosters would have matched up near the bottom of the leaderboard. But I'll tell you, this Sad Esports team is looking real clean through this series. So much of the fighting came down to like that action over an A elbow on both sides of the map here. And again, these little variations happening, uh, especially from Sad. Like there's a round where like Skarn takes a judge here into elbow on defense, right? It does get spotted by drone, but you can see what the idea is. This like aggressive playing towards the lobby by the defenders. Bob just, I mean, she has another fantastic map. Yeah, She's very, yeah. very hard to sort of keep track of. I've got to say, Zachary, again, continues to be a standout player on this team. Guy has history in eSports, right? You and yep. I know it well. Yep. Uh, and that's that veteran head and incredible game sense has really helped him when it comes to all those clutch scenarios. He's, he's a safe pair of hands to give that Sentinel role too. But elsewhere, Sad just really leaning with their firepower into this Glazer's roster. Yeah. It, it, it comes from, you know, again, the consistency we keep getting from Bob, right? I mean, and it, the thing is, it, it's not even one of those situations that Bob is doing it in heroic form. It's just them playing their role perfectly, following up off their own utility, getting deep into space, finding good lurk timings. A lot of the proactivity from Sad was really unmatched, uncountered. You know, on the other side of things for the Glazers, it just kind of seemed like they were a bit unprepared. I, I mean, even in particular on their own map pick, but here, at least they started to make adjustments, right? Like we started to see small glimmers of hope towards the backside of this map. It just came a little bit too late. I, I mean, the, the first blood to tell the story uh, as well. On top of that, it was 13-8 in the first map, 13-9 here matches the scoreboard perfectly. So there's early contacts that are really struggling to get the Glazers off the ground. And I think that's something that they need to kind of work on and focus on with only one more match to play, which will likely determine whether they get relegated or whether they make playoffs because they're going to have a head-to-head -head matchup versus Winthrop, who will also very likely be stuck having to win out to make playoffs. Oof, Dryad. I mean, here it is. I, I burnt the pasture on this bread. I'm not going to lie. I really <laughs> believed in the Glazers, but maybe I just believed Wait, in you Zachary. You know what I mean? I oh, look, they're, they're good. They were... I... Listen, when you make a pred on a team mm. that just lost to the top team in their group. And you're like, oh yeah, it seems like there might be something here. You kind of forget that, you know, M80 is great, but there are a lot of other very quality teams here. And I'm not gonna <laughs> lie. Again, I just on the protocols and on the macro play, Sad are just, that is a, quite a bit better than the Glazers. Yeah. Oh, I'll eat my shoe on that one, I think, is what <laughs> said. Your, your prediction got a little silly, but it's Bruh. okay. It, it, it happens to all of us. It's fine. It is, it, it is sad who take the win here in, in a way that I wanted to say towards the end. It got a little bit more difficult to close it out for sure when it was at the 9 to 3 half. But one thing that really caught my attention about this team of sad it was that throughout this series you do really always see them playing their own game and that is something that i really respect even on the eco rounds even in the rounds where they only had classics to work with you see them having a strategy playing aggressive going going for an aggression on the defense trying this uh, very set ideas that whether they work or not they always did some damage mm. and it's something that i feel like we're missing sometimes from these challengers team shift i, I feel like i love seeing it and that is uh, at the end continuing to play your own game the reason why they were able to close it out yeah like un this. unmatched proactivity i think is the biggest thing about it i mean there were limited options i think first and foremost for the glazers because you just don't have the same kind of tools, but you don't have things like a sky. You don't have the ability to flash off angles. You don't have the ability to check close angles outside of a prowler. You're hoping the haunt hits. Like there's a lot of just throwing and hoping, and there's not a lot of depth in terms of the utility. So if you're the Glazers, you, I feel like you just had to make a decision and commit to it in terms of what are we gonna get out of this utility? It has to find value, has to find efficacy. And they did start to figure it out. First half defensively, they started to play a little bit more forward towards A main. It pushed off the sad esports initial hits, but then that opens up something else same thing can be said when they're on the offensive side 
getting a little bit of space towards mid that started to open up some space but then as soon as sad to get the read they hit it back and there's just not enough available for the glazers to recommit to reclaiming that space so it just felt like there's a bit of a difference in the compositional value i think in terms of the utility efficacy from start to finish and you see it across the, this map, right? It's very interesting over here. When, when you see the way that Sad was playing this, the, the ideas that they had to run around this composition, and, and I know you guys were talking about it, that kind of the difference between the two compositions, how proactive you had to be and how proactive and aggressive Sad was being. It is uh, so far one of the most aggressive teams that we have in Challengers, maybe the most with the other crazy compositions that they like to play sometimes on Icebox with the Reyna and Jet or an Ascent uh, with the with the Gecko and the Yoru. We, we've seen a lot from them but it's a good position for them they find themselves at a 2-2 spot depending a lot to end up positive on that last week but uh what i really think that we need to talk about as well is now a zero and four for the glazers yeah i mean it's obviously not where you want to be and i think you know shift alluded to it now it puts them in you know winthrop in a potential similar situation right I will say the Glazers has had to, you know, play all the, the top teams in this group up until this point. Yep. The potential, though, of them to sort of find that elusive last win is starting to slip away. This is a game where, I mean, God, if you're not going to get it against that, then your best bet is, you know, trying to have a better map differ a round differential the Winthrop and also beating them, which is by no means a sure thing because the Glazers dropped to like, oh, 45 minus 45 round differential here so obviously you need to yeah. win the head-to-head -head in tiebreaker against Winthrop and you have to hope they don't win any other game so you're asking for a whole lot here this team might be destined for uh, relegations at this rate well the good news is for the Glazers is that Winthrop has to play M80 next so <laughs> you know very likely it will be a head-to-head -head battle of who gets relegated and who, yeah, who moves right. on so <laughs> there is that at least there's a couple things to look forward to and in a couple situations that are difficult for the Glazers, but at least trying to make it with maps or with that last win. Though it is sad who take the win today. They find themselves 2-2. We're going to throw to a quick break for the series highlights. And when we come back, we have an interview with one of the sad players. They say in life, there are no guarantees. Hmm. They say a lot of stuff like that. Slow it down. Play it safe. Head your bet. Listen to that. You're gonna stop because they can't guarantee you'll pull this off. No guarantee you'll win. No guarantee everything's gonna be fine. your own guarantees nobody else will light your way 
Start your own fire and keep it burning. And we guarantee you'll have one hell of a lifetime. Welcome back, everyone. We just saw a 2-0 take place by Sad against the Glazers, and I'm here with Darkest to talk a little bit about this win and the, the whole process that has been for the team to find themselves now in a 2-2. Darkest, uh, this is a big win. You, you definitely need those wins. Uh, you had a, a good start in the week one, then things got a little bit more difficult, but you're back, and that's what really matters. And my first question for you is, uh, when you were going today against the Glazers, the Glazers are a team that have come up with really close maps against some of the tougher opponents like like TSM like Turtle Troop was that ever a point of concern or do you think you had that read on them that the other teams didn't um getting into the match honestly we we didn't I felt like our previous matches we really tried to understand how they were gonna play but against the Glazers we were we just wanted to run our own game we we were tired of trying to like understand how they wanted to play and we're just like we're gonna steamroll them we're gonna do our thing and it showed yeah, it is really good. I love that you mentioned that you were playing your own game because I was saying it it really did show, right? In the eco rounds, you were playing your, your own game. You were having your set ideas to implement and a lot of those were finding success. Now, I want to ask you, speaking of playing your own game, you are one of those teams that are that is very creative. Today, we did see those standard compositions on, on the map of Split and Sunset, but maps like Ascent and maps like Icebox, you do bring something new. What is the balance between finding the, those maps where it can be a little bit more more creative and those maps where you might want to play that standard um for ascent we we kind of felt like we were getting tired of the stale old meta comp that everyone runs so uh we we found something that worked for our entire team the players the roles and um we we try to make it work and so far it hasn't but hopefully next time it will it, it, it does have some some cool implementations of it, right? But I think part of it is what we've seen you specifically played. You played Arena, Viper, KO, and Breach. I believe are all the agents that you've played so far in Challengers. So a, a good amount of variety there with a, a couple of different roles. Do you think that flexibility that everybody has in the team is what is enabling you to, to bring these different ideas? Yeah, for sure. I think uh, all of my teammates are really flexible. I feel like everyone is putting the time and effort to try and understand the agent they're being put on um, so that we can actually come together and make these creative comps without having concerns of someone feeling uncomfortable. All right, and my last question for you is, as we said before, you have a 2-2 score right now for, for the Series 1 uh, or the, that you've been able to win. So my last question is, the last match for Week 5 is going to be against TSM. How do you feel about TSM? Honestly, really excited. Uh, I know most of the players on the roster, and I'm really confident in my team still. I feel like we're back in our groove, and we, we got a better understanding of how we want to play the game. So I'm really excited for the match already. We're going to see how that one's going to turn out. Congratulations, Darkest, once again on this win. It's a 2 0 once again for Sad. And we move on to the next match, which is, which is going to be a very interesting one. It's going to be Turtle Troop and TSM after this break.
Welcome back, everyone. It is, it, it is time for a very exciting match. It is Turtle Troop against TSM, two teams that everybody's putting very, very close to each other. But today, Uber, we define who is really going to be the one coming up on top. Yeah, I mean, TSM started challenges pretty averagely, uh, I want to say. They yeah. really didn't sort of excite us all that much, but their development over the last couple of weeks has definitely caught a lot of people's attention. This is a team that you know, are in a position to, to be a real contender as we go through the season. And Turtle Trooper, I feel like a known quantity to us. They're like a mainstay in challenges. They have honestly had some ups and downs, but are still very much in contention for at least that sort of, you know, coveted second spot uh, in challenges here. Ada, B-Dog, Corey, Stella, Weedy. I mean, these players need zero interruptions. And these guys cook up some spicy comps on quite a few mm -hmm. of these maps. And also, Corey going up against, you know, his old org here. So... I'm uh, sure something to prove there for him too. I really, really like these two teams. I think individually, every single player has had their moment so far from the week one to the week three that we had. And now into this week four, it is that time for them to face each other and shift. The one matchup that I'm the most excited about, honestly, it has to be Corey against Sim. This is this is like my second against Demon One. <laughs> no, that's a fair comparison to, <laughs> to certain regards, for sure. It's my and, Roman Empire. <laughs> I think the thing that's exactly the thing that's kind of crazy about that individual head to head is that there have been a lot of times, I think, in those players' previous histories on different teams where they have been looked at as like, "Hey, bro, like you gotta carry us a little bit." Like there has been that level of it the thing is this has probably been the best supporting cast that both those two individual players have now played with but it just comes in very different form because like uber was talking about with tsm yeah a little bit of a slow and very unappealing start versus m80 but afterwards pretty polished i mean a couple of tests here and there versus the glazers and winthrop but closing it out and making the right adjustments to make sure they can close it out in 2 form we're on the other side turtle troop are playing around with a little bit more flexibility and a little bit more career creativity but they haven't really gone up against the quote-unquote big dogs in this group yet they haven't really played anyone like m80 for instance and obviously tsm so you know in terms of kind of establishing a halfway bottom half top half of the group still a lot of battle to be done here for total troop and it does leave a bit of caution and maybe a raised eyebrow that they have not been clean till this point considering the opponents that they've already squared up against out of all of the matches this week, this is the one that I just didn't know where to put my prediction. Me too. Because it, it was, again, it was a, the the slow TSM start against M80. Everybody was like, oh, TSM, overrated. They're not going to do good at all. But then they start really coming up back. And then it was an M80 matchup. It, it was a difficult one to start off. But then you see them against the Glaciers looking good. Then you see them against Winthrop. And now it seems like this is kind of... Uh, they went to the hardest team, to the mm, the teams that have struggled the most, to not say anything else. And then you have kind of the mid table where they're gonna face Turtle Troop today. So Uber, I, I feel like this can go anyway. No, I can. I think like the Preds are particularly hard to make here. I think like the map pool is gonna be really telling here because there are a couple of maps that I, I specifically want to see these two teams play on. You know, like we've seen the Lotus a lot from uh, TSM, for example. They played it in their first match against M80. Uh, pretty chaotic and not what we were looking for from them there. So this would be a great chance to gauge their improvement on a map that they are quite frequently trying to to go to when they can. I Look, if, if I can follow the trajectory of, of TSM, I think that they will win out in this kind of game if their improvement uh, is anything to sort of go by. But you make a great point. They go from M80 to some teams that have struggled to find some results here. And it can be really hard still to take a temperature of this roster. But it's star-studded. And, you know, Sim has really come into his own as well. Yeah. That's a play that I think everyone's getting really excited about. I mean, you talked about Corey versus Sim in a matchup. Like, you know, Corey sometimes is playing like the Neon on a few different maps, right? His role maybe not always the same, but... Oh, here it is. I mean, these two players, there's a reason why they headline this matchup, but Sim's getting a lot of that well-earned respect over the last couple of weeks. He's so good. When it came to the operator kills for last week and, and even continuing this week, there's nobody that actually comes close to him. And, and there's kind of a gap. It's Sim and then everybody else. Sim is just the, the place that really matches this team, the place that really matches TSM in a very unique way, in, in a way of their own. When I got the chance to talk to Seven, for example, uh, in after they took the win against Winthrop, one of the things he was saying is uh, that they have a very aggressive play style shift. And I remember mm -hmm. we talked about this. We talked about how the pieces individually with the roles that they've played in the past, a lot of controller, a lot of Sentinel, you think that they're going to be a little bit slower, but no, they consider themselves one of the fastest teams, even with Sim constantly holding this 
operator. Yeah, I think the thing that this TSM team has showed us is that whatever the design is from the get-go in five versus five Valorant, they're going to commit to it. And it likely will, like you mentioned, be pretty heavy-handed with Sim usually being the guy to jump into the action first. He's played a lot of rays, and he's usually double blast packing in behind flashes. Now, the problem for TSM has been when that plan either goes a bit awry or it's not as clean as you would like, their mid-rounding has struggled, mostly because the pieces start to fall apart a little bit in terms of what do we have, what can we use, and how are we going to use it? That kind of led us towards some of the sloppier series that we saw versus like the Glazers, for instance, that they did kind of figure things out and finally get over the hurdle, but it came at a much more elongated scoreline. So I think it's one of those things for TSM is, hey, great opening playbook, but how do we make that second and third layer occur, especially from the offensive lens, when they don't necessarily come out and go two for nothing or they go two for one and they're kind of in a 3v3, 2v2 scenario, that mid-rounding has been kind of the issue for TSM and it hasn't been nearly as clean as teams like M80 and, and Moist and, and Oxygen, like we've kind of put the staple and kind of set the bar at. This team reminds me a little bit of 100 Thieves in Champions last year, actually. So they're a team that have like really well drilled protocols in the early round, but if they don't work, their ability to adapt in the mid round yeah. is really average. They play really slow and really unsure of themselves. So like these are the kind of games where you sort of pick that up. And if you remember, 100 Thieves never really got that figured out over the entirety of Champions. Mm -hmm. uh, like that was like one of their biggest criticisms of that team is that the playbook's there, but there's no ability to sort of go off script when you have to. This is such a good opportunity, I think, to start developing some of those adaptations. And it's got a huge amount to do with chemistry on this roster. So if TSM are going to be a dominant force in this group, that has to be in place. And when you look at the other side, you mentioned 100 Thieves. There's Stellar, right? A player that has been actually performing pretty well for this type of charter troop. So you, you have those two teams that I feel like need to find themselves. Are, they, are you going to be, as Shift, you, you've been mentioning, are you going to be that, that second place team? Or are you going to be the team that is struggling the most? That's why this match matters so, so much. Before, we had one week left. And, and this can really guarantee how everything is going to end up looking for the group at the end. But let's jump into the map select. Let's see where we're going to be headed as uber you were saying this maps can mean so so much between total troop of ntsm today and immediately it's very interesting sunset lotus and bind to close this out i mean this is super interesting these two teams honestly like they have a pretty similar map pool the fact that tsm are picking lotus which is statistically in challenges turtle troops best map it favors them pretty well uh, the Sunset choice by, you know, Turtle Troop is interesting, right? Because it is a map they want to go to. They play the Deadlock, they play the Fade, and the Jet combo on this map with the Brimstone, right? Mm -hmm. it's, got, it's probably we did influence, I think. But um, <laughs> this, yeah, they've not won on this map yet. And in fact, again, sad, they got absolutely thrashed on Sunset. So I like it. That for me is extremely interesting. I think that's the kind of map that like we need to be looking at that definitely sets the tone for this series. Because in challenges, TSM haven't really played it yet, right? They've been mostly like a Breeze Lotus team. And that's why like Turtle Troop just get rid of that Breeze straight away. They don't want to deal with it. So this is what I wanted. I, we get the two maps where we get two spicy comps from Turtle Troop. Um, again, one is like the the uh, the Neon comp. The other one is the Deadlock setup yep. here. So I think I think Roy talked about this actually a little bit on Spike Drop earlier. They do like use the Deadlock a little bit like the Sage that we saw. I think Core played Sage uh, yep. on Sunset yep. as well. Yep. The walls also being very effective. There's also some boosts you obviously can't do with Deadlock, but the, the function obviously to make those retakes much harder after defenders give up sites is going to be pretty important. The crazy thing about it was I, I, I've casted a, the, at least the first game when True played Winthrop and I, we, they came out with this deadlock comp and I was like, wow, they had like a great offensive half. And I was like, this comp only gets better on defense. Surely they didn't really play all that well on defense. Fast forward the next week, they played a great defense. And I was like, wow, this is so much fun to watch. This is what this comp's supposed to do. And then they have a miserable offense. So like, this has got a feel for Troop. Like, all right, time to put both the pieces of the puzzle together because we've seen success from their very likely agent composition on both sides. It just came a week apart and not at the same time. So yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right in calling it. I think the deadlock play does lead to a lot of really interesting kind of more reactionary setups, especially from the defensive side. But we saw it find a lot of success versus sad 
then all of a sudden on offense they couldn't find anything to work with because the deadlock was just really not getting the utility in places to ever get post plants so that's the struggle is can you get the spike down offensively and then use the power of the deadlock to really lock things in so that that's where my curiosity point is for troop here because i think you're right the the map number two is going to feel really great for them as well considering it is their one of their most played maps that's such a classic though on Sunset. Sometimes you do really well on attack. Sometimes you do really well on defense. You, you never know what you're gonna get from teams <laughs> each day. It's it's so curious, even with this deadlock. I remember last week, Wyatt was not the biggest fan of the deadlock for a valid reason, right? Because the, the deadlock utility still forces you to, to play for contact. You, you cannot just is put it like a sage wall and leave it like it's nothing yeah. or a trap wire from cypher you still need to be watching those angles so it, it puts more pressure into those players to be aware of one or two angles that they're going to be watching there's going to be that b side and, and, and market or something like that so there's a couple things to take into account but also something that turtle troop said is that they've been winning with this composition when they're playing scrims when they're playing officials so i mean there's no reason why not to run it right now we get to jump into agent select we see if things are gonna look the same i am expecting them to look the same for this side of charter troop on this sunset we actually have not seen tsm play just yet hey. so okay things are different things are actually not what we expected i was saying they they said they were looking good with a deadlock confident and guess what they changed the composition a little bit of a surprise here but it's now that we get this map one started uber and shift down to you Ah, thank you. A double initiated yeah. here. Gecko makes his return to Sunset. And obviously, Gecko can offer a lot of power with the ability to so easily recover that util. But I mean, this is interesting. This is a big mix up. I mean, there's no jet, there's no fade, there's no deadlock. There's I'm no... not disappointed necessarily. I think this is also a very interesting setup here, but a big a big departure from what we've seen so far from turtle troop and the bigger agent that's missing in my mind is there's no viper no viper so yeah. this is all about i mean for troop it has to be kind of like we were talking about a little bit uh with the glazers it whatever it is it has to be pretty heavy-handed you just don't have the ability to kind of separate the site especially from the offensive side and then defensively lots of pressure towards adder to be kind of a lockdown agent which to be fair He's kind of answered that call a couple times previously, so I wouldn't be surprised to see that kind of be the mentality around this, but the no Viper situation would lead you to believe that this is going to be a lot of just flash and dash kind of styles for this opening half for Troop. Soprano spotted early. Ooh, I fear that man with a pistol, that's for sure. Turtle Troop here at least get themselves that orb secured. Very much the opposite kind of composition than what we saw from the Glazers, which had only the Paranoia. You have many flashes to work with here as Turtle Tree. Yes. I think Corey took some spam there through that smoke over at B main. And I think the other important part about the Gecko is, you know, when we talked about not having flashes available for teams like Glazers on this map, hey, you can just get the wingman to drop the spike in for you. You just need to put some smokes down, throw a knife, throw a flash out, and then just commit the wingman to try to jump on for the plant. You don't have to worry about necessarily cleaning out every single angle because, well, you can just trust that wingman will be a 65 for you. So there's the smokes, there's the knives, paranoia comes across, and then wingman gets to work. Corey just decayed from that poison orb. Wasn't actually damaged, but he's back in the fight now. Here comes the side hit from behind. Oh, that flash util. That all gets avoided by TSM who play off the side, but then it's kind of having just contact remaining. through smokes. Gimon able to hold his ground there and add a looking sharp. Mouse 7 is caught between rock and a hard place. Nowhere to go. Topping we did at the very least, but that'll be total troop with the pistol. And that's the power of Gecko right there. Again, you just smoke off the tight corners. You throw a one paranoia through the angle that you're most worried about. And then as the wingman starts to get the move, then you throw the dizzy out. You move forward into that space. You take it away and you force the engagement at your terms. So really good awareness in terms of how you're going to expect to see this offense kind of develop for Turtle Troop and for TSM. Their thing about this is you can't get baited into like, oh, they threw one flash and they're committing. We have to throw our counter utility. You have to start getting on read on what is the actual green light for these offenses because you don't want to get caught throwing too much of your defensive utility early. This round, a couple of the sheriffs do get purchased up here for TSM, but first blood cleanly tallied by Corey's off to a heater to start. That TSM gambled on B. Didn't pay off there as their only A player has already been brought down, but Seven has been able to wend his way in towards the A site. And Corey's just holding... Waiting for contact. Great spot here for Weeded. Spots Gimon here, but the shoulder peak gets the better of him. Yeah, this is just seven in the spy cam right here. And a classic. 
One of those good luck, have fun type moments. Bounce pass off the paint shells, clears a little bit close. Fragment deep, and this is the isolation we're talking about. Yep. Oh, the Dizzy actually kind of self aligns though. A little unfortunate there, but the trades still come out in favor of Troop. Proto, last one left. Full HP at the Sheriff. You never want to rule him out, but this would be a hero play and a half. Nice little pop there from Turtle Troop that establishes a setup inside elbow, and then they cut noise. Yep. Slow it down. Corey holds an angle waiting for contact, and then they go again once that util is online once yeah. more. This classic aggressive look from Turtle Troop, albeit with a different com. Yeah, it's looking scary. And it only gets more troublesome when the Thrash gets online, by the way. That's the other part about it is, you know, Gecko so quick to get the ultimate charge thanks to the pretty much free plants you always get, plus any kills behind it, which if you know B-Dog, you know he's going to slay. So expect to see Thrash out pretty often, I would say, if Turtle Trip can continue to find success in these opening approaches. And I'll be curious to see if TSM continue to throw this very passive Viper's Wall deep through backside mid, crossing over the middle of the B site, because realistically, it doesn't really give Proto much of a chance to contest on the site itself. It's more of a tactic of TSM can stack other parts of the map and just trust that Proto can stay alive. But if this continues to be wingman plant after wingman plant over towards B because Proto can't stay forward enough to contest it, they may have to make some separate moves to try to get that wall into a more aggressive position so they can actually get like market control or fight the front doors at B and not just give away plants for free. Do you actually fight on site if you're TSM against this? Like this <sighs> ridiculous amount of... Do you just have to play retake every round? I it's, it's it's a tall ask because of how much explosivity is still built into the post-plant setup for TTR. You've got things like the Mosh, the Fragment. The knife is usually charged up again by that point. So it, it's a tough call, but I, I do think they're going to have to commit one way or the other. Either you're going to commit to contest the spike never gets planted, or everyone has to stay alive and you have to commit for the 5v5 post-plant retake. I, I just think that the more you stay on site against the explosivity of a Cory and a B-Dog and a Stellar, uh, the, the worse for where you're likely going to be. Yeah, that's definitely something worth looking out for here. Even this year, I mean, this TSM squad, I think has only played Challengers games, right? So we just don't have a lot of data about their sunset showing so far here again like their composition it seems nothing particularly out of the ordinary yeah 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 you're right yeah turtle troop though getting at least an outlaw in the hands of Corey now as that tech pause is done probably has something to do with at his internet if i'd guess things all through the map but a lot of them are mid here from the defenders expecting some action there yeah and that's that quick little hit aggressive one-way smoke guiding light just to check and look at the quick call for tsm saying that's enough gamon can hold this he can just play the shoulder Stack the box elsewhere. Same wall down for TSM, though, off the defensive Viper's Pit. Trap wire placed in front of it, both at market and at B main. And, oh, Corey just kind of gets an angle through mid. Little pixel peak takes down Sim. I was going to say that could provide maybe an opportunity for TTR if they get deeper, but no need to. Now they can just hit this in a 5v4. Seven's the only player that's not a one-shot to that outlaw. I see a great time to bring that in here. And that's devastating. TSM already trying to... Get bored up here, but the bonus is proceeding well for the troop. Again, a lot of, yeah, smokes here to cover this out. I'm trying to stay embedded on the side, TSM. You see here being reluctant to back up towards Boba. And I think, yeah, we're going to see Poise probably push through that smoke as well. They are ready to try and anchor this. Yeah, and this hit, just keep note of it, because the utility that gets used, that's going to be the setup for literally every single round. Fragment well placed to flush out the backside corner. Thrash also spent. Again, it's just going to be earned up so darn quickly. We're three rounds in. It's already found its value. And Troop's going to have a 4v1 post plant. Gabon's got, I mean, the world to tackle right here. We did hold the angle. Doesn't win out. Again, Gimon gets the better of we did. Already seen that happen a couple times in these last few rounds. Better 10 HP. Gimon realizes that it's much better to hold onto this weapon as Thrash goes hunting. His stubby little legs won't quite take him to where Gimon is holding up. Yeah, and I imagine they probably just let him survive here, even though he's super low on HP. You don't want to give away any of the weapons that you've got off of this bonus, keep in mind, if you're troop. So they'll upgrade the outlaw to a Vandal and walk away with a commanding start. And just to kind of put a note in it, TSM did try to give that B-Man a bit of more of a different contest. It's a double stack in front of the Viper's Wall, right through that mid pillar on B to try to get someone on the cross. Problem was the poison cloud 
kind of deters them from being able to see too much. And then as soon as the hit comes through again, it's just all action. That troop is fine taking thanks to the isolation by ways of things like fragments, the flash points that can get spent. And then on top of that, thrash. You know, we'll just keep a mental counter of how many times it gets earned by B-Dog. One oh, through three rounds is already pretty par for the course yeah. that you'd assume, especially with how successful this offense has looked to this point. Just yet Careful. another tool to pave the way for yep. these fast hits from Turtle Troop. And there is so much. You saw, I think, I don't know who it was. It caught a proto, maybe it's caught in the shot. corner by Stella's Molly. I mean, Turtle Troop really have it nailed down. Their protocols for hitting this big site. And they're thinking about going for it once more. Spike left in spawn, though. Means they might want to spread their attention and get a bit more real estate here before making the commitment. Orb collected. Corey just holds the angle. There's no way they could peek it. So it's going to be a free orb almost every single round. So you put the free orb on top of the likely plant, on top of B Dog being pretty good at the game. This thrash is going to be up I, I, over under three and a half. I'm going over <laughs> on that one for B Dog. Seller trades pleasantries here. With Gimol. Got an double angle Whoa. face out! What is that? Are you kidding me? Bro, you were flashed! Bro, you can't see! Hello? That's the oh, day's disgusting! The only rifle brought into the round finds its mark. Now Corey walks headlong into the bullet from Sim. Sorry! That's not right! The double face flashed him! Yeah! Uh, that's just different. <laughs> I mean. You're absolutely right. He is completely hit by this flash. But a quick pop, maybe before the status hits, and then maybe a little bit of luck. I don't know. Ah, that's unreal. Bro, he's what different a, for that. That is, that is a save and a half. That is unreal. That I mean, if you're troop, you couldn't have done anything more perfect. That's just different. Unreal. My goodness. That's messed up. Anyway. Back to the action, Turtle Troop wasting no time and staking their claim to elbow here. Corey this time moves into it properly. Well, you may as well, I guess, when you got the showstopper ready. Yeah. TSM have opted for the retake. And little buddy. Oh, he oh, does get spam. revealed by the trap wire. So Blue Man gets taken down. Corey trying to back out and oh, well played by seven. Again, the passive setup this time for the trap wire works out perfectly. He's now on three. He knows Corey's nearby and likely tagged, but the sheriff will not find the final shot needed. And we go into a 5v2, and that's the contest that TSM is going to want to try to replicate each and every round if possible. Oh, Corey's out of there. No way. I mean, it goes from bad to worse awfully quick. First is Wingman getting caught out in the open. Spike left on the site. And then TSM come in and give them an absolute clapping. We have seen... Two different extremes over the course of these first five rounds. TSM bite back awful quick. And they're doing it cleanly as well. Mm, very much so. And that's something that if you're TSM, you try to bank on is that, hey, Seven has got the setup to try to deny the early execute, so to speak, from particularly B-Dog, but Troop as a whole. I mean, if the wingman gets taken by the trap wire, that is the win. That is already another defensive win condition for TSM can try to bank on is you don't get that spike planted. How does Troop get back to the spike, hold that ground and successfully get the plant off? Because this is all about hoping the wingman gets the successful plant. Not having the Viper means it's going to be very difficult for them to control the space comparatively to the success that TSM is going to be able to put together. So that's going to be maybe another focus here is can oh, TSM continue to make life difficult for wingman? Seven. What a sick round. Those trap wires giving him everything he needed to know. A rotating back over to the beast site now. And once again, we'll take a leisurely walk up A. This time, though, already being spotted by the bellboy. A bomb buddy sees Turtle Troop. Now the knife just to make sure no one's holding close on towards A immediately. Again, the limited weaponry here for TTR is going to make this a very difficult approach, but... Once more, you're in a situation to where if you just overwhelm with utility, it may not even make a difference what weapons you have because you can just get forward so quickly if you burst on towards sight. So lots of pressure here, not just on Proto to get a read, but more importantly, keep your eye on Sim. How does he want to try to approach this from the front side at A? Like that from Proto. Snake by going to slow things up. This lets Sim get in. That A-Link's being watched Talking pretty closely. Corey double satchels over Sim. You're paranoid, Ooh. bro. You're paranoid. He gets brought down by Corey, still went for it though, gotta love that. Come on inside a cyber cage here. Very low health out on the outside of it. Oh, he's so clean with it. He's so clean. Now 3v1 for Stella. 
All to do. Spike down at the very least. He's got two flashes to his name. And the fragment could delay a little longer. Wow, it's clean shots, but the stinger at that range doesn't quite get the job done. And wow, a, a weird little bounce off from Sim. He nearly gets behind the play on accident. <laughs> we did right in front of him, but and the flip side, it's another hero play from Gamad. Another quick transfer, another quick double. Eight and two. And what a start he's had, because that looked like it was going to be a troop execution that was going to lead to a very guaranteed, very safe play. But there's that little bounce from Sim. Not quite able to get all the way over the top. And then Guaman just steps up, finds the trade plus an extra. <laughs> you can't make Honestly that up. Sick. Honestly, sick from Sim. Uh, realizing he got blinded, so like trying to backtrack on that satchel. I don't know kind if that of, was kind of basic. I don't know if that was intentional. Uh, yeah, you know, you know what we have to do. Though. I, I give him the benefit of the doubt there. You know, it was good. But whatever it was, bro. You know what? Hard oh, yeah. to track. Monster True. Great distraction. Fantastic bait. There's our second thrash. Seven rounds in. Sim. Oh, uncharacteristic miss on the hard scope. And Corey's going to say, hey, brother. <laughs> yeah. How about that? I do like that, though. Like, I I do like seeing operator players try and contest those extremities here and receive contact. But Total Troop have the read. Oh, man. Dude. This trap wise from seven. Bro, he is seeing it all. Spike planted. It's just Bite such down there, paranoia. Yeah, it's such a guaranteed setup. Now the seekers from behind also kind of yeah. bottles them up Cold here, Mitch. I mean, there's no other troop can go, and Seven okay. continues to just reveal everything. Not even that. That cyber cage basically saves a proto's life there. I mean, I think a proto or whoever it was, maybe Kimon got paranoia there on the side. Just press up a cyber cage, protects him, and then finds a kill. Oh, this guy, man, he's electrifying right now. DSM <laughs> stacking him up. And at this point, troop. I think they're going to be mostly here on what would likely be a, a large majority of a save. Maybe a little bit of a half purchase for a couple. But after this round, Troop needs to reconsider their options back over towards B. Because this setup for this 7 is so well put together that it's just far enough away to avoid things like satchel charge push-throughs. And outside of the satchel charges, how else are you going to destroy the trap wires? Because Troop have to go so quickly, they don't have the luxury of putting down a smoke, trying to find the trap wire, deleting it, and then we go. They have to use We Did Smokes to right. control the site because they don't have the Viper. So they Homie, have to burst. I, Homie went off to Machu Picchu on a pilgrimage, took some ayahuasca and, and, and oh. came up with some new tripwire setups here. That is sick. Gimon is there at the right time and we did, did not Dead. do what we thought. Just out of left now and he gets chomped to bits. I mean, another just immaculate display of shooting for Guaman, though, by the way. Seven gets the other two with the Operator, which is a new threat now added to the mix that Turtle Troop have to consider. Uh, you know, he may not have to pull it every single round. I mean, he could if he wants to play a passive setup. Otherwise, this round looks like he's going to pass it to Sim. But this timeout has to be about what can Troop do to maybe get a little bit of presence through mid. Try to force a defender to rotate over. Maybe even sneak into market. Throw some utility that direction to kind of split this hit towards B. Because right now, they are finding themselves completely funneling right into the waiting arms of both Seven and Guamond. And I mean, it has literally been the closest thing to like a 2v5 that you could possibly put on picture. They have dominated single-handedly more often than not. Yep, just owning those extremities. And... Seven either plays up with that operator or gives up the site and then yep. just gets free kills because of those trap wires. It's been really, really nice to watch. And again, with how fast Turtle Troop are playing, they're very subject to that stuff. Especially where like they probably can't find satchel or paint shell connection with a lot of that utility, right? It's just been really challenging for them. I love the switch to have seven here in the middle part of the map. They are they are really reading this from Turtle Troop very well. Yeah. And it is one of those things that for Troop, they don't really have as much luxury as other compositions of, hey, look at us, we're kind of faking a hit. Like, whatever they throw, they essentially have to commit behind due to what they have in the picture. I mean, again, the, you just don't have the ability with no Viper's Wall to recontrol space, or at least recontest space, because... Well, you can't just hide info. It, it, like, there, you can't yep. just Viper Wall mid and throw it up every now and then. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everything has to be essentially a full flood. I, I don't want to make it sound so simple because it's a lot more in-depth than that, but... If they're throwing utility, they essentially have to get behind it. Great satchel to break the crosshair placement, but come on! Doesn't One miss. He's good for two, once more, and then the follow-up is there. The showstopper gets it. involved and poised. We'll get himself a couple of kills, and 
prevent Gim on a seven from hoarding all of them. <laughs> and look at how that all farmed again. It was a little bit too quick to really break down, but seven plays an aggressive setup towards B. The rest of the team plays an aggressive defensive setup, pushing forward into A. They're not allowing Turtle Troop to take the outsides of the map. It's and there's again, there's really no way that troop can contest this smoke or this mid wall with the abilities that they have on the table. So it feels like TSM have made the call of do we play retake or do we play contest? They've chosen the latter and they are slamming troop now. Absolutely, this hasn't felt close. These rounds are over in a matter of seconds. This turtle troop are right or die with the strategy. Oh, the off anger from get oh, this guy. Oh, they've got to get up early in the morning to get the better of him. My goodness, Corey. Who, by the way, an FPS veteran at the highest level in multiple titles gets absolutely clowned on. And it's just no room to work with. I love TSM playing this proactive, not essentially letting Troop get away with these free setups, so to speak. Poise on the corner. 1v1 goes his way. Not going to get the second, but B-Dog is in trouble. And it's not getting much better as the defense is already fully rotated over to A. <laughs> Team Ace. Wow. Hello. The spike is here. TSM had the high-low setup for B-Dog. You just had to give it up there. And that money tells you everything you need to know about this situation. Also, that really long green bar there where it has TSM score. Yeah, everything's green. Seven in a row. After a bit of a slow start, but you can forgive that after losing the pistol because TSM have not missed a beat since then. <laughs> yeah. They are maxed out. They are capped. They are stacking those Benjamins. Yeah, dude, this is disgusting. What a convincing half this has been. And the news doesn't really like, get any better here if you're looking at this from the perspective of Troop. By the way, they are one of the best teams at getting into an equal advantage and staying there 37 8 overall. But outside of the bonus win, they really haven't had it. The evasion from Sim nearly gets him completely away from the showstopper plus extra. But Corey's got the sheriff and he's getting aggressive. Doesn't quite work out. Shots come a bit awry, but Trooper there to get his back and everyone stays alive for now. <laughs> forget about it. Just forget about it. Credit to Turtle Troop because they don't slow, they don't stop for a second. But TSM are just a little bit different today. They are ready for these aggressive pushes. They're not giving up the sights. They're holding them. That exchange, of course, between the razors was an odd one. But you see just how often Corey is trying to shoulder piece. He's doing the right things, trying to force these operator players off the angles. Yep. Come with the showstopper. That is correct. He just can't convert until he pulls out the pistol, apparently. <sighs> I, I mean, this is mind blowing. And I think a lot of it is like, if you were to really look at the macro sense of everything, how much of this is the mental warfare of seven getting away with trap wire murder, three separate rounds over towards A. After the initial success for troop was all at B, all of a sudden their first hit towards A goes wrong. The wingman dies, more reveals happen. A couple rounds later, everyone gets melted by seven. It just throws a complete monkey wrench for troops this designs. Dirty. And now you've got Guaman is... just throwing a curveball at mid and he's going to catch they... timing. They were just here. They were just here. Corey was shoulder. Oh, oh, what we did, please. Oh. Guaman gets the drop on him. b at least have a trade here, but this gives a bit of information away. Some presence of Turtle Troop over towards I that A side. Exactly that is audacious are. shift. He literally <laughs> just saw a dizzy and a shoulder peek in mid. Oh. Uh, good call here, though, from Troop after that response at mid. Boys can only really hold this corner. He really cannot contest the site at all, and so he'll give it away. But you do have the ability to potentially grab an elimination, maybe get the cyber alert in for seven. But Thrash is at the ready. Is that number three or is that number four? And it wasn't keep, I wasn't keeping count. I want to say three. Given that the opportunity for Alt Orbs has been limited recently. Great reposition from Corey. That is... Stellar positioning. Boys now behind the box in the middle of the map. But Corey's going to be there. Only a pro to really try and hold them back at the end there in Turtle Troop with a nice, nice little recovery. Switching sides. Yeah. That, that, that's an important round right there. That just not only keeps you away from the 9 3 tally, which is crucial, but more importantly, it kind of helps you reset your mental touch of, okay, we know we can execute with this composition. Just trust that maybe there's a bit of a, you know, Gumon just having a heater right now. Him and Seven both are on one. And how many of those rounds you kind of chalk up to the fact that Seven Gaman essentially won them by themselves? Very awkward passing between moments right there, by the way. But the quick trade, the quick burst, the quick follow up, that looks good. The question now becomes how of your troop do you decide to play defensively? 
Because, again, you're restricted on how much the map you can constrict because you don't have the Viper up. So you have to stretch your defense right off the get-go with everyone having to watch essentially everything. So everyone's got an assignment here for sure. There's my buddy. Battleship surely hoping for a bit more from their attacking side. TSM having not shown us this map yet this year. Look unbelievably well drilled on that defense. And again, they do have explosiveness here in their composition. B-Dog trending over towards that link here. Camera removed and a smoke. Plus the trailblaze to potentially clear the site. Yep. TSM are ready. Yeah, it's just the one trap wire in the way. Adder's really not going to be able to peek off of it either. Page shells delays. Oh, Sim gets this read. Oh, he does, but it doesn't matter. Adder just a little bit quicker on the trigger. So, chance for the retake. 5v4 just comes down to can they get through the rest of this utility. Proto steps up. Bold call. Paranoia is on the mix, and now Troop can make their way onto site. Voice very low there inside that smoke, but the flash out is good. He's able to find at least one. That'll put Dude. TSM in a position where they can take it, and Gimon with three more. It feels like there's nothing this guy can't do this map. He's on one, bro. Just flat out. Gamon is officially past the NBA jam of heating up. He is well on fire. 18 and 5. And what looked to be Troop just flooding even through a, what was a pretty solid flash from Poise. Gamon just steps out with a classic and still gets three. I mean, some days it, you just have to chalk it up to someone pop it off. And right now that is all GMD. And now with the weapon advantage, TSM looking prime for double digits. Troop is going to have to gamble stack. Paranoia comes out, but Sim playing a little bit more reserved. One for one's not bad. Offense has to stay responsible for this weapon here, and they may catch TSM for a couple more. Yeah, oh, sure will. Buddy. This is going pretty badly. We did able to get out with a Phantom. 23 points of health to boot. Not too shabby, though, for... TSM in general. And now over towards the A site we head. It's definitely a sense of TSM. Have that lurk wall up there, but very little information. So this will give Turtle Troop some time to start to allocate their resources to the other extremity. Yeah. Only real issue is that we did a B-Dog. We're not able to get up far enough to collect any of these weapons. So it will be a 3v2 and a retake that will likely not see weapons change much here for TTR. Like maybe someone takes a long flank, but it's just there's so yeah. many uncertainties about playing through B main right now. That they're not going to have the time to most likely. So this will have to be about likely we did kind of being cannon left. fodder with only 23 HP. He can kind of be the first one forward, enter in, kind of sacrifice his life, hoping that Adder can follow up behind him with the fan. So adamant about staying together at B here, the yeah. three of them. A lot of it's got to do with that weaponry, I suspect. Do not want to get caught as individuals or pairs here. The Trailblazer was held onto for so long by Poised. He didn't use it at all to clear A. A Proto has an angle here. Note the shields. Very healthy at the moment. And in a position of backstab, he hears it all. He hears everything. All of the planes with Turtle Troop laid bare before this man. And it's a three-piece for a Proto. They get TSM with their nose out in front in this second half. Yeah, that's such a tough moment for Troop. There's just really not much you can do right there. You have to run. You have to move quickly. And that means that you're subject to cheeky plays like that. Hell of an awareness move, though, for TSM to kind of split their post plant setup. Again, 2v3. And you may not 100% know if they collected any more weapons or not, but Proto just takes a chance, gets deep through the backside of A, and then as soon as he starts hearing those footsteps from the spawn, it becomes just easy pick-ins from there. Easy commitment call to follow up on it. He threw himself at risk of being isolated, instead walks away with no one shooting back at him, catching it all from the flank. Turtle Troop now able to buy up, get themselves into the game. Viper Wolves kept a couple of players for the troop over towards the A side here, and this is a fast hit. Trailblazer gets caught inside the trap wire, and that's going to be removed. There is another one on the site, though. Gimon might be about to find out. Cypher Cam also yet to be removed, and oh Sim wants to play towards the back of the site, but yeah. that's as far as he goes for now. Yeah, why not, though? Stinger up close like this. He just has to go one for one. This is a lot of pressure on Troop being able to isolate with things like their own fragmented flashes. You have to get utility out of here if your TTR does three take. Sim gets his, he'll take it. But here comes the hit now from the defenders. Wild spray there from Ado eventually claims the target, and a Proto now has to clutch once more. Suppressed, but has no need of the util. Tries to wrap around to the left here, but Weeded comes away with three. His biggest round of the game. 
And Turtle Troop able to weather the storm with their fantastic suite of retake util. Yeah, really, really well done. And again, that's a bonus right there for TSM really anyway. So not the end of the world. You would like to have made it a little bit more punishing, sure, but you get the plant off. You're good to go for another full purchase here. And even in that limited buy, TSM, I think, still throws some mental warfare in the direction of TTR with Sin getting forward like that on his post plant by himself. And that's something that, you know, Dryad was kind of bringing up is Sim is no stranger to being like, boys, I'm going to go do something crazy. Just hold my back. And more often than not, it feels like it works out for him. That time he did get the one for one, but yeah, the limited utility and weaponry on the offensive side past that hard press to hold. And we go 10 5. He's, he's happy getting one and done there, I think, with just a stinger. Yeah, 100%. Makes sense. Hey. The cyber cage immediately bursting forth here. Clear the close angle with the paint shell, and Sim goes bounding across the site once more. It will be retake set up for Turtle Troop. There's a player in mid. Yep. Apollo here has been left as a loose end. This is huge. The thing is, you have to expect that a proto is lurking. You just always the have to wire. expect it. And the trap wire will keep him somewhat honest, but timing is everything. He can just wait to break this until the focus in the front starts to break down, and he already has. So look at TTR. They are slow at market. They're slow through the back. This is taking so much time, Mitch. Proto here looking for a timing. Already, though, the side hit's starting to come through. Addis found two. He's pushed his way all the way up. Traded out eventually Last here. He got, got rid of a proto. That wow. lurk player gets cut down. Turtle Troop. Managing a really complicated situation with that loose end Viper in mid, fantastically. Well, the, the big key there is as soon as the trap wire drops, they don't just keep their focus behind, they actually throw the Dizzy out just to make sure that the Lurk from Seven has, or pretty from a Proto, just has to hold there. And then you throw out the Wingman to try to get towards the Diffuse. It forces TSM's hands on the post plant that they have to reveal where the rest of their setup is because you can't just let them get on for free. And then you still have a lot of retake utility from Stellar who's up to eight assists, by the way, which we don't often talk about the assist category, but eight assists is quite a hefty number at this point of the game, especially considering how this game has gone to this point. So really good stuff from Troop. And yeah, TSM getting foiled on that lurk through mid has to kind of talk it through to see what they want to do. I imagine this is mostly a conversation of how do we want to try to re-ferminify our post-plant setup because getting onto site really hasn't been much of an issue for them yet. Do we see TSM try and take mid here behind a flash and... I don't think Poise will keep this guard here, but if he does, see Seekers look pretty good from there. They have heavy pings in Boba. I think the conversation might be about TSM trying to scale even off of the B site towards like the Defender territory more aggressively to to disrupt yeah. this sort of setup of that retake utility that Turtle Troop have so much of. It's just one of those things like it's hard to commit multiple members towards a forward post plant hold. I think a lot of that is because You've got, you know, we'll call it the double sentinel, right? Between Proto and Seven, essentially, because you really are you're trying to use post plant mollies and you're trying to get whatever trap wires you can to watch flanks. So your utility to hold inside the site is limited to whatever your setup looks like. And so if you're Sim, maybe you're the only person who can really play that far forward. But you can see the struggles of trying to play back at the same time. There's just so much quick burst from this troop setup. So the Viper will basically cancels out the one way. Yeah, yeah. From the other. Oh, okay. All right, Sim. Grenade, you have my attention. Trail. You come the dark covers now. Seek is also going to be deployed. They're all headed in the same direction. That's right. They know there's someone in because we did just smash yeah. them, finding two through the smoke. Yeah. Good reveal. Good kind of passive defensive setup. Now the spike is in a very, very bad spot. The real will come out. We did up top. He's going to get a third. Spam nearly collects the board. But the secondary reveal will have Troop running forward, cleaning things up. And the only thing special there for TSM was the solo shot from Sin. Everything else well in hand for TTR's defense. I'm loving this. We had a conversation earlier, actually, about Turtle Troop's uh, deadlock composition kind of like looking very good on attack in one half and then kind of weak on defense, right? Yeah. And so much of the conversation around like double initiator is like where it's strongest here. But Turtle Troop don't have to fight awkwardly on the site. Their retake is so good. There's so much info that can be gleaned. There's still a thrash, by the way, waiting to be deployed here. So even if TSM get that spike down, they're by no means out of the woods, especially when they, on Sunset, you can't really scale off the site aggressively. Yeah, sure. Yeah, just, just expose yourself. Oh, and another, spike just again, aggressive down, setup. Eight. This time it's just right down tiles. And Reaper's gonna follow up. Thrash is right there with it. This is oh just the Giga no. Chad. Let's battle. Corey for four. Yeesh. You're up. Stay safe. Corey, throwing him out of the phase days with some good old fashioned smig in there. <laughs> Love it. <laughs>
That's but that's what, they, that's what Turtle Troop did every attacking round. I don't expect them to mix it up, I guess, when they move over to defense. Stellar up to 11 assists. It's getting a lot of connections, man. The knives, the flashes. He's even got, to think, a fragment kill. I mean, it's just... As much as TSM put a slamming on defensively, the thing is, this troop comp has the ability of bursting and catching TSM off guard. It happened early in the first half, and by God, is it happening now. And TSM say, well, okay, well, it's not, what's the one place in the map they really can't burst on us at? Mid. <laughs> Let's just stay there for a little bit. You say that until they, like, double flash through top <laughs> mid smoke and then just yeah. get you as you're rotating. <laughs> Seems to hear a rifle here. Also had that showstopper to spend. This cam is going to spot them out. Come on. Is, destroyed. is aware of that at the very least. Here, Adder only sees the one, but they know, of course, Moop was already taken. Now they're getting ready to receive them at Boba. Big pick. Great job for Sim with that solo rifle. Gets a key kill, and in they go. Oh, but the suppression comes I out. He has to exactly. put the rocket away a little while longer. And it's not guaranteed. Space and all the neural theft. Largely denied by Stellar, who just stays on top of the site. And oh my. What looked to be TSM getting away with possible highway robbery. Troop right back in the mix. The spike is rotating back towards A with the ability to rotate off the, from the shadows. We're resetting the 4v4. Let's get a util check here on the side of Turtle Troop. Stella has both of his flashes still. There's a paranoia up as well. There's a lot to work with here now on a retake scenario. Gimon has no smokes right now. Still a poison orb for a proto to spend here. Oh, the timing could be unreal for Proto. Knives out. Oh, They're not boy. checking this, man. <laughs> he just gets it done with the Sheriff, man. Never rule out Proto with the Sheriff. Dude, he's actually, yeah. As I associate him so closely with that weapon. It's remarkable the consistency he can do this. All right. Standing. That's getting a bit awkward, though. Proto in the 1v2. Doesn't have a Sheriff anymore. Hey, and B-Dog. Here's a minute of that bow wow. Love to see it. Turtle Troop now bring it back to a one round difference. I got you, I got you. Power of the wingman. You have to spend shots to spam him through the smoke while he gets on for the defuse. It gives a chance like, for the gecko to push up beyond it, isolate the gunfights at either low ammunition or just on weird angles. And what nearly was another pull away kind of heroic thrifty-ish round for TSM goes the way of Troop. We're down now one and TSM, I... It's hard to paint the picture of like, what did we do? Because let's be candid, like, yeah, they've been foiled on their post plant, which was the main focus be to begin with. But in round 17 and 18, it was just Troop running at them. And now they've got Showstopper at the ready. I mean, there's a lot of tools here where Troop can continue to just play aggressive if they want to. Too many early tools available to B-Dog there means that TSM can't really play fast towards A main. Instead, once more, it's about mid. Will Sim simply walk in again? Find a pick at Boba and start the transition to the site. They've moved that Cypher Util over to A this round, and it was anchoring B previously. Still over a minute left in the round now, and perhaps some heads turning back in that A direction. There will be a cam set up on that site. You can see the B mains constantly being checked. And then again, this, you know, the Trailblazer clears space, but Troop just don't care. And they've got the setup that they want around the site with the trap wires guarding both entrances into the immediate plant area in specific. We did on a really aggressive corner. Oh, just kind of gets beat to the trigger. And now all of a sudden, TSM could do a little bit of a burst attack of their own. Corey's going after bull, Corey. Sim gets brought down by Stella. So Corey now has to find a way to make use of this. Gimon gets himself wedged up towards Boba. It's only a trade though. 30 seconds left. In the 3v3, oh. showstopper now off the board. Corey going to buy some time here. Well-placed paint shells here to slow a Proto in the 7-up. Yeah, TSM was just waiting for Poise to hit through market before they committed onto site. Really heads up play. Flash also connects. Stellar gives away his position. Add or not fully on site yet. Tough angle across the site. That is great hesitancy from TSM. Saying, wait a second. Poise is in a great spot at mid. He can get behind Corey at market. Let's just wait for it. Trust that he wins this 1v1. That's kind of a Trojan horse, and it works out absolutely beautifully for TSM. Hell of an effort from Troop, but, you know, Corey, as soon as he doesn't really get anything off the showstopper, I think he was mostly looking to try to capture over towards market, maybe had a chance to pop it and pull it towards main, but, you know, we've got the beauty of the X-ray. He doesn't, and obviously the focus was making sure that the defense could hold on to market position, and that's end up kind of failing them in the long run, which gives TSM the edge back. Blinded. 
decent buy here for TSM, all things considered. Yep. Did kind of come into that last round with a very shaky economy. So able to find a way to stabilize. And now they're playing it really safe. Using a proto was the more active member towards the middle part of the map. They want to signal the least that they might transition through market again, but that's not the plan. Trap eye gets eaten up here. Dark cover. Okay, and a molly even thrown out by Stella to mm. slow this down. Yeah, the null command, maybe a touch early, but it forces TSM to have to back off and worry about mid, worry about someone maybe potentially threatening over towards the cyber trap. And even though it doesn't necessarily become this a part dangerous. of the defensive setup, they do force TSM back. And Corey is in a great spot to just kind of utilize whatever B Dog tosses with this operator to hold the line. Operator on the extremity to play contact. This is what you want. Doesn't quite find the shot, but isn't punished for it. Able to back yeah. away, but that again makes TSM think twice once more. Yep. They're running out of time. Shoot. Yeah, and now Adder's in position to get a read. He can back off. Cyber Cage to give some separation. This is all working out perfectly for Troop. TSM have to force the square peg into the round hole. At least they find the first blood, and now the commitment has to be to B. Adder looked shaky there. I don't think he was ready for that aggression through market. He's going to fall, but we did. Steady hand this round. Very Jeez. much needed. Great break transfer onto Sim. And he's eating them up, baby. Seven now in the one versus three. We did waiting for his next victim. Still healthy, all things considered. It's going to be a save. What is with our omens today, bro? <laughs> I mean, clean as you'd like. That is just, again, it's one of those things that, you know, pick and choose the part of the conversation of, did TSM show a hand towards that they were going to commit towards B? Eh, not necessarily, but it was enough guys. force for Troop to maybe feel a little bit unrooted in their setup towards B that you pop the null command. It forces TSM to have to wait because your only real entry is largely off of Sims double satchel charge, which we've seen a couple of rounds in a row. And then as soon as that's off the table, TSM has to worry about potential lurkers through mid. You don't know what's over towards A because you hadn't looked that way at any point. And then you see, uh oh, there's an operator there. We don't want to go battle that. And your next option is to have to play through market because you don't know how far forward the defense got at B and you lost the tools to clear it. So it's this good kind of macro positioning from Troop to kind of keep TSM very uncomfortable through the round. You want to see TSM look to make as much use as they can of Sim's aggressive tendencies there, right? That yeah. double satchel on towards the B site was all well and good, but there was no real opportunity to trade. We did out for it. And of course, we did able to find you know, three kills by the end of that round. But I will say, Corey being posted deep on A with that operator basically won the round for Turtle Troop. I mean, mm, they yep. TSM at that point were out of time. They had to rush on in. They just had to find a way to hit the B side. They didn't want to face that long operator angle. Yeah, and that's the last thing you want if you're TSM is to have the clock battling you and the potential of a burst defense that could just collapse on you like that. I mean, you can kind of see what TSM is trying to do, especially for that last round is, can we stretch out this troop defense and keep them from being able to essentially death ball us? And that time, the clock became a sixth man, and Troop were able to happily use that, largely thanks to, again, the mystery behind the setup. So really well done, and TSM off the timeout looked like they want to try to force Troop to potentially get aggressive. But the thing about it is, as aggressive as this for TSM, there is a quick peek with a knife towards B. So Troop know that this is, there's, this is not a fake. This is a hard commit. And Beetle didn't have enough time to... Uh... Pick up the Dizzy again. Out of court out in the open here, but it's hard push towards Elbow, and B-Dog's already out of there. Five is bit towards A-Link here. Good pick. I mean, at this point, you can't lose the round. It's a fantastic pick. You can't be. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's only two ways you go about this if you're true. You either have to push through the pit from the front, or you have to go through the outside with an operator. So, TSM, good aggressive pit. Good aggressive post plant. We're going to get a battle here, though, Mitch. This is not over yet. Here comes the hit. Three players coming straight through from spawn. Boys waiting inside the hit pit. Weed has already found one. Seven needs to find a good swing timing here. He's outside of the pit and he actually gets suppressed here. Corey makes the swing. Stella with the wingman drop. Now it's going to vomit on towards seven. He gets run over by Weeded for another three. Another three for Weeded. And Proto now trying to work his way out of the pit here, but Weeded's good for yet another one. And Proto looking to save the day. The Nines don't get the job done though. And somehow, Turtle Troop come out with the round. 11 HP. And they've eaten it up. Burst comps, baby. I mean, oh man, it's so cool seeing how B-Dog is utilizing the timings with the wingmen where it, he just, a little buddy turns into a six man. Legitimately, because you called it. He's not able to get the Dizzy fully back into play again. 
and I don't even think he had a mosh on that retake, so you weren't really able to isolate the pit maybe as much as you'd like, but it starts first and foremost with Gamond. He tosses a paranoia. It looks like it's perfectly timed, but it's a 1v1 between him and we did. Of course it is, because they're the two gladiators right now for their squads. That comes up in favor of Troop, and then the burst through the pit works out beautifully. We're tied at 11 with TSM and a light buy. I asked for a banger, and we're getting one here, at least on yeah. Sunset. We did set up to shoulder pick that angle here. It gets a bit of love out of Gimon, but there's not much more they can do. Paranoia is going to make this a bit more laborious for the attackers, and they are running out of util already. Didn't have much to start with. Viper's Pit will cover up Link and Turtle Troop say, hey, go for it. Yeah. Leave us some cookies. We'll be back for the retake in a second. Yeah. Just wanted to make sure they're not going to get surprised by anything here. I think in particular, you just don't want to get caught on corners when you know for a fact that their stinger is out. You also don't want to get caught on long angles from very nasty Sheriff users. So now it's about using flashes and way back to the paranoia for TSM comes out. That's enough for a one for one. Me more than that though, the spam is good. GMDN a one with one. He's able to find the kill at the very least. Stinger's done his one job. Enemy remaining. Still the flash here up for Stellar and now it's only seven with the Sheriff. Playing outside the cyber cage, it's one, but it's just the single turtle troop now poised to look to take the map away 12 to 11 and what a comeback yeah. from our defenders and it's just in such opposite ways <laughs> that both these two teams have played defense Match point. i troop just here they have the luxury of deciding and we saw i mean there at the beginning in that round 17 the quick burst from Corey jumping into the mix so fighting four the retakes have been super successful i mean outside of what one time out leave it and save the pistol in the follow-up but troop have the ability of kind of keeping tsm guessing are we going to hit you aggressive right off the get-go or are we going to wait to the mid-round to possibly pop something or we can just wait to play this on retake and tsm have to have so many things to think about they have to play so cautiously not to get cut off guard and this time it's a lot of utility spent over the top at mid and it looks like proto may wander his way forward to try to create an extra point of ingress here if they do hit b Ghost off at TSM, putting it all out there. Sim can't complete though, Corey, playing from on top of the kiosk. It's not that unexpected a position, but Sim can't correct in time. Cyber Cage is going to give out all the room he needs to make the shots. He'll find two instead. Thrash straight down mid. A proto able to shrug it off at least, but now with four plays to face down. TSM are out of options. They're out of time. A proto is going to give them a stay of execution here, but there's a lot to be done. That kiosk position has been refreshed. This time we did TP it up there. Surely you can't play around this. The spike is so far away from a pro and Adder Defenders gets the win. job done. Turtle Troop take the map away. And it was looking ugly, ugly for them earlier on. What a recovery. What a freaking map, dude. That was a fun one. Flat out, <sighs> just two very opposite compositions in the agent pool. We had a heater from Gomon. It didn't look like he was going to miss a bullet all map. And then we flipped the sides. And wouldn't you know it, defensively is where troops start to replicate that burst success they found in the first three rounds of the first half. What an exciting map of Valor. That was a straight scrap fest. I mean, we dealt with what? That was 11-13, and that map was done in like 20 minutes. That was aggression right there from start to finish. Yeah, you normally think those maps kind of get drawn out and go for quite a long time, but we know Turtle Troop had to go for it uh, on offense, right? They really had no choice. They had one gear. On defense, at least, they can basically treat it like an offense half as well. Yeah. They can just practice their executes just on the other side of the map there, and the retakes were sublime. I mean, throwing it back, like, I, I thought, you know, Seven was fantastic. He just on an individual level looked so good. Seven's use of that Cypher util on defense was great. So many teams have Amdanar. Do we give up sight? Do we fight on sight? Do we subject ourselves to all this util? And I think I, I love that fantastic initiator heavy composition shift. It's sick. We've got more to talk about, though. We're going to take a quick break. That was indeed a heater. I'm feeling it. We'll come back after this and get you set up for map number two. The game starts long before the game starts. And warm hands are faster hands. Gain the upper hand and power up your pregame warm up with Zippo hand warmers.
A 13 to 11 win for Turtle Troop on Sunset. Welcome back, everyone, to Valorant Challengers North America. And this map number one, to me, it was everything that I could have dreamed of. A lot of back and forth between the two. The fights that came down to the very end, to the retakes that we saw for Turtle Troop on that second half. And, and Uber keeping it very close. It was so momentum based towards the beginning, though. Yeah, I think like we saw the lack of controllers hurt Turtle Troop quite a lot in the on their attacking half, right? They can't really fake anything. It's pretty hard for them to take map control without spending that precious utility. But once they hit sides, yeah, it looks pretty darn good. I see some combat this though by like playing to the extremities, like mm, getting mm. players down A long and just contacting them, right? Uh, that was you know something I think that was quite challenging for, for them to deal with. And when the operators started getting picked up, they are very powerful against these comps because quite often, you're not seeing that Utah come out until there's a side hit. So the best that Turtle Troop could do is like shoulder peak angles and stuff and try and play around it. It was ugly. But on defense, this flash heavy composition looked incredible. You take no risks, you give up a site, and then you can explode onto it. I mean, shift, I don't know what you think. I think the, the perfect site take setup from uh, from TSM, right? That everything. They even had a Viper's yep. kid uh, on the other side of the map, on a link rather. And they were so well set up in like a 5v4, and they still lost in the retake because of just the level of explosiveness that Turtle Troop had when they come back here. And it's not just the explosiveness, it's the unpredictability of when that's gonna happen. Because throughout the entire second half, it started with Troop right off the get-go. Barriers drop, Corey jumps in, finds four. So TSM had to be weary of that now for the rest of the half. A couple rounds later, you see a bit of a hit right as soon as the execute's about to come out and Troop don't allow TSM to get entry. And then most importantly, look at the post plant difference. When in the post plant is Troop gonna hit it? Is it right as soon as the spike gets planted? Is it gonna be a little bit later? Are they gonna try to use the wingman to bait out TSM to have to take shots towards the spike? There's just so many different layers, so many different facades of when Troop is actually going to hit you that TSM could not quite figure out in particular throughout those post-plant situations. Three for eight is very uncharacteristic for TSM, who is one of our better post-plant teams generally. Look at the first but also kills. look yeah. at the first kills. Come yeah, 16 on. to eight is Insane. ridiculous for a losing tally. 16 to 8 is unheard of and, and it, it comes to from what you were saying uber about it, it seems like it was very easy to go for that b hit you get the spike planted you're gonna play post plant but that's when the trouble starts because it seems like in a lot of these scenarios yes it can be risky but it was a turtle troop that was allowing the site control and then going for the retake as you guys were saying very aggressive very convincing but in the process though there was that one elimination that happened every time i'm pretty sure the last three rounds that we saw for two same were actually the fast hit uh, the fast attempt at least and it all started guess what when we did was on the other side gets three and that's when everything starts snowballing for this side of turtle troop it, it was a 4k for we did a 3k after and when it was a 10 to 11 and it just turning it around and tsm trying to find an answer uber or not being able to do so at the end yeah i mean it's kind of crazy the gimon gets like six kills in the second half I, I don't know. it was, <laughs> yeah, it was like not that. like after absolutely ruining uh you know turtle troop for so much of their map we didn't add a both actually do a great job anchoring because there are a couple of rounds where turtle troop say well let's leave a player on the site here and let's explode in around them uh and there's a few situations where we did just like see sim double satcheling in and just rips his head off yeah. without even thinking about it the spray <laughs> transfer as well while he was over on that b side so just seek individual setups behind really elaborate retake strategies that leave TSM just completely dumbfounded. And it, and it was the back and forth between the two. And if we remember the way that this is this was starting was the opposite, right? Because it was three rounds for Turtle Troop after they get that pistol and then eight in a row for TSM. It did really seem like they were just going to get away with one of the most convincing wins we've seen so far. Yeah. But again, it is building up to be the match that we expected shift a match that is very close and i think to be fair uh one of the reasons was one part we did which we already mentioned was incredible on the omen but also corey stepping up on this race going for the double satchel avoiding somehow the showstopper coming for sim and sim was <laughs> trying to find an answer and he couldn't I think the other part of it is it didn't really make a difference who dropped first in those first bloods because troops compositional integrity doesn't falter. So if Corey decides to jump in, 
yeah, okay, you miss out on the paint shawls and the boom bop. You've got a fragment, paranoia, everything from Gecko. There's just so many extra tools and availabilities that it allows Troop to play things like that, where we know Corey wants to get aggressive. And that was kind of the point in the pre-match where we're talking like, we talked about the head-to-head the -head potentially between Sim and Corey. Both are going to be playing very similar roles throughout the entirety of the series, but both are finally on squads that the supporting cast around them doesn't rely on them being the only guys to carry them through these series. And that came true here once again for Corey. He goes 20 and 18, 5 and 5 in first blood, first deaths, but the rest of the team was right there the whole way. So if he's going yeah. in and getting the info or controlling space, even if it's only for a one for one, that's still fine if your troop considering how much is still left in the tank for them to still burst with. Yeah, really, really cool map. Really, really cool map. No, no, no one on Turtle Troop has positive first kill, first death ratio. Like, yeah. None of them. <laughs> that is, and the, in fact, the only one without a negative one is Corey, like you mentioned it, like at even. And, you know, and it seemed like, you know, it goes 11 and 21, okay. But he is like eight and five first kill, first death. So, you know, I think he's really living up to sort of the story that he tells about his play. You know, I really want to see TSM be able to convert those first kills. If they're able to do that, this isn't nearly as close yeah. as it otherwise yep. could have been. Yep. And it's going to depend so much on that second map as well of Lotus because Chef, you were mentioning a little bit of how for the most part we we expect Sim and Corey to play around the same agents. But for this one now, Uber, honestly, I don't know what's going to happen. We already saw the first compositional change come through for Turtle Troop on Sunset. They changed that deadlock that we were talking so much about. Now on the second map of Lotus, we've seen them play with this Neon, Corey on the Neon, and they've they've had a little bit of, of success. I don't think a convincing success, but enough to continue with this composition. But I also wouldn't be surprised if we see the race here. You know, I was pretty convinced actually by their win against Sad. Like that was like a quite a competitive series. Mm -hmm. And for me, like B-Dog was really crucial with a lot of that uh, breach util. It's, you know, it's a pretty big deal. And I think honestly, you know, the, the Neon adds this ability just to rotate so quickly uh, across the map here. Corey often finds himself again, like in a similar position to Sim on that last map. Like he can't double satchel into sights, right? But he is, he was positive on first kill, first death in like six to three uh, last time when they played Turtle Troop, right? So uh, despite being at the bottom of the scoreboard, like generally very much doing his job and gives you actually a heck of a lot of flexibility to cover more of the map than he otherwise would be able to. So I feel kind of fine about that. It's obviously different to like the fade ray setups we often see yep. on this map. And a lot right. of teams like to go for the gecko, which I personally uh, really like, especially just with how impactful Thrash is at the moment. I hope they stick with it. Um, I'm thinking maybe because they didn't pick this map, maybe they haven't revamped this comp necessarily because I think TSM plays something way more standard. They do. Way more standard yeah. on Lotus. Yeah, I th this is one of those that, you know, I, I can see it from both sides of things. For Troop, they got foiled by Infiltrator on Winthrop. Everything else was going really well for them <laughs> except for like the 27 bomb whenever he dropped. That was an insane series from him. But TSM, pretty tried and true. They play a very, you know, Ascent-esque type composition. It is, if I can remember right, obviously, you no know, KO, but uh, everything else is pretty much uh, what you see is what you get. I figure that's probably not going to change for TSM. There's so much information on this Lotus though for the side of Turtle Troops. So that's something that they can play to their to their side if they want to continue with this composition, bring something new, especially because we're constantly expecting that aggression towards that A side that it seems like it's making a strong comeback here on challenges. But let's jump into the agent select. Let, let's see if things are going to be looking the same way that they've done in the past for Turtle Troop or is going to be maybe something new as they gave us that surprise in that map number one. Because again, the Neon, me personally, I love the Neon. I love the aggression that it's able to bring over, but uh, I want to see Corey in the race. It, it's just that simple. It's that simple. Yeah, I mean, he looked really good on it last time around. And again, we know the kind of plays that race can make towards the seaside, especially it's really <laughs> yes. impactful. Oh my here God. <laughs> Another comp change here. And honestly, like, I love this because they keep the breach, right? Yep. Uh, yeah, in this they setup, do. I don't think the Neon is like a, a must have here necessarily, but now you can play the fade and raise off of each other. Uh, like I love this setup. Obviously it's Viperless, right? Uh, so double initiator again for Turtle Troop here, which again do, does mean to some degree you have that explosiveness that they lent on so heavily on Sunset. 
it's, I, it's very exciting. It's very exciting to see this composition for me because, it, again, we saw Turtle play this Lotus 13-11 against the Glaciers. You see in week two against Winthrop University, 11-13. Then you get that win, the most convincing one so far, 13-11 against Sat last week. But changing the composition, bringing this race, bringing something new makes it so exciting. So I can't wait to see. I do expect us to push to a map number three, but Uber and Shift, I leave it to you guys to see how this shapes up mm, map number three call coming out already i like that uh the way turtle troop looked on the previous map here this is tsm selection yep I, I, again it's also a map where i don't know if they've necessarily looked the most stable at times as well i mean again i'm not surprised to see them pick this for obvious reasons shift but um uh, you know their lotus they obviously lost to m80 and they had a comfortable ish win against winthrop so much still up in the air in this matchup as Turtle Troop would love to close it out with a 2-0. And I think the thing about it is I can understand the potential thought process for Troop on why you ditch the Neon and bring in the Rays. Outside of like when FaZe played this map last year, I just never really feel like Neon gets the most amount of value in just being able to kind of, you know, yeah, flex, sure, great. That's all fine and dandy. But in terms of like successful entry, if you're not hitting utility, it doesn't really feel like you're getting much else beyond it. So this kind of adds a layer of like kill potential is how I look at this for Corey, who the last handful of times he has played Neon on this map, he really hasn't been a factor in the kill feed. It's just all been about an extra level of separation with the fast lane. So I don't think you're missing out much by not having the Neon. And I think what the intention is, you're adding in Corey to be more of a threat here on the scoreboard with this raise in hand. Look at this though, no Viper Lurk wall at A for Turtle Troop. They don't have that capacity, so they're actually just hard contacting along A <laughs> behind the Cypher Cam, which is kind of sick. Again, they can always like smoke stairs right or whatever sure. uh, and play up in that direction, but they'll still have to deal with like the presence of Hobbit in close gaps here. Stella's going to swing this one. I don't think, yeah, I don't think we did really want a piece of that at all. It's going to be now over towards A. The spike, though, a little slower here. We did, has at least a smoke for Hobbit to get across. Oh, and Adder misses a chance right here through stairs. If he can collect one, that makes this TSM retake a little bit more one-dimensional. But now they've got stairs as an option. Paint shells up and over the top, get Sim in towards pit, plus low health pulls around. A couple of trades, left. sure, but numbers still favoring TSM, and they've delayed the plan. Don't plant. Demon's gonna be here. I mean, no one ever checks this corner, do they? No one! Still gonna be a trade at the very least. TSM, they're gonna work. Total Troop down to a single individual at a poultry, 21 points of health. And we did at this point realizes that a plant is probably not on the cards here. Afroda's gonna catch his heel as he tries to round the corner. Yeah, decent idea though. I, I think that's one of those situations that down. simply put, Adder misses out on an opportunity. Not gonna say that he, you know, whiffed or anything of the nature. It's a tough gunfight, but you win that gunfight through stairs, TSM's retake becomes a lot more, uh, I would say, malleable just due to the fact that you just don't have the ability to use stairs and that stairs position of Troop were to hold it also kind of takes away the knock through the wall at B connector. So decent stuff overall in terms of the opportunities that were built for Troop, just the conversion not fully there. And now we've got two Guardians, a Phantom, a Bulldog, and a Spectre out, a very formidable anti-eco here for TSM, and they're using that to take over a quick mound control here at sea. Yeah, they swing past the fault line there, and Turtle Troop really expect that to be a vacated mound and no one playing from C main. Easy freebie for TSM. Only seven here playing over towards that A side. So that turret just got removed. Yeah. Once again, Turtle Troop are just hard contacting through this part of the map, using their defender's wall to their advantage. Yeah, and, and also you have the connector control, but what are you going to do with it? I mean, it's just one of those rounds that becomes very difficult to even think about where you get opportunities, let alone create them. Sid even getting a little bit of extra through the wall. That will work for his third. And B-Dog, really not much of a chance here. Just a classic. And this is going to be a pretty much full bonus for TSM coming into round number three. And it's a formidable one here, Mitch. Yeah, really, I mean, really comfortable shift. And the single controller here for TSM, you can see how it maybe doesn't give them a, rather for Turtle Troop, excuse me, doesn't give them like a whole lot of flexibility to change things up on the fly there. They're kind of making use of the Vipers wall thrown up by, by TSM to get into Hobbit, but that is read pretty quickly. Because of course, plenty of sound was made on their way over. Yeah. Still, we'll table that for now as we have a gun round here for Turtle Troop. We can actually see what their comp's capable of doing. 
I feel like fighting Bai Long seems like a risky prospect with their setup. It really does. I mean, I mean, I think the thing about it would be you would have to throw a fault line like in towards stairs, followed by a smoke, but then you're giving away a lot of tools that would be used towards C. I wouldn't be surprised if Troop just kind of give up on A. Play that same spy cam we saw from a couple of rounds ago and keep most of their focus on executing towards B and C where they're gonna get a lot more value out of this composition. Yeah, all that I can do is imply a lurk with this cyber cage. Yeah. That's fine though. If Total Troop's plan is depending on TSM serving them something up for free, they're barking up the wrong tree. Speaking of which, he comes to Trailblazer, does not spot the player close to long, but of course, getting removed by Corey gives up the game. There's just so much apprehension here because the last thing Troop wants is to lose a main control, but Adder may just walk into a bit of a trap here. I mean, it's a double stack behind the box, plus a player on the close corner. Adder is, wow, does well. That, I mean, the first is fine, but the weapon's given up, but TTR are still slow. I mean, they're not, they haven't committed to either site yet over towards the other side of the map, and really, Seven can just hang out. He just has to play in the back of the site and just check things with the guiding light as soon as he thinks there's a hit coming on the way. Or he can satchel here once. 30 seconds. Bolt line there thrown over towards that spawn side of Sea Halls. So they do go onto the site here, but you see, like, a lot of this is just contacting. They did it over at eight. They also got peeked into me briefly now behind the cover of some of these we did smokes are able to set up here for the post plot. Yeah, it will likely be some sort of a poised bait with the flash on those way in. Come on, does have the paranoia still available? Holy Stellar sees trying to control a little bit more time and space, but they're running out of it until wait a second. Corey's in the long flank and B dogs at waterfall. They could collapse on this. Enemy remaining. That waterfall secured is so big there. That is massive. And now Proto just has to waltz on in here. Can't get much done at all. Great little adaptation there by b Dog to take such a crucial part of the map. As TSM could really only sort of smoke their way into that seaside behind that paranoia setup. Internal Troop get themselves on the board, and I'm not surprised to see an operator picked up the first opportunity. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. And that's going to make this A-long problem even more difficult to manage, because now all of a sudden it kind of takes away the ability for the spy cam, first of all, but Adder really can't check. So you're going to be missing information towards A and essentially just playing flank watch. You'd have to think if you're Adder, which really kind of one dimensionalizes this entire approach for troop. Just comes down to if TSM can continue to find success controlling mound, because if that's the case, I, I just don't know what you do if you're troop. You cannot allow TSM to have this mound control at the beginning of these barriers dropping. Yeah, Gimon really establishing himself there. We did wants to set up here though, maybe even explode through the door. Okay, I like that. Gimon's can tell that something is amiss and is able to TP back towards C main. But again, that there'll be another opportunity to refresh that one way here. Yep. He feels that Turtle Trooper adamant about this C play. And the quick rotation from seven, he can delay because he's still got both guiding lights. The Trailblazer's checking things out. He gets deleted, but all oh, they walk up. Not expecting that troop is still kind of hanging out towards mid pillars and the first blood gets tallied and now a follow up huh? as Stellar opens up C. Gwamon gets caught trying to cherry pick. All right, well, Turtle Troop just cut noise apparently and start to scale up their map control here. There is two players though at Waterfall. It could be a problem. Seven able to flash himself in, but it doesn't catch Stella. Second guiding light, no good. Seven's gonna find it. Spike, not down as of yet. It was recovered by Corey, brought back, and now a proto step ahead of the Last paint shells here. Standing. Gets a bit of action, the satchel pops. See him in a position to take some contact, but it's gonna come a lot closer than he otherwise like. And we need to set up to receive the operator player some very weird round yeah, yeah, I'll say. I think the thing is, though, Mitch, like we kind of talked about, there's just not an option towards A. So Troop just kind of has to hope that they can kind of stretch the defense maybe towards B and C and then kill Noise, maybe create a little bit of doubt and keep TSM kind of on their toes, yeah. moving back and forth between the middle of the map and over towards A. But I think the longer that TSM see this, the more they're going to be like, well, okay, we're good. And now all of a sudden on pistols, this is how Troop will move, saying, okay, they've got nothing but sheriffs. This is where we can make an A play happen and make this defense think about other stuff. Opening exchange, not bad. Sim still has more in the way. Showstoppers out, catches in midair, and now TSM can collect weapons. Two of them, in fact. Yeah. Two guns secured here by this playdown. A long by TSM. Turtle Troop absolutely shell shocked. They realize now, of course, with so many personnel over at A, T has to be open. They're going to smoke waterfall. 
and hope this time to scale further back into the site and yeah. not allow a double stack from Waterfall with seven flashing in. It's just so tough because you're still 10 seconds away from a haunt. You just have the Cs available for Stellar. He does do a lot of clearing and steps into a double. Oh, heroic nice little lineup. Clear. Now the Nightfall gets earned immediately spent. Paranoia can follow up if it needs to come out. And just like that, we'll look to be TSM collecting a freebie. There. Immediately gets canceled. Jump to Proto, they know exactly where he's playing from. Camera confirms this. We need an adder have the high low setup and the C's will keep a proto in place. Not a damn thing he can do now as the triple swing comes in. And Turtle Troop get yet another one on the board. You thought TSM had something going there at a -Log. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of it is it's not just they had something going, they got the weapons and got back defensively pretty quickly. But it's simply put is one moment from Stellar. You already called it. They needed to step forward. There's no way you could set up your post plant back towards the bottom side at ramp or even worse towards mound. You have to get some sort of an elimination and force the defense to work for it on their way back towards site. And Stellar gets the double, gets the nightfall, and essentially confirms the round by himself. And now all of a sudden, you're back into a full buy, but you've got a key ultimate available for troop. They've got the ability to rolling thunder, which could be used to break down this A site. They're going to get spike. punished for this gamble very badly. Three plays over towards C Mount here from TSM. They're adamant about Eight taking three. control of it, but Turtle Troop make the right read. Yeah. Oh it's word. an easy smoke towards stairs. Uncontested sight take here of A. Yeah, this post plant's difficult to read here, Uber, just simply due to the fact that the Rolling Thunder can be used aggressively to get the defensive spawn <laughs> control, or they could hold it back towards Tree, and they want to go quickly right up ropes. Yeah, they set Catch up them. for it. Corey, though, might be caught in it at this rate. Here they come. 70 can hear the trail base are deployed. B Dog waiting on the timing. Heavy pings of it all sport, and here it comes. Corey's ready. Sim falls first, and the follow up of the showstopper. Just what the doctor ordered. Well, if the doctor is more interested in taking lives, then never mind. I mean, Corey now able to hold here behind that dark cover. Seven doesn't even want to peek in from spawn. It's over for TSM. Now, nah, that's freaking beautiful. What a good setup from Drew. Seven able to collect one, but. I, again, it's one of those things we talk about it a lot that Troop was showing us that they very well maybe our most aggressive team, at least in Group B. And they're continuing to hammer the point home. I feel like a lot of teams, whether they come through qualifiers or those that are in the group stage now, would just say, we've got Rolling Thunder. Wait for the retake to come. We'll pop it to kind of use the clock as a way to establish some post plant control. But instead, they get aggressive. Wait to hear the footsteps. Let the big fella eat. Hands up. Rolling Thunder collects, said the showstopper, puts it away. I mean, TSM knew they were walking into it. They knew it. There. But that's what they get for gambling so heavily on that yeah. mound control. Now, they gamble a bit with the A-log. So again, leaving B open. Oh. Sim absolutely dominated. Didn't know what hit him. Ankles broken. He's going to feel that on a cold day when the wind blows. I'll tell you that I much. I know exactly where. Oh. I see by seven. I mean, that is to find that one Come through on the wall. Out. Here we go, Turtle Troop unperturbed, still with a four versus four. They're going for it. Seven, overwhelmed. Yeah, and there's the aggression immediately through the dark cover. Corey's feeling it. Four in a row, looking for the ace. It just goes and passes from one hot hand to the other. Not enough ammunition for all five, but Adder still tallies a clean one for Troop now up five, two. This is too fast for TSM to deal with. Agreed. If spreading themselves so oddly or stacking the wrong site, they are being forced into, you know, post-plant scenarios where they're completely beaten on util. Wow. And the thing about it is, if you're TSM, I mean, they're surely going to call a timeout after this round. But dead. I think the thing here is, you just have to know that you can defend A from stairs. Like, you don't have to overpeak anything. They don't have the ability of blocking field of vision. I think you just need to kind of hold back and receive the hits from troop because it's going to be difficult to find value towards a and the c execute is going to be pretty predictable at a certain point in time and your utility defensively is great at countering it so i think you call a timeout after this round here if you're tsm see if you can make a punishing first and foremost but with pistols and stingers trying to break down a mound post plant is going to be a difficult prospect yeah i mean total troop didn't have enough time to scale into the back of c anyway also took no waterfall control here just because it's obviously vulnerable to two angles. Flash point there is beautiful. We did plays off of it. Guiding light. Oh, he rips their heads off. The human guillotine.
steps up, and the rest of the Total Troop convert. As any flawless. But TSM, again, they have to gamble with this half by over towards A long, and again, it blows up in their face. Yeah, and this is where you need to talk it out. What do we want to do here? We have yet to get poised anything. The Killjoy has been a non-factor. A lot of poised utility has been spent towards mid. The one spot that Troop is likely not going to try to burst into, largely due to the fact that it's just such a dangerous element to throw multiple players through pillars. They don't have the option of hitting door, remember, because this A-long play is kind of a non-issue. It's just too hard to control the space to get up, break the door, and then burst from multiple points on towards B. So I think you got to first and foremost talk if you're TSM. We need to put poise over into C. And it needs to be something maybe aggressive towards the doors. We have yet to see any nano swarms towards the choke point over towards ramp. We haven't had that normal sentry turret kind of on the corner. I think you got to put poised in a much more stapled position. Get them involved. And then on the flip side of things, do they trust TSM that they can just keep Proto behind his wall as the sole defender at A, and then you can flex Gomander on the map to be a little bit more valuable like he was in map number one? Oh, buddy. Where have I seen this one before? Turtle Troop, six rounds in a row. And we were kind of pretty questionable about the composition, right? Oh, it's really weak to operators holding an angle. Oh, I mean, they have only one controller. How do they get around the map undetected? They don't. They just commit. They just commit. Paid off with it beautifully. On the previous map, Ship, yeah. TSM were able to stop them as they're hitting the site, but half the time, Turtle Troop aren't even hitting a man's site. And this is Gabon just on an island trying to bullet hose people. He at least gets one. The defense gets here. I mean, this is getting held. This is what we talked about. That A long play is just not a guarantee in any form. So it's an expensive round here for TSM. They have to spend the Viper pit towards C, but ultimately the Odin works out nicely. They don't get it collected back, but hey, that one works out well. And surely Troop try their efforts over towards C this round. Surely. Have to think they do. Yeah, that looks like it might be on the cards here. And yeah, you, I meant you're right about poise. I guess poise, they're just not hitting any of the sites that feature this yeah. kill draw utility. Joke's on them because uh, poise can barely afford it. <laughs> <laughs> this particular round. So that will be set up again at B. I mean, you have to have someone there, right? It's just yeah, pretty oppressive if you let that one open. Okay, they actually adjust the fault line there slightly towards the right from the attacker's perspective. Catches Simba the one way. Shuts them down yet again, and they can't get around the wall because of the bloody uh, snake bite. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, and this is another good idea for TSM is, hey, you know, again, trust that the A-long setup is going to be fine. You have an alarm bot through stairs, so you know that you can f at least for sure retake around the back of the site. But you kind of stack the box. But again, this is kind of what we talked about from a couple of rounds previously. Troop just don't show anything. They don't create any noise. And now TSM have kind of self-inflicted a stretch of this defense because they're not really guaranteeing or comfortable in this A-long setup. Still, it just holds the angle here. Meanwhile, okay, Turtle Troop are trying to imply a bit more of a presence there. Because Turtle Troop want to commit, they are going to clear mound, though, fairly diligently. Nothing to be seen here, though. They're going to spam that box. This girl's sim and poised out of waterfall now onto the seaside. So enough yeah. early warning here for TSM. Yeah, Paranoia Showstopper combo should be coming in, although Paranoia actually connects onto Corey, so he blindly fires, literally. Doesn't connect really into much of anything, and that's enough for TSM to hold their ground. The trades are coming out. Proto in the corner by himself gets the one for two. Adder now, the last one left alive. Spike down, not a lot of time. And he's stuck. Ten seconds left. Literally between the rock and the hard place. Solid defensive ball from TSM. The timing from a proto was great. You know, he gives it a beat a couple of seconds before he swings there, just at the bottom of that C site and catches him out perfectly. Finding two there is exactly what TSM needed from him Tyrant midway off. through that nasty little site hit. And now, if TSM gambling correctly, they can at least play off the lockdown, right? There's, there's the ability to come back in yeah. and have a fighting chance to pressure these sites down and force Turtle Troop to spend whatever U2 remains on a re retake. I'm still just really surprised at how much they're committing poised to set up to be exclusively on B. Okay, here we go. Finally, we got some nano swarms and a sentry turret placed forward at C. But it has been a bit peculiar. I, we just haven't really seen that all that often. More often than not, the KJ will just kind of keep their 
set up largely towards C, maybe an alarm bot used over towards B or a lingering nano swarm, but this time TSM will kind of afford a couple of that defensive utility spend towards C. Most of it going to be deleted here, and the showstopper defensively pushing does connect, Ooh. but not for the full kill. We did barely alive. Yeah, but he is staggering around the map now. And again, like Turtle Shoot, what do they do? They try and rattle the cage a little bit over at C. This can happen to their composition, right? They are playing from their spawn and can't really scale into any further long. parts of the map without fighting for it. And that's why TSM make the clever decision. Like, let's play up here. Let's get a crossfire on A long mm. and force them to show their hand to get this part of the map. A lot of feeling out though. The longer this takes, the more I think nervy troop are going to be about what they're commit to. This is going to be a B hit for one of the first times we've seen it. And TSM will back off default to playing for retake. Again, they've got that killjoy ult, so no need to spend any bodies early. Yeah, pretty good sight to have that one set up for here. That'll be thrown down just in this corner from Poise, but it'll have to defend it. Sim with a boom bot at least. Here comes the lockdown. So Poise now going to just set up around this one. Look at the wide ramp here coming from We Did. He actually might get a timing on a proto. That would be yeah. big. But the lockdown, though, will come into play. He won't be able to dive into it. And then he needs to hope he has enough time and have an impact now. He and Corey are working Last from completely opposite player. angles. There's a defuse happening. And there it is. The lockdown gives TSM all the room they need for the defuse. I love it. This is such a good Last adjustment from TSM. I mean, off the timeout from a couple of rounds previous, they hit that early aggression through C mount. They back off of it, still kind of second guessing the A long hit, but it does feel like over the last three rounds, TSM are very aware that there's just not a lot that Turtle Trip could do to lurk their way up to A. They have to telegraph it in some form. So you've got like a little bit of an extra stack towards mid. You can rotate through the hole at B connector. And yeah, you've got Poise now establishing control from the front side at C. With a little bit of early forward pressure, paranoia, paint shells, and a teleport, TSM just not allowing them to get over towards a huge first. And the Rolling Thunder going to be delayed long enough. Sim should be able to shake this off. Ooh, the Aftershock's a big problem, though. Can he get away? Yes, takes a little bit of damage, but that's fine. Wow. Nightfall comes in. Sim's out a step ahead of it, though. There's a lot of action inside tree. Boombot. Doesn't get a whole lot of info. The flash was there though when Turtle Trooper trying to back away, but Sim found the timing just as the door was closed. Out of those able to hold his ground. Guiding light, flash on three, seven with three. Absolutely immaculate spray transfer and a well-deserved round for TSM to round out the half. I mean, that is just as sexy as a defense gets. You delay long enough to stay alive through the rolling thunder, and then you back up far enough to make the nightfall a non-factor. And that's what we were kind of trying to lay out. There is no better visual explanation of it. Troop with two absolutely map clearing alts can still not control A with it. Yeah, because they have to throw them from yes. the top of A log. Absolutely. They can't even get close. Absolutely. And then all it takes is Proto saying, all right, walls up, stay behind it. They just can't clear it fast enough. And it did really feel like in those last handful of rounds, TSM started to become aware that they had major advantages over on that A defensive side and Troop just forcing it, not working out. We're into 6-6. I like this. Again, trying to catch them off. Fault line play here out of tree and then capitalize on a pistol round could be absolutely devastating. Okay. Lying in wait. Corey and Weedy now springing forward. Same corner there for Weedy. Come on, running. I found each other once more. B e Dog also commits remaining. now and leaves Sim all on his own. Spike loose. Takes a glancing blow from Stellar as he crosses insult. Two injury added. And off we go, Sim, to try and make something of it. Don't rule him out. <laughs> I'm just going to put that out there. Sim with a ghost could provide everything you need. Problem is, tra Grenades. Trap Wire will expose this play. There's also a spy cam towards C just to confirm that this is indeed not a full wrap, but he's setting the spike up in such a good spot. Satchel charge can delay. Paint shells can find value from this spot. A lot of opportunity here for the 1v2. In old spawn, Sim checks now as Travelly Turtle Troop just play together as a unit here. You need to be very careful of this util, like you mentioned, Shift, that could split them up. But they opt to split themselves here. One playing from lower. This is going to be a tough angle for Sim to check. Still is there. The swing. How does that want to find him? And that's the foot the Turtle Troop want to start on here after TSM clawed back so many of those rounds. Turtle Troop get this pistol and we're off to the races in the second half. Wow, that was 
fractions of an inch away. Really tight, really, really tight. But like you mentioned, Troop, a huge pistol win. But the thing about this, look at the cost. TSM, able to get the spike down, plus a handful of donations are gonna meet Troop on the battlefield at an even eco. The only thing that's really different here is that TSM have to default in towards Stingers, whereas Troop have actually opted into the double guardian, double bulldog setup. So a little bit more long range presence here for Troop on the defensive side. But will they expect maybe a quick burst hit from TSM? Again, this breach means they can always set up an early fault run. The nice to like the fast flood here out into A long. But again, like you don't have the <laughs> controller util to slow them down, right? So again, TSM can set up behind a lot of that. There's the wall once more. And you can see how much space this gun is. You, you just get all Out that space charges. for free. I do like playing in tree to deny that mm -hmm. easy access, but TSM get to spread out much more without fighting yeah. for an inch of this territory. Thank you, Viper's Wall, for that. Hmm. Just get to walk Pretty up. Nice. Yep. Oh, but the shots are clean from Corey. Gamon does provide a trade and maybe an opportunity to rotate this spike back over towards B, but no, B Dog in position, gets the read. Fault line will likely delay a little while longer, and now the defense can collapse. I like that a lot. Seven barely getting out of the way. Is that after shock? Okay, Poise does get a alarm bot down there. That could be relevant. B Dog low on util still has two flash points to play off. <laughs> yeah, a bit of a uh, unlucky. Shots there as those players into B. B dog essentially lets him in. Well, this isn't charges. done yet, though. I mean, Stingers and B can definitely pack a bit of a punch. I mean, the alarm bot's the only thing really still persisting. There's a trailblazer, but uh, you just don't expect so much that retake you too. he's going to spend it. Yeah, and this is just about timing. I mean, TTR just cannot make a misstep here. They have to hit this at the same time to avoid making a mistake. B dog can line up a good fall line off that timing. Beautiful. We well, did catch his game on here. Two players for TSM in upper. Pedal Troop now going to start to encircle. It's just seven. Can he leap now into the abyss and make something happen? The answer is absolutely not. We did brings him down and Turtle Troop convert on that anti-eco. Yeah, really well done. And again, it's the what only thing that would have foiled that is if Troop took a bit of a mistiming and misstep somewhere and gave away something. But clean stuff, good discipline, lots of patience. So now all of a sudden the eco gets flipped on its head where Troop have a bonus, essentially, versus shares, which is not to be slept on, but it is still significant because this essentially puts them in commanding control of the economic diversity. And on top of that, if they win this round, they're going to have a pockets deep enough to send money to Switzerland. So this is a critical one for TSM going into shares to try to find at least a couple of repurchases. Come on. Yikes. Ooh, buddy. Beautiful. Corey reads that. Come on. Coy in the corner. Hoping to be able to counteract some sort of defensive push up on the one way. Hey, this is down. so tough to push through with just sheriffs. And you could see Trooper saying same issues they had on offense. They're understanding the vulnerabilities of their defensive capabilities here at A. At the moment, playing for retake. We'll see if that changes later down the road when more normal weapons are being sped, but you can definitely see the investment of the numbers stacking towards the left side of the mini-map. Dilla back it on up here. That will be enforced by the snake bite. All of Turtle Troop, though, are grouped up here. Superior weapon will get to the range. This doesn't favor them. The flash was good, though. Can the judge uh, get involved? No, apparently the jury and executioner got to him first. Fair enough. Boys now back behind that spike site. Turtle Troop stacking them up there. As TSM are forced into another weaker buy. That's three in a row for the defenders. And I'm seeing a repeat of Sunset happening before my eyes. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely some similar elements of it for sure. You know, and again, a nice little tip of the cap. TSM give themselves a fighting chance. It's a good pop flash up top at rope. But again, the weapons are just too insignificant. And now Troop because of how clean that is, they're actually gonna use round four of the half as their bonus, where you've got three guardians, a bulldog, and a judge all with formidable armor. The showstopper available on top of that makes this still a very deadly round 16, and TSM need to try to pull something out here from Troop. If they can find an opening first blood, some good map control, force this defense to split up a touch, maybe put some more focus towards A, that would put maybe some cards in their deck here as TSM have had a little bit of a difficult time making their way on the site. Here's the door wow. opening and the showstopper to follow it. Curtain came down on that show quickly enough, but it's a trade. 
The defenders here with a bit of a pop. That's what we're going to see a lot of by Turtle Troop. And I like how it interrupts the tempo here for TSM as they look to set up. Still only a one for one. You take the sky, you till out of the picture. Not too shabby. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's actually worth if we talk about it. And that's the value. Talking back about Corey not playing the Neon and playing onto the Rays. The ability to add a little bit of extra kill presence. Not just because of the showstopper, because of the ability from the nice space with some damaging utility. And like you mentioned, you take one of the initiators out of the picture here, and this becomes very difficult for TSM, especially towards A, where they're just really using this Viper's Wall. But this is all fake. And the thing about it is, Trooper saying, take A, we'll just play retake if you commit to it. We don't care about it. It's so funny, man. It's so funny how just like one less controller, one more initiator just changes the way you approach the game entirely. Yeah. Don't Troop don't care. Left. And this may as well be one giant share house as far as they're concerned. All right. As long as you don't take the, the food from the fridge label with their name, yeah, they true. don't care. Yeah. The only issue here, though, is that TSM do have the showstopper available to try to reinforce this post plant. So they have a good isolating ability. It just comes down to the timing of this because Sim is opting to play forward at ropes where he's going to likely get flashed or right fault there. lined or something. How is Adder supposed to find value with the judge here? He yeah. thinks about stairs, holds a close angle, but a pro was never going to push this. There's no way, right? He's going to hope so. Maybe he'll just jump around the corner. Cage. He's getting in there. That's so based. And a brought down though. Sim able to catch him with the showstopper before the judge goes to work. He's poised trying to do it up with Stella at stairs here. Just the one defender Three left now. Stella just needs a bit more time. Pushes through behind the prowler. But TSM are gonna get there. Clearing off this retake and finally getting some action here in the second half. Keep in mind though, that was a round four half bonus for Troop because of the start. So the kills that come out do keep the limited economy mm. in play for TSM. They also pull out a showstopper. So I, I think if you're troop, you're looking at that of like a, not a full loss. We don't need to engrave the L anywhere. It's just kind of a round yes, given. And I think for TSM, oh, I think you take That's away a lot from that, though, in terms of how you successfully approach through your own Viper's Wall towards A. Different look this time, though. Deep Haunt gets I set. Troop looking to get aggressive over on top of Rubble, and they're all trusting that Adder can hold this ground at C. August. Broke open there. Wow. See, he's finding a mark as we did and Corey to hold their ground. Coming out from heaven, the Pokemon is ready. We did though. Looking for his opposite number. That one was over awfully quick here. Turtle Troop so proactive. It's just Turtle the, here. Nowhere to go. Yeah, it's just a collapse from that hard stack push through A. That's the only downside about the timing there for TSM. I, I like the idea for the execute. It's well sectioned off. The smokes are well placed, but it's just due to the fact that it was a three-man hit down A long that really turns his attention and saying, oh, hey, okay, they're in B. So we've got one player still staying home. The other two can make their way through connector, and there's just too many things for TSM to look at. So Proto would have to 1v4, and he walks right into the fray of things. Double digits for Troop. Looking for potentially a 2-0. Are you kidding me? That is wild, isn't it? And a bit, a bit of a reset on the economy here as well for yep. TSM. Yuck. Vandal, Vandal. How much more can you pair with that? And on the side of Turtle Troop. Yeah, some of these rounds going pretty close. Fine. But they're close to another uh, Nightfall, of course. Neural Theft is up. Not the most game-changing ultimates here, but Turtle Troop don't give TSM a chance to set up. They either pop aggressively as TSM are, you know, trying to gain information, or they kind of bait them there into going towards that B side and just yeah. collapse upon them. Feels like sunset all over again. You're absolutely right. It's just this troop burst can happen so quickly. It can happen at any moment in time. Going out. So this time it's a four man hit down A long. So much trust that Adder can just let his utility speak for C in what you surely guarantee is some sort of a half or limited buy situation. So once again, we'll just play retake, they say. It's just the double initiator presence that troop is pulling. They can choose to play it aggressively, or you can choose to play it as a, a retake confirmation, and they're going with the retake confirmation. Koi really comes off second best in that little exchange. It's up to fold right on back towards A, and once again, Turtle Troop know what they have to do. Jeez. That's, that's pretty impactful. No doubt about it. Sim here with a, a boom bot can deploy this, but needs to deal with Stella first. There's no swing in time from Corey, although there might be an opportunity there. Yep. Fault line sets that one up. Corey wow. knows he's so low, so he goes in and sprays. He's at 10 HP for both of those kills. And now we're in a three versus three. We did does have that ultimate up, but from this position, you better off triple stack it and try to use Corey as a meat shield. 
Okay. It goes a little early, but B-Dog's able to trade at the very least here. Sip it up One close. It's remaining. all up to Sim. And, oh, my goodness. Turtle Trooper done it again. They sack a site because they can afford to. They will play retake. And, hey, even better if you push the stack site their saddle. They'll win there as well. I mean, <laughs> this is just flat-out good Valorant being played on both sides. There is barely anything separating a handful of these rounds. Initially, Sim walks into sight, finds a random headshot just before the smoke encompasses the cross the waterfall and then gets deep. But the quick retake call from Troop, B Dog lines up the fault line. Corey, little blast back play into the mix. And somehow on 10 HP gets two. It's just, oh. So freaking good. I know, not even that. Then they just use him to trade off of as well. Yeah. So he has far more value than even just the two kills that he gained. I love that fault line response. It's beautiful. Corey getting away with that one is pretty exceptional, I think. And here, just again, overload three players through C halls. Come out on top. Corey's had a fantastic day just quietly. Yes. Turtle Trooper found a really. It feels like a very unique style that TSM have not been able to get to grips with. Yeah, and I think the thing about it, Mitch, is like whenever we've seen especially in the challenger space, double initiator comps on this map, it's often used from the defensive side to get aggressive, to take a rebel, to take C mount. And troops sure are doing that, but it's not by using the initiator abilities. They're using just raw force of numbers with a little bit of extra support, but they're holding on to a couple of the key pieces to then use for retake if they guess incorrectly. It's just, they're playing it in just the slightest of different ways in TSM have not had an answer for it yet. One way they're over a day long. Once again, the four player stack. This Turtle Troop will slowly, lazily make the way back across the rest of the map. Whereas yeah. TSM didn't see enough, see enough a day long to kind of guess how many players were there in the first place. So they're not going to speed in here. I mean, they're playing the map, Mitch. Like it's a 6v5. The spy cam is solo defending B. Trap wires the alert system. You've got the ability to delay with Stellar's utility. Plus, he's got a Nightfall, which he'll send immediately. And look how quickly the rest of the defenders from A start to make their way over. I mean, it's TSM can't even get the plant down yet, and you're going to have a couple of the key players involved here defensively. TSM have to win these gunfights from inside the site. And I'm just hoping Stellar would light someone up for him. Doesn't end up happening, so we sit back behind the smoke patiently. Here's the fold line. Satchel from Corey make it two. Uh, and here's that attacking lockdown. I wanted to mention that this gets a bit hard if Turtle Troop just give up a site. Now they're going to very quickly surge on in. Are they going to fight for the lockdown itself? No. They've got to pull themselves out. This is awkward. Yeah, I don't even know if they're going to have enough time to get back into this, if I'm being honest. Plus the detainment. Yeah, and a follow-up elimination. Yeah, well sectioned off here from DSM. Just don't lose too many gunfights and you should be fine. They have time. They actually have time here, Shift. Kibondo's in a very nasty position, but we just able to bring him down now. What? It's just a proto left. Can he keep this alive? Last we did with four. B-Dog will, will die to the snake bite, and we did can't defuse. Clutch. All that work just to fall the last hurdle. It's a Zippo clutch here for TSM, posthumously, of course. Yeah, it, I, the timing of that is so well done by TSM. And wouldn't you know it, it bails them out from we did just again can he's also continued his hot hand from the second half of the first map 22 and 8 oh, now nice but it just felt like tsm's post plant with the time dwindling down that may not have been the biggest component it's just they had so much space control but we did just walks in finds three like the legend that he is just doesn't quite do it fast enough good post plant utility for proto and now all of a sudden TSM want to take the battle over towards A, knowing that TTR found themselves under a limited buy. TTR and these can play from behind the Rolling Thunder. Should have come to it. And make the correct stack here over towards this A long. Don't really put anyone too deep there. Oh, Corey. I think he's expecting someone to have already crossed. Yeah, there. that wall is so deadly, bro. Okay, we did. Uh, fair enough. Seven, they brought down through smoke. Here's the power. What? 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 No! That's illegal! In at least 40 states! Beetle Gallo to bring poise down, and this is all falling to pieces. Give on! Last man standing about to become fertilizer for the tree. Has Turtle Troops shut down yet another one? And I don't know what I just saw from We Did. <laughs> I'm not even sure if I saw what you, you saw, or if I saw the right thing, or if I previously just astral projected it out of my body. 
I saw a run and gun double headshot is what I saw. <laughs> that is ridiculous. And it's one of those moments that if you're TSM, you go, what else do we need to do? Like, that, it was such a good execute. We did does not care. That is unreal. I mean, the first kill right through the smoke is understandable, but the second fully paranoid just running is egregious. Oh my goodness. Match boy coming up here for Turtle Troop and now TSM are on the weak line. Oh. We lost for words, but that one was a, that one was a humdinger. And the prediction call here from True, not just off the call for the showstopper, but the setup in the first place. I mean, holy hand grenades. What has been these two bats of Valorant? Holy smokes. TSM still have a little bit of a lifeline here. It, it, they have to ISO Stellar, not necessarily for the elimination, but at least get him out of the site. And then you do have a Bucky and Bucky. two Stingers and a Viper's Pit. So <laughs> there is opportunity for TSM to still hold this, but it's going to be hard. Say it plainly. Nicely done, B-Dog. Takes a step back, catches Sim as he rounds the corner. Here's the plant at the very least now. You've got two Stingers and a Bucky in the post plant. We did with the TP now getting back towards the top side of B and as the Viper's Pit deployed. You have a bit to work with here. Flashpoint, Corey got a satchel away from it. Hoping to spray Poise down at some point oh. here. The seven gets caught inside. And the pit comes down. Poise to be the last one to fall. And Turtle Troop have done it. Once again, with a double initiated composition. They overcome Defenders TSM win. on two straight maps. Holy cow. I mean, that is a statement. Absolute statement. To think that this game was at 8-4 in the first half of the first map to TSM. Flawless. And it's a small footnote, but I think that round 12 win was a massive one for Troop, just to make sure that they had the confidence to say, our comp will work, trust the process, boys. And then here on this second map, like you mentioned, the double initiator comp is just the first part of it. It's another one of those moments that we could kind of summarize this series in. When is Troop going to hit? You just don't know. Because often when we've seen teams pull the double initiator on this map before, they use it defensively as an aggression tool to take C-mount or to stack the box at A-Rubble. But this time, it's sometimes that, sometimes this. Other times they're playing for full-on retake. It just keeps TSM guessing on when the action's actually going to unfold. And that felt like the difference maker largely throughout the entirety of the series, not just in this map. That is, it was absolutely ridiculous. Uh, you're dead right. I mean, it, there's so much, there's so much freedom in not having to, to stack every side appropriately, right? Not having to like read your opponent, you know, just like setting up and saying, hey, if they push A, we win, win the round on the spot. If they don't go A, we have to play a post plant, but our odds of winning the round are actually just as good as if we were playing like a double controller, no, normal composition there. That's a really good look. And this is kind of hard to play around. You did see some awkwardness though on the attacking side, like trying to go towards A long. It's like, all right, well, I'm just gonna stand here and hope they like swing a corner. Let's have like two players watch the same corner. Let's play contact here, uh, you know, inching over towards that sort of, you know, C mound. And a lot of the most interesting exchanges that happened, I think in the early stages uh, were like the, the aggressive, the defensive play from TSM to try and get over towards C mound. But, Crazy stuff. I mean, dry it. I've got to get you to weigh on this one because I know where a couple people actually predicted Turtle Troop to, to win this. Uh, I know I'm not one of them. That was me. Yeah. I was one of those two people. <laughs> I'm feeling pretty good about my prediction, honestly. And and I said at the beginning, this series could have gone either way because of how, how close these two teams are. But I think when it came down to closing out those crucial, big, important rounds, it was Turtle Troop on top. And honestly, uh, I, I saw a, a, a world where TSM was looking really good. It was... Uh, I believe six rounds in a row going for Run. Turtle Trip in the first <laughs> half. Bro. That already says enough, but I see a, a, a tactical pause for TSM. They start winning rounds. I think this seems like it's going to be a close series, but it was just domination for Turtle Troop. The aggression for this team was insane. Even when it seems like they were leaving a lot of sides for, for retake more than you would want to, it was just a, such a clean retake. And I want to say props to We Did because he was insane on boss. those retakes. He was insane Bruh. over. At this point, 
just go and find the defending team and kill them before planting. Seriously, you're better off. You're actually better off at just ignoring the bomb planting aspect of tactical shooters and just playing TDM. That is actually insane. You know what's kind of crazy as well is that like, I guess Lotus is the kind of map where, let's say you take like A-Site, good example. Scaling off of A-Site, like into the vented territory is really risky, right? You do yeah. it over towards spawn, yeah. it's really open sight lines. You try and take stairs, maybe you can like double face stairs or, or whatever. So this is the kind of map where you kind of have to sit in the site and play retake from there. You play back in tree, you'll play on A-Site. And I mean, God, I mean, B is, is, is of course no better. Like trying to do that is no one can trade you if you scale off the site on your own. So I think this is the kind of map where this like heavy retake composition plays really well into. And I would also say Sunset has similar aspects to it, right? But I think nothing is more telling to me than two out of seven post parts. I mean, one, like yeah. that is just, that is just so bonkers, man. And another map that TSM comes out having won more of the first bloods than Troop, 11 to 10. And it just doesn't make a difference because it, that's the, you know, and I remember we're having this conversation maybe in week two where it's like, TTR are not using Corey as your traditional go in first, get your frags type duelist. It is part of a system in which he can burst late. He can burst early. You just don't know when he's going to be a part of the picture. And yeah, 4v5 retakes end up working out fine because there are so many other players agent wise composition wise and obviously skill wise that can just jump in and it doesn't hinder this double initiator burst you can still find success even with limited numbers because often it would be a quick push through where yeah maybe they get first blooded but troop because of the utility lose the first kill but win the next two trades and are still finding themselves on top of the numbers game it's just not often i think we've seen a series where it's an 0-2 loss with a team that lost both maps, won the first bloods by a pretty convincing margin. Uh, this was a crazy series. Unreal. It, it was really good. It was a really good series. And again, I know you mentioned Corey a lot and, and props to him because he changes. He goes from the neon on this map to the rays and does really well in that kill department. But also, again, we, we did. did we did was just my guy. insane because okay it's a retake sometimes let's say it's a 5v5 or 4v5 cory still alive is the first one that goes in the first one that gets taken down gets into a more aggressive position that's fine it doesn't matter because we did still there <laughs> gets two gets three gets four even uh when you guys were looking at the post plans in those rounds one uh by tsm you actually do see that one of them that they won was everybody got killed why we did it was just he was running out of time because of of uh the util that was thrown into the spike right in the last second by a proto but you see a lot of back and forth between the two and it's still we did incredibly consistent being the difference maker for sure today shift i mean flat out sometimes someone's just on a heater there were a couple of options for us here today but i mean some silly stuff from we did for sure and that is again a major contributor to a lot of those out trading opening first blood engagements that comes through most of it happening on again the premise and pretense that it's ttr who are starting those engagements so even if they're not winning the first fights the follow-ups are still on their terms and it worked out really really well for them on both sides of the spike on both maps uh, what a series what a series it was a very exciting one between turtle troop and tsm as turtle troop they take that win it seems like it was three months but no it was only two oh how they take that win we're gonna throw it to a series highlight so you guys can take a look at everything that happened and when we come back we have an interview with one of the players One enemy remaining. Remaining. 
One enemy remains. 30 seconds left. Last. My own. One enemy remaining. Remaining. Ten seconds left. Uh, One enemy remaining. Uh, out. One enemy remaining. Last player stand. Welcome back, everyone. And as promised, we have an interview with one of the star players of today, Corey. That was a really good match by you guys. Charter Troop against TSM. We didn't know the way that it was going to go. Predictions were, were kind of here and there, especially with the way that the map pool was going. But you guys change compositions. You bring us new things. And that's the first question that I have for you. That first uh, composition that we saw on Sunset, it changes. We don't see the deadlock anymore. But last week, when I was interviewing you guys, you guys were saying, oh, the dead looks good, we're looking good, it's, it's winning scrims, and yet you decided to change it for that Sentinels composition. So tell me what's the reasoning behind it. Well, you know, sometimes when you scrim and you win scrims and you, it looks good, it doesn't go as planned in matches sometimes. I mean, the matches that we played on Sunset were pretty close, but obviously yeah. if we're just gonna lose both maps on Sunset, we were gonna feel like we gotta make some type of change. And we got the players to do that, so we're more than comfortable to play standard comps or funny comps, as some would say. I mean, and, and it works in that map number one. What about this map number two? I, I was very excited. I was like, I have a feeling that Core is going to play the race again. And, and we've seen the Neon quite a lot. It, it's been... Uh, kind of mixed results right for this neon but the race has always been the one agent that every time we see you we know you're gonna get those multi kills you can we know you're gonna get the opening kill so is it also the same reasoning as to why you changed the composition for map two um i would say the neon that we were playing on lotus there was only like a short amount of stuff that we could show and obviously we played the map twice already uh we got kind of with, like switch it up kind of show a different look again uh, not really have like the same people kind of VOD review us and get, like anti-strat us. Mm. But Raze, on the other hand, is a agent that, you know, has a multi-kill potential with Nade. And also like with the movement as well. So it kind of yeah. enables me to shine more. Whereas the Neon is more like you make space and get traded usually. Yeah, and, and we did see those multi-kills and, and something that really caught my attention is a lot of those rounds that we saw on that second map, uh, you guys were leaving the site for the retake and it was obviously you going in and then we did also managing to to get some insane multi-frags towards the end. Uh, what are the, is this kind of the, the standard protocol that you have for every single match, just kind of playing your own game or did you think, or was this something that was adapting to the aggression that the TSM say they have and have proven they also have as well? Well, I like to say that we like to adapt. Uh, it also comes down to vibes as well. Uh, this match the compared vibes. to the other matches. Yeah, this match compared to the other <laughs> ones, I've, I've taken a, I decided to take a bigger step in having more energy and bringing up the vibe more often. Because uh, I, I okay. think we tend to get in our heads a little bit if we uh, let it just sit and sink in. So I'd rather bring up, I'd rather we bring up the energy and just have a good time and uh, you know just play our game. It definitely seemed like you guys were having a good time. Even towards the end, they showed the cameras. You guys were all smiling. They're all happy, showing the results and, and, and knowing that, that you did kind of what was expecting for your team. Now, my last question. So you've you've had some opponents who've been able to win. The one loss that you took was against Winthrop. But the last match for the week five is going to be M80. Big matchup for anybody that has to face them. But how do you feel about them? Um, I think that we can treat them just like any other team. We, they have their own little play style, and I think we strive against structured teams more than we do the chaotic fighting teams. And I think that's showed so far. TSM was a lot more structured than some of the other teams that we played, and we had a more convincing win today compared to when we played against SAD Esports and the other teams that like to take these individual ones and have right. their own little like chaos pushes and stuff like that. So. I think against M80, we kind of have a good idea of how they're going to play, and on top of it, too, they're more structured, so. 
think we'll be fine. You're just putting the the, the points there, and then just we we kind of make the sum of how the you guys really shine in the in the chaos that you you guys are able to create. So it looks very good. Happy to see you getting these wins, Corey. Thank you so much for the interview. And with that, we're pretty much closing down what was this second match of today, week or week four, day one. But let's bring back the NLS to tell us you know what is going to happen tomorrow what is going to happen for the next couple of days because it's also going to be very very interesting again this was a 2-0 that took place for turtle troop against uh, against tsm and uber uh, i know your prediction wasn't going that way but i think we had a really great match of Valorant, i got pooed on i got pooed on with my friends <laughs> i'm just putting it out there I need, honestly i need a pair of zenny oh, stack to bloody too. see these teams properly yeah yeah give me give me give me some shades my goodness uh, look, okay, like I kind of, I uh, kind of troll a little bit with the, uh, with the, with the Glazers pred. I just, you know, I'm kind of, I, I can't even say I'm biased towards XO Watch players because then I didn't pred for Corey, so I got nothing actually. Mm. Yeah, no, I'm just on, the, I was just on the dumb bro juice. Just, with, just uh, not the pred. day for predictions. Just not. The day I just for think predictions. that like. I just think that like sad i got more depth i think you know than maybe sort of we, we give them credit for i know i said i didn't want to see you know bob drag them kicking and screaming through i didn't think she did i still think that she was able to have a great performance while everyone else sort of came together around her uh that match up for me was just like pretty damning that the glazers are in in deep trouble and yeah like i just thought tsm were like really improving drastically and they were like it was a good series but like a turtle troop man it's such a wild card like i don't know how many teams i would love to see the teams that can actually figure that out or like play proactively against that like really yep. effective um you know retake comp on on maps like that where it's like hard to scale up and catch the retake setup before it gets done i mean that's like the a lot of the maps here in valorant like make that a little bit hard to sort of interrupt in the post plan uh so man they, they kind of they kind of go to with it i don't know like <laughs> corey has a sick day after having a quiet week and and you know we did kind of my king so what can i say and to be fair that was like one of the first times this season we've really seen the effectiveness be compounded with the double initiators like that like teams are going to have to start really putting in the work for what their protocols are going to look like when they're playing up against double initiators because i am sure that today inspired uh some it of her other studied. squads out there without question and yeah. the, you know that's the thing is a tsm squad is going to learn from that and then they're going to have protocols built for when we do receive this utility how do we deal with it or what are we, what are our actions first and we need to trust that because Again, it, it just comes so quickly with the double initiator comp. You don't expect it, and it often hits you pretty hard. So, yeah, revealing moment there. Cool stuff from Troop, though. Second of the groups, unreal. And I know we're only on day one, but shape that question that you always ask of who who wants to be who wants to be that second place? Who wants to be that second on that group B? I mean, Turtle Trip is looking pretty good after today. Three one on the series, and two one of what we got the chance to see today i think it looks pretty consistent we also have some very exciting matches of what is going to be tomorrow as you see is together we're terrific against moise oxygen against yfp and uh, i already have my favorites i already have <laughs> at least the, the teams that have been proven and have been answering with confidence i think those interviews that always gives me an indication of how things are going to be shaping up moise they're undefeated so far not undefeated in maps but at least undefeated when it comes to the series uber and uh, tomorrow might be the, the day for your predictions it's okay it's Look, okay i mean i didn't pred together we are terrific so i hope that works out <laughs> that game against oxygen was disastrous disaster absolutely disastrous but to get they win six rounds of the whole series no mate that is for a team that honestly like i mean it was positioned pretty well in this group like i really think they're head and shoulders above the, the rest of them so they're kind of chilling for the time being but like that's a big step up right i actually think mxs might be more exploitable than, than oxygen uh just quietly so we'll, we'll see if that's the case but i i again i don't really uh expect too much there and oxygen versus yfp i think that one's pretty cut and dry personally yeah i think so too again just after that interview that i had with redux yesterday i asked him what do you think about yfp and he just started laughing so <laughs> i think that says such enough a, i think legend, that says honestly. enough about how do you feel about yfp and maybe what can go down tomorrow shift do you agree yeah mark it for a speed run i think all right you better drop the <laughs> gritty on them are you gonna <laughs> laugh in the interview you better drop the absolute they, grid i think i think tomorrow's a speed run i think it's very quick two o's for both matches i hope together we are terrific put together more of a formidable approach but yeah they got exposed versus oxygen and 
I don't know. I think MXS is the better team between the two, not just because they've played head to head, but that was a long time ago. It feels like now. And I still think that the more complete squad, I, I've got two quick two O's tomorrow. Well, because you said that, you guys can expect a 2-1, every single one going to <laughs> overtime for yeah. both of the matches. I'm not, I'm not so, costing. That's fine. <laughs> I mean, that would also be amazing, right? So thank you, Shep, for that. <laughs> and with that, we're going to close out this first day of week four. Thank you guys for watching Valorant Challengers North America. We'll catch you guys tomorrow. Same time, same place. So in the meantime, stay safe. One. Spike down mid. Thirty. One enemy remaining. Standing. One enemy One enemy remaining. One enemy remaining. Two men's on the hot pit. Last player standing. Block. Last player standing. One enemy remaining. One enemy remains. Thirty seconds left. Last. One enemy remaining. Stand. 